All right, welcome to the latest edition of the Second Half Draft Show. I am your host, Juice, joined by Headley and Drew. Mrs. C. Prasky, how's it going? Dana, good to have you. You guys are prompt and ready to go. We're going to talk about Headley and Drew's rankings. All right, we're going to talk about the top 10 quarterbacks, the top 12 tight ends, and the top 15 down linemen, defensive side of the ball here. So let's start with the quarterbacks. We won't belabor the point any further. We'll start with the quarterbacks. And at number 10, Headley, you have Jordan Travis, the Knoll. And Drew, yeah. you got your boy Devin Leary here. All right, transfer, played his last season here at Kentucky. I'll start with you, Drew. Your thoughts on Leary out of Kentucky? Yeah, um, so, well, I'll wait. I'll wait in terms of the correction. <laughs> and I'll take accountability for it. But um, oh, uh, <laughs> we'll talk appreciate about that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you know, I, I, time to time, I'll take responsibility, you know. Um, so I have here in my notes, and, and this is a guy I've been watching for the past couple years, right? I think he's coming from NC State. I think he, he um he got injured last year. I think it was an important game too. He got injured in, and then the season kind of kind of fell off the rails, or maybe started to fall off the rails. I think right before maybe he got injured. But uh, he plays. Excuse me. Uh, what did I write here, man? It's terrible. Uh, oh, okay, I got it. Uh, he, he plays. Uh, wait, what did I write? Hold on, give me a second. Give me two seconds. The handwriting, bro. <laughs> nah, this this is typed up, bro. But I be typing fast. What? You know? I don't really read my stuff, bro. You know, I need my guy spell check. He he helped me out here, man. Um, What's good, D Kit? Okay, up, I got down low. What's happening, down low? Down low, Dana. So he uh he plays an offense that allowed him to turn his building. back to, to the defense, right? So that's yeah. something that you want to see from from all the quarterbacks coming out. Not not all of them got the chance to do that, especially not routinely. I thought that was something that he did very, very well in terms of turning his back to the defense, you know, play action, uh, turning around and being able to see, you know, the the be able to get it to the guy that's open or the one on one coverage. Uh, I thought that was something that he did very, very well. Uh, he's a cool customer in the pocket. Uh, nice thrower uh, of, of throw of the football down the seams specifically. Um, thought he had good pocket presence, uh, goes through his reads consistently. Uh, but I thought he lacked some arm strength. Um, to squeeze the ball into those tight windows consistently. Uh, I think he he fits more in a, a traditional style quarterback. You know, he's got he's got some legs, but it, but it's nothing um, that that's compares to the guys that are going to be above him here uh, in terms of of keeping plays alive and and doing something maybe a little a little special, right? Uh, I think he kind of lacks that from from that standpoint. And then balls that were thrown to the outside the numbers, not necessarily like a down and out, like like where I think um, J.J. McCarthy struggles, but more of like down the football field, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 18 the to 20 plus yards down the, the, the football the, the field. Vertical stuff. Yeah, yeah, the vertical. Excuse me. Yeah, the vertical. I think he struggles with that uh, routinely. Like he just couldn't find, couldn't throw his guy open um, in those space and, and, and throwing it down the football field or just threw it too far, threw it too short. Just it was it was consistent from what I saw. Um, but, but yeah, that's what I got on Devin Leary, man. All right. Heather, what about Jordan Travis? Uh, you know, Jordan Travis, he's a guy that he put in the work. He put in the work. He improved every year uh, for Florida State. Uh, when he first came in, you remember James Blackman? He, he was out there starting quarterback. I like, we can't have this guy out here, man. So, you know, I like Jordan Travis coming in because he helped us uh, with his legs and helped us win football games, Florida State win football games. So, you know, I wanted to see him uh, play, but he, he wasn't developed yet. And Every single season you saw it, he just got better and better and better. Got a really good understanding of that Mike Norvell offense. Uh, just throwing with anticipation, getting the ball out of his hands quicker. Because that's kind of what he struggled with early on in his career there at Florida State. But, you know, he was more of a, a run-around quarterback. You know, he developed that anticipation, that timing with his receivers. Uh, he has the ability to make throws on the move. Uh, that's what he does uh, pretty good, make those throws on the moves, uh, escape the pocket, keep his eyes down the field, uh, finding those uh, wide receivers from Florida State. Um, and then, but with pressure, sometimes I think he tries to do too much, uh, you know, call it the hero ball. And you saw it in the game, uh, the first game of the season against LSU. Uh, he made some bad decisions, uh, almost threw a, he threw an interception, almost threw another one in that game. Uh, could have cost us, uh, but, you know, they, they put it on, on LSU later uh, in the second half in the third quarter. But, you know, those could have been back-breaking plays. If they would have caught the ball, intercepted the ball, and took it to the house. So he, he just got to play more within himself. Uh, and uh, limit those turnover-worthy throws. Um, you know, he's undersized. Uh, he's a smaller quarterback, but, you know, he just got to uh, 
you know, use his legs, uh, create uh, timing in the passing game. And he has that leadership trait. You know, from all accounts, I think uh, his teammates love him. Uh, big leader there for Florida State. And, uh, you know, the only thing right now, well, not the only thing, but that, that season le uh, injury, leg injury, man, that, that's big for him. So he needs to recover from that injury, come back, and just working through progressions, improving that in his game. Um, but at the next level, you know, we'll see with Jordan Travis, man. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic because of how well he improved. Uh, throughout his four or five years there at Florida State. So, you know, and, and when he gets to the next level, he's not going to be a starter immediately. But if he can work it and improve, and uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens uh, after that. Yeah, you know, ideally, ideally, you know, you, you, quarterbacks get an opportunity to kind of get an opportunity to, to ultimately develop, right? They're not necessarily thrust into immediate playing time. And uh, I, I think Jordan Travis certainly could could benefit from that. You know, I, I am – T to your point, Hadley, what he was when we first saw him debut at Florida State, having transferred in from Louisville to what it was prior to the injury that ended his effectively his career at Florida State um, was day and night. It, it, it was a huge change. He, he was not a NFL quarterback, not, not even in, in a reserve role. Right. You wouldn't necessarily have used a roster spot on him um, in, in terms of what you saw the first you know year and a half, two years or so. But. What he ultimately developed into was impressive. So hopefully, hopefully he gets the opportunity to continue to develop. And if if he gets his opportunity, he's able to take advantage of it. We move on to your ninth-ranked quarterbacks here. And Heather, I'm going to start with you. You have Michael Pratt out of Tulane. And Drew, you have Jordan Travis. Uh, generally speaking, I would I would have Drew, you know, follow up on Jordan Travis conversation. But let's start with Michael Pratt. And then, Drew, you can uh, finish the conversation around quarterback nine here on Travis. Yeah, Michael Pratt, quarterback for Tulane. Uh, he had his boy Jackson out there. Uh, they both were at the Senior Bowl. Um, you know, when I watch the tape with Pratt, I just want to see him make quicker decisions. Uh, just get the ball out of his hands quicker. Uh, sometimes he does a little hesitation, pumps it a little bit, because uh, he's very good when he has that rhythm, when he gets the ball out quickly uh, in, in a rhythm, uh, especially in the middle of the field. You know, I, I like to see him in the middle of the field, throws to the outside of the numbers or deep down the field. He struggles a little bit. Um, I see a lot of first read throws with him also. You know, that first read, you, you got to be able to work through your progressions, get to the second and third options in your offense. So a lot of times what he does is he'll he'll look for the first read. If it's not there, then his eyes goes to the pass rush. And then after that, he's either a sack or he's trying to escape the pocket. Um, so just getting through those reads and those progressions quickly, want to see that uh, better because he's not one of those outside the structure quarterbacks. Uh, he's not making much plays outside the structure. Um, doesn't really have that plus athleticism like, some of the other guys we're going to see in the top uh, top half of this uh, top 10. Um, he's a little smaller, so he gets the ball batted down a lot. And, and we see that in the league right now where the interior O-line, man, it, they're, they're getting paid because it's very important. A lot of shorter quarterbacks in the league right now. So, you know, you got to be able to protect him, uh, especially with the guards and the centers up front. Um, I think pressure affects him a lot also. Um, sometimes I feel like he doesn't feel it as well. Uh, so to maximize uh, Michael Pratt's potential, uh, you got to keep him clean and you got to have him in red rhythm and have a good structure around him, have some weapons around him. Um, like I said, he's at best throwing uh, from a clean pocket because uh, he throws in, like a beautiful catchable ball in rhythm. Like I said, preferably in the middle of the field. So it comes out of his hands really nice. It doesn't really have the, the plus arm strength, but, you know, those intermediate, the short to intermediate throws, it comes out of his hands really well. Um, and he has a lot of experience. You know, he's, he's a guy like Jordan Travis. You know, they're pretty similar where, they kind of improved every season as they're going along. A lot of experience. So, you know, that's going well for them. And uh, I also think he needs to protect the football, you know. No, I say he will protect the football. I'm sorry. I read that wrong in my notes. He protects the football really well. And, uh, you know, I, I like his ball handling. It's, it's, it's little small things with him uh, where, you know, he does well on those little pump fakes or on those play action. He hides the ball well from the defense. So he does well on those kinds of things. So, yeah, he's a developmental guy, uh, just like Travis. I don't see him coming in and, and starting, but he could work his way up to be a quarterback two, quarterback three on the roster and, you know, come in sparingly and maybe make a start or two a season. I think coming into the senior bowl, we, we were expecting more from him, right? You know, the, yeah. the, the buzz around him and and our he was actually part of that that preview that we did in terms of things to prove. You know what I'm saying? Guys, guys were expecting to to demonstrate and really make their way and, and perhaps getting that conversation of, of the first couple of rounds. And I just didn't see it. Just didn't see it. Just didn't see the, the consistency from him. 
I didn't see him, you know, rip it, push the football down the field, even in like the one on ones. You know, some of those passes were off target. They were behind. You know what I'm saying? We're not even talking about a pass rush here. So I thought he missed an opportunity. I, I do believe there are some organizations that still like him. They feel like, hey, if we can get him in to our organization, our system, he could be a plus backup, perhaps be a decent starter at some point. But I, I he, he left he left a lot of meat on the bone, uh, particularly with the team. I, I think that's a great opportunity to really stamp, you know, and, and, and really buoy your pre-draft process. And, and certainly it was a missed opportunity there. Drew, let's talk about Jordan Travis. Yeah, DP. You know, bro, I mean, listen, um, real quick, since this DP on here, DP, uh, my little one asks, is is the what did she say? Is the um the the famous guy coming on again? <laughs> the celebrity. Is he is the celebrity guy. coming back yeah. on? <laughs> yeah. I was like, not not tonight, babe. She said, oh, when he's coming back, I said, I don't know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> so I just want to let you know. But uh <laughs> In terms of uh, Jordan Travis, I got I here. I got six one compact frame, um, who's not easy to take down. Kind of reminds me a little bit of um, of uh, Caleb Williams. Um, I know I think Caleb Williams six one two fourteen, and uh, Jordan Travis six one. I think two hundred, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, has a nice quick release. Uh, when he sees it, he gets it out and gets it to his guy. Uh, when he doesn't, he holds it a bit a little bit longer than you want him to. Um, and then I think that's that's what Heavy was talking about earlier in terms of. Then what he starts to do is, is trying to do a little too much. Um, you know, you want to make sure that he continues to protect himself, especially with the, the injury he's got there. Um, I don't believe he has the top uh, top tier arm talent that you want from the position. Um, I do believe he's a leader of men. I heard Heli, Heli mention that. I mean, this is a guy who I kind of put him and Jaden Daniels in the same bucket in terms of guys coming in, and it was deer in the headlights. Like, I was, I told Heli, I was like, yo, First one, first time I saw Jordan Child, I was like, yo, y'all in trouble, bro. Like, <laughs> y'all going in the wrong direction with that guy because it was definitely a deer in the headlights. Where I, he just I, I, wanted I thought to... we were getting some Chris Ricks, bro. <laughs> I thought we were getting Chris Ricks out here, man. Yeah, <laughs> Chris Ricks? No, that was James Blackman. Yeah, that was Blackman. That was Blackman. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't good. Um, and, and you thought – because you could see some of the talent, man, but if he could just put it together in terms of going through his progression, staying in the pocket and get, get the ball out – Get it out on time, um, which is I think you saw um, this year. I think you kind of put it not not put it all together, but put it mostly together. And you saw what happened when he went down. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like him going down probably cost y'all a chance to play in that playoff, right? I mean, that's probably the main reason nobody wanted to see a, a quarterback quarterbackless FSU going into the playoffs, right? So I think that's probably what pushed y'all out, along with that that terrible game y'all played against. Um, was that Louisville? Uh -huh. Um, I, and then I have, I believe he, he kind of lacks to lead the receiver consistently down the football field away from coverage or just to the end zone. Um, just kind of throws it up there. Guys go, go up and get it like a Johnny Wilson, um, like a, uh, like a Keon Coleman, right. Instead of, you know, leading your guy to, to the open green grass. So that's, that's kind of what I got on, on, uh, Jordan Travis there. You know, I, I think the most impressive thing is about Jordan Travis really is his perseverance, right? Like I said, we talked about his his development over time. You know, you got to give Mike Norvell some credit there as well. I, I think what he did offensively, schematically, uh, and then Jordan Travis's ability to grasp and and lead that offense was impressive, what, what he did year to year. It, it's always the fact that Jordan Travis kind of keeps things alive. Now, it could get him in trouble, as you mentioned, Drew, right? You know, he could hold on to the ball a bit too long, take a, a bad sack, but his ability to kind of keep things alive, use his legs, not only to extend drives, but certainly to give the receivers an opportunity on cover is something that NFL teams covet now, right? You know, it's it's as much as you want to see three step, five step, seven step ball out. Um, you, you got you need guys who can make plays, who who can, you know what I'm saying, get you out of a bad play. So Jordan Travis, I, I think I think they're gonna probably be a handful of teams. I know there are, there are a number of fans who feel like, you know, day three, that's the guy that we're looking for. He's the guy that provides the most upside um you know he, he's played in some some fairly substantial big games against good competition you know that that's the guy we want to kind of bet on late maybe we catch lightning in a bottle so we'll see we'll see ultimately with jordan travis we move on to your eighth ranked quarterbacks and you have the aforementioned devin leary and of course drew you have michael pratt who was actually had at least ninth ranked quarterback drew talk about michael pratt your, your thoughts on him yeah, uh, Headley kind of stole some of my thunder, but I, I got here. Um, this is a guy who, when you watch him, in terms of them first, the first two reads, 
I mean, if, if he if, if he sees it, he's going to throw it, and he's decisive, specifically in man coverage. I think if, if you throw a little zone at him, there's a little bit of a, a hesitation, a little bit of maybe not understanding um, where, to, where to throw the football. Uh, you rarely see him go to that third read, eyes mm-hmm. drop, starts to look at the, the, the rush that's coming. Um, and he, he's, he's decisive when he's going to take off. I, I, I'll give him that. Um, he is a four-year starter. He's been there for a minute. He's kind of progressed every single year that he's been there. So I think that's, <clears throat> that's one of those boxes that, that he's checked is kind of that, that Jordan Travis checking that box that Jane, Jane Daniels in terms of that progression year to year um, that you want specifically, especially from that position in terms of just progressing. Um, and then when we went to the senior bowl, like you said, uh, juice, he was one of those guys that, you know, there's some things that you want to see and you you just didn't see it, man. Um, you know, it, it just never turned over. You're thinking, okay, day one, you know, that day one's where usually where I see the quarterbacks struggle the most. That's the day where I'm like, okay, they're probably going to struggle the most. First time getting out there, looking at uh, 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 going through the playbook officially with people on the field. And then day two, there was really no change. And day three, there was really no change. And then came the, the senior bowl game and, and there was really nothing, um, that that really changed and and i just wonder if if he's the type of player where he needs to 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 see the playbook and 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 have it soaked into him before he can actually be effective right so we're talking about a guy who's got to sit right a a developmental guy who's got to be under the same system don't change it and uh maybe he can absorb uh, it and and be uh, a backup um i I don't know that he would ever be a starter i don't don't think he has that kind of talent um but might be a guy that just sits on the bench and can play one to two games a year if your quarterback's down and he can be effective and operate the offense um, like the coach wants it operated. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you 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 hit all the points there, right? We, we didn't see anything throughout the pre-draft process that would suggest starter or eventual starter. You understand what I'm saying? And that's unfortunate because, again, um, you, you don't want to dismiss all of the film, right? You know, and he has quite a bit of film, but you're really you're really looking for him to kind of take that next step this is a this is a perfect opportunity where you know non-power five group of five team here Tulane's been a good football team don't get me don't get me mistaken here but certainly um the level of competition kind of increases position by position here and didn't necessarily answer the bell so we'll see how it all plays out for Michael Pratt here in the 2024 NFL draft Helly, your thoughts on Devin Leary yeah yeah you know you you spoke about you know jordan travis might be you know the day three guy you know teams might covet um i think it's devin leary i think devin leary has a lot of talent um he throws a nice uh catchable football good zip i think the arm talent you know when we talked about pratt and travis they just don't really have the the requisite arm talent for the next level uh but devin leary does you know plus arm talent he transferred from nc state like drew said earlier and he, he dealt with uh, his share of injuries. I think injuries kind of de- derailed him a little bit in college. So when he gets to the next level, hopefully he stays healthy. Um, because uh, he, I love the way he stands tall in the pocket. He stands very tall. He delivers. Uh, defenders can bear down on him. And that's what you want from your quarterback. The pressure is not going to always be perfect. Uh, you're going to have some free defenders. But you got to be able to stand tall in the pocket and deliver. And, and I think Devin Larry does that really well. He did flash some inconsistencies uh, with his accuracy, I think, outside the numbers and deep down the field. I know Drew spoke about deep down the field. So just outside the numbers and deep down the field, I think he could be uh, a more accurate quarterback. Um, but, you know, what I'd love to see from uh, a lot of the quarterbacks, and, and Ole- uh, Devin Leary showed it, was to be able to, to go under the uh, under center, turn his back to the defense, snap his head around, and, and, and make the throw. Because it's kind of a lost art right now in the NFL because there's a lot of shotgun going on. but when I see that from a quarterback, man, it's so refreshing to watch. Uh, and Devin Leary has experience doing that. Um, he can push the fo- ball down the field between the numbers. Uh, that's where he kind of wins, between the numbers deep down the field. Um, but moving outside of the structure, I think that's where his accuracy kind of kind of diminishes a little bit. So, you know, you just got to work on that a little bit. Uh, like I said, I think he probably the sleeper quarterback in this class, man. Um, because like I said, the arm talent checks the boxes dealt with the injury. So going to the next level, man, I think he'd be the sleeper in day three um, because he had a strong sophomore campaign before kind of struggling the last two seasons, his last year at NC State and then last season at Kentucky. Uh, but, you know, what I do like about him also, he showcases not just the fastball, but able to, to do that change up, man. Like we talk about pitchers in baseball, being they can hit your fastball, but you got to throw the change up also, man. So if you have the change up and the fastball, 
uh, at, the, at the quarterback position, you know, it just it just helps your offense out a lot more. So, yeah, I like Devin Leary here at, at quarterback eight uh, in the NFL draft. I, I wonder, because you're right, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I think we were thinking, OK, well, he might be one of these guys when it's all said and done. Right. And, and that speaks to Drew's point regarding that year to year progression. Of course, injuries played a role, but there was some inconsistency on his behalf as well. What's what do you see? What, what, what's the issue mechanically? What come, what jumps out at you in terms of his struggles outside the numbers? Yeah, a, a little bit of mechanics, uh, you know, especially in the bottom half uh, mm -hmm. with his feet and everything. I think he needs to uh, shorten it up a little bit and um, just just trusting it, man. Seeing it and trusting it and getting it out with anticipation. You know, don't wait a little bit. Just just get it out there. The guys, you know what route he's running. So, you know, just throw the ball out there. So I think he could develop that a little more. Um, but like I said, the arm talent is there, man. And so I, I like him. All right, we move on to your seventh-ranked quarterbacks here. Hadley, you have Spencer Rattler, and Drew, you have Bo Nix. So um, folks might feel like, you know, you're a little lower on Bo Nix, but I, I think it's all very reasonable. And and it's kind of, you know, pick your flavor with these two players. I'll start with you, Drew. Let, let's talk about the aforementioned Bo Nix. Yeah, man, he, he's he, he's come a long way. When, when you talk about a couple of these quarterbacks have transferred mm -hmm. to other teams and and you know, I think Devin Leary kind of went in the in the in a in the different direction than Bo Nix. It kind of flopped in terms of going in towards that. You know, you want Bo Nix to go. You know, he's got to go from down to up. Devin Leary went from kind of up to down, right? Obviously, he's coming off the injury, but Bo Nix, um, super efficient, man. Um, that's probably probably maybe his tap his top um, attribute is that he's very efficient. Um, he gets the ball ball out timely. Jeez. Um, I know that that, you know, that team ran a lot of bubbles and screens and, you know, very, uh, what, what do we say, um, high percentage plays, right, that were, you know, behind the line of scrimmage, at the line of scrimmage, or just beyond the line of scrimmage. And you can't really blame him for that. They're calling the play. He's, he's uh, executing the play when asked, um, when he does have time. And, and he had probably the most time in the country in terms of sitting back and being able to go through his progressions, get the ball out. Um, he did get the ball down the football field. I think he has a pretty strong arm. Um, and I thought he operated well when it came to the red zone as well to get the ball to his his playmakers. Um, he's got, you know, he's athletic. Uh, he's got got the feet that you want from the position. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's you, you just wonder in terms of what type of offense does he need to play in? Does it need to be, you know, West Coast offense? Does it need, need to be a, uh, you know, uh, two-step drop, get it out type of offense where he has to get the ball out quickly. Um, I know he was out there at Mobile. And again, we, we, you know, we were there, we saw it, right. There was some, there was some struggles, especially day one, day two was a, just a tad bit better. And I think day three is kind of where he kind of turned it around or, or in, in a couple of the drills, he's, he had success. Right. But um, you know, I, I just wonder in terms of, you know, he may be a system quarterback and I hate to be throwing that, that word around, but he may, there's a couple of these guys that just may be system quarterbacks because I don't think you can just put him in any system and that he would flourish. Right. Maybe he turns it around three, four years after the fact, but you know, this is a guy that we're talking about going in the first round and, and those guys usually per, play right away. So you want him to be super effective. And I don't know that Bo Nix has that in him. Um, if he doesn't go to the right system, I think we were talking about him going to, to Minnesota, right. Maybe a, a fit for him there. So, that's kind of where I sit with him. Yeah, I tend to agree with you that that it, his landing spot it, it's it's going to be significant for all the quarterbacks, right? But in his case, it's it's probably going to be um, a little bit more uh, necessary that he finds the right landing spot where where he can leverage th that ability, that accuracy, you know, and and have some predetermined reads. You know, I think what happens with Bo Nix is that you know a, as he's cycling through those um that progression that's when his accuracy tends to wane you know what i'm saying there's some there's some head scratching throws at, at times when he's in rhythm it's another part of his game that when he's in rhythm he, he can be deadly accurate you know at all parts of the field but you know when he has to you know get to that second third fourth read you'd like to see a less of a precipitous drop off in terms of his accuracy so that that's something that that certainly um can be mitigated to some degree by the scheme but it's an area that he's obviously going to need to work on and of course at oregon he was kept really clean bro Re really really clean and you know we're just kind of thinking in terms of where, where does he land if he, if he lands with a team that is already has a good supporting class around it a quality offensive line 
think he can be successful. You're talking about a guy who played in about five, six different offenses during his collegiate career. You know, he hasn't necessarily had the benefit of being steeped in a particular system either, right? So while we are a little concerned in terms of what system he actually ultimately plays in, we just haven't seen continuity necessarily aside from what he did in Oregon. And it looked really good. It looked really good for the most part in Oregon. Hey, I want to stay here. I want to stay here because you guys flip flop the quarterbacks here between your, your sixth and seventh rankings. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on Bo Nix? Big Bo. Uh, a lot of experience. Um, like, like Drew said, man, I, the thing I like most about Bo Nix is, like you said, the accuracy. You know, the accuracy is very good there. Uh, the athleticism also. Uh, he'll stand in the uh, pocket tall. He's like a point guard. You know, if you talk about in the NBA, a guy that can get to the playmakers, get the ball to the playmakers uh, accurately. And he does that really well. He gets uh, the ball out of his hands really quickly. And we, you talked about the Oregon offense. It just made it very simple for him. Uh, lots of first free throws. So, you know, going to the next level, if, if you don't get into an offense like that, I don't know if he's going to be able to uh, maintain that. Uh, he might struggle a little bit. So, you know, that's something to watch. But, you know, if he gets into one of those offense, uh, those rhythm offense, gets the ball out of his hands quickly, I think he'll be has some success there. Uh, arm angle, something uh, I see with Bo Nix, you know, one of those quicker throws, he'll, he'll change his arm angle up. He's a gamer. He's, he's tough. He, he'll play injured, injured. Uh, leader on the football field, um, athleticism, very fearless. I think those are his kind of his, his superpowers. Other than the accuracy, is the uh, athleticism and, and how fearless that he plays. Um, and accuracy deep down the field. It's not just short or intermediate. He, he's very accurate deep down the field uh, with that clean pocket. Those are nice uh, deep ball right in the bread basket. Uh, so the pre precision and accuracy in the pocket or on the move, man. I think he's good in the pocket or on the move. Um, and, you know, he looks at a, a real complete command of that, that Oregon offense. So, you know, I think an NFL coach will look at him and be like, hey, we put him in this system and, and we continue to develop him and we have these playmakers on the outside, then, you know, he could be a starting caliber quarterback for us. So, you know, a lot of people talking first round for him. I think he's more of a, a day two guy, round two guy, um, because he doesn't have the, the elite talent as, as some of these guys in the top five. But, you know, very smart, very athletic, very accurate. So. You know, we just got to have the, the pieces around him for him to work at the next level. And again, again, I, I don't want to bury the lead as it relates to that for all these quarterbacks. I think that's going to be significant for all these quarterbacks. But but there is a difference between a guy being able to to raise the level of play and then, of course, needing to have certain things in place in order to be successful. I think in the right spot, the right landing spot, Bo Nix can be successful at the next level. There's some arm elasticity there as well. So as you mentioned, Headley, you know, dropping it down three quarter, if he needs to, to get it around defenders, there, there's talent there. there. There's, there's, there's enough there to be, you know, I like it, like you said, you know, to be a top 50, top 60 pick here and, and perhaps give him an opportunity to, to lead your team. But I want a proven commodity, at, you know, as a play caller, I, I want to make sure that my, my tackles are in place. I, I need I need a couple, you know, receiving threats and a decent running game here so we can work the play action as well because I, I, I'm not convinced that he has the ability to consistently raise the level of play of guys around him. Not many do. Not many do at the end of the day. Drew, your quarterback six here, your six-ranked quarterback is Spencer Rattler, and he's seventh-ranked for you, Hadley. I'll start with you, Hadley. I'll start with you. Okay. What, what are your thoughts on Spencer? Oh, oh, I, I, gave up, I gave up the sauce right down on QB5. <laughs> What are your thoughts on Spencer Rattler? Uh, this, this guy has been through the ringer. He plays. He plays a lot. Uh, faced a lot of adversity uh, throughout his career. Uh, he, he was a reality star at first. Uh, he was a top ranked guy uh, a couple of seasons ago. He, he was the guy. He was supposed to be the, the number one quarterback. And then Caleb Williams at Oklahoma uh, took that starting position for him. Uh, so he transferred to South Carolina, and that South Carolina offensive line really let him down. You know because. You, you see it on film, man. It was just when a team plays South Carolina, they knew put that pressure on them, man. It started in the North Carolina game. Uh, then you see it in the other games as well, the Missouri game. They just kept on coming after him over and over and over again. So I thought his offensive line really let him down. But, you know, apart from the offensive line, I think he can make any throw in the football field. Um, I see him stare down the barrel and, and deliver bullets to his receivers. Um, and, and his receivers have also let him down a little bit with some drops. I know he had big, big XL out there, but, you know, he had some drops with, with other receivers on the football team. Um, and it got so bad, uh, they, they moved the pocket a lot for him. They kind of rolled him out, those half-read rolls, uh, to roll him out so he could actually get some time to throw it down the field. 
Uh, and when he throws the football, uh, very easy throw the football. It comes natural to him. It just comes out of his hands really easy. Um, he has the mobility to escape the pocket. And once he escapes the pocket, he keeps his eyes down the field uh, to make a play on the move. And like I said, a lot of arm talent with, with Spencer Rattler. And sometimes he plays that hero ball also. He has that gunslinger mentality, so he'll throw the ball in coverage at times. Uh, I want to see him clean it up a little bit. It, it just take the easy check down. Uh, it doesn't have to be a home run every time. Uh, and he could process quicker. A lot of back leg throws. I've seen the back leg throws a lot, but like I said, it, it's not all his fault because when, when the defensive line, the edges are coming at him, he kind of had to make a play, man. He tried to do it, and he did it sometimes. You've seen him hit some deep passes to uh, Xavier Leggett, but sometimes he threw it in coverage also. And he kind of reminds me of uh, a little Baker Mayfield in him, man. He, he's not the biggest guy, um, but he got a good arm talent and got some mobility. He's not a, a big-time mobile quarterback like some of these guys at the top, but he could escape the pocket, look down the field, and, and get the ball out. So, you know, his evaluation is, I don't know, you kind of have to go back to see him at his best. Um, and, you know, I like what he did at South Carolina, but it's just the offensive line, man. It, it was really bad over there. So you couldn't really get a really good evaluation on Spencer Rattler. I, I actually think South Carolina helps him in, in my evaluation yeah. in particular. I, I thought the adversity that he faced in South Carolina showed a, a level of moxie and development that, that I was waiting for. Because, of course, wh whether whether it's all appropriate or not, some things were blown out of proportion. There were questions about maturity you know what I'm saying? You know, his focus, so on and so forth. Um, and and whether or not the South Carolina experience humbled him or forced him to, to, to lock in a bit more, whatever the case may be, I, the, the change was good. I, I, at the end of the day, the, the, the net result was that that change was good. And I actually appreciated seeing him dealing with the adversity of not necessarily having a great offensive line. Of course, it could have been that much better. Perhaps we're talking about him. A couple of years ago, we were talking about, you know, maybe the first quarterback selected when he was draft eligible. Now that's no longer the case, but in my mind, in my mind, that that change from or that leap from Oklahoma to South Carolina, what I saw this last season in particular, I, I came away impressed. What about you, Drew? Yeah, if you if you hear singing in the background, that's that's my angel singing. Just want okay. to let you know that. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, Henley kind of said it in terms of of everything um, that essentially was an issue or was it was a positive? I mean, the, the, the very first thing that I look at is the offensive line, man. And it's really, really hard to evaluate a quarterback when he's out there running for his life, because not only is he running for his life, things aren't being ran efficiently. So you, you can't necessarily, okay, let, let me, let me check, let me check his feet. What does his feet look like? Well, if, if a guy's being pushed back into his lap or if a guy's running free, I can't check his feet when he gets ready to throw the football. Right. Um, you know, and, Ellie talked about the receivers dropping passes. Um, you know, you, you talk about speeding up his clock, so he can't really it, – it's it's hard to evaluate him, right? What, what I can tell you is that he went to the senior bowl, and he – what was he not the quarterback? The, didn't he not win the – whatever? I don't even know what the award is, but the best yeah, he, quarterback. He was, he was the, the, the most consistent quarterback there, easily. And, and he was easily. running – he was running a system – that was similar to what he did at South Carolina. So if you kind of can, can kind of extrapolate, that's, that's a juice word right there, extrapolate, you know, <laughs> what he did at the senior bowl and kind of can imagine what that should have looked like at South Carolina on a more consistent basis, right? Just protect him because he has all the tools that you want from the position, right? This is a guy who said when, when he, when he was at the podium, you know, I'm not sure what he was asked because I kind of missed that part of it. I couldn't hear whoever was asking, but he said, I had opportunities to go to three or four of the schools that were better than South Carolina, but I chose South Carolina because of, I thought it was right for me and I thought it was going to be a challenge. Right. And if they just could have blocked for him, this, this team, I don't know if they stop anybody in terms of the sure. defense, but sure. offensively they yeah. would have put up points. Right. And you would have been able to see his, his full gambit of, of his attributes at work. And this is the guy right here for me. This is the guy who, let me just look at my rankings, make sure I'm not missing anybody. This is the guy that could be the fourth quarterback coming, the best fourth quarter quarterback, maybe squeeze in the third somewhere. If somebody, if somebody doesn't put it, put it together. He could be that guy. And it wouldn't, it shouldn't surprise you because the talent is yeah. there. It, it won't right? be for lack of talent. It won't, it won't be for right. lack of ability. Sure. Sure. I, I, I agree with that notion. Th these are two very intriguing quarterbacks here. You know, where, where would you be comfortable selecting Rattler, Drew Headley? Ooh. I would say. Day two guy. Yeah. yeah day, day, two guy. day two guy. End of the second, maybe. 
it depends on what what I got on the roster. Okay. Yeah, it, it depends. Um, middle of the second, uh, if your team like uh, with with an older quarterback, uh, the Atlanta Falcons come to mind. Uh, when you got Kirk Cousins at, at sure. the end of his That's career, a good spot. Sure. That's so, a really good spot. Yeah, yeah. Team, t- teams like that 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 has that older quarterback, and you want to give them like two to three years because. That, that's that's gold right now at the NFL, man. If a quarterback is sit behind a quarter another quarterback for two, three years and develop, man, the star the stars the limit, man. We've seen what Jordan Love did in Green mm-hmm. Bay. So a, mm-hmm. a situation just like that for Spencer Rattler, I think that that'll be really good for him. Yeah, and, and I'll I'll be the first to admit it that I, I was not big on Jordan Love coming out of Utah State. And and we got a chance to see him live and direct in uh mobile and and it was very underwhelming his his performance but having the opportunity not for lack of ability right we know he had the live arm but his his opportunity to get steeped in that system that lafleur system in green bay and, and of course confidence is a hell of a drug right you know as the season progressed you could see he he realized you know what i got this you know, you know what i'm saying I, I i can certainly make all the throws i can i can i can get in us into the right play i can get us out of a bad play and and of course that young team with a young receiving core on top of that. It's not as if you had these, you know, a Devontae Adams out there, a proven commodity necessarily at the receiving position. Uh, I, I came away thoroughly impressed by by what, how Jordan Love has developed. So, yeah, th- it, it would be – that would be an ideal situation where where Rattler in particular, given his skill set, given his talent, would be able to sit for a couple of years behind an incumbent and then assume those reins. So we'll see how – that ultimately plays out. We move on to the fifth ranked quarterback, and I, I, I gave it up a little bit early here. But you both have JJ McCarthy as your fifth ranked quarterback, and I'm gonna start with you, Hadley. You know, you you were the you were the the, the leader in the pack among the JJ McCarthy um, faithful, and then of course what has ha- happened since the national championship. Everybody's on board yeah. seemingly at this point. What, what are your thoughts on McCarthy? Yeah, man. You, you know, it's when you like a, like a player and you're like, yo, I really like J.J. McCarthy when no one's really talking about him. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then the roar gets louder and louder and louder. And you're like, wow, I, I never thought he was a, a top three uh, player in this draft. But, you know, you know, I still like J.J. McCarthy. I got him at quarterback five right here. I think um, he, he might get drafted higher than he should. But um, I, something about his movements in the pocket, you know, the 2022 tape is kind of the tape I focused on with, with JJ McCarthy, uh, 23 tape, especially those bigger games, uh, they didn't give him much opportunities to pass the football. Uh, Michigan was more of a, a run heavy team, especially when they got a lead, and, you know, that Penn state game, they were up a little bit and, and they just ran the ball the whole second half. So you didn't really get to, uh, evaluate him as well in 2023, but in 2022, man, the, the movements in the pocket is what I thought really stood out with McCarthy. It's very subtle, too. Uh, those little movements in the pocket, uh, how he, the feet in the pocket, his pocket presence, uh, his ability to escape the pocket when uh, the pressure comes. Because uh, some of these quarterbacks, they had that innate ability to kind of feel the rush and kind of uh, move outside the structure uh, of, of the offense and, and find guys down the field. You know, some guys like to run once they get break the pocket. But, you know, J.J. McCarthy keeps his eyes down the field. Uh, his plus arm talent, uh, I like his arm talent to throw the football, especially against zone. You know, if you if you run a zone against McCarthy, I, I think he, he he could pick you apart. I think against Man, he he, he struggles a little more there. Um, but you know, it, it's very high highs and low lows with JJ McCarthy, man. Sometimes he'll make the greatest decisions under pressure, and you be like, wow, that that Ohio State game in 2022. I think it kind of showcased it all, where you know, under pressure, he, he'll make those big plays and perform well, and then right the next play or the or the next series, he, he'll make a boneheaded decision. Uh, throw the ball in coverage. So, you know, just just be more – and he gets a lot of credit for being even kill, but I, I think he could even be a little more even kill uh, from play to play. And, um, you know, he has experience under center, the, you know, pro-style offense. We talked about that with, with Devin uh, Leary prior where he he get under center, he could, he could run the play action, he could turn his back to the defense, and he could find the guys down the field. So, you know, those are the things I like about uh, J.J. McCarthy. Um and he put on some weight also. Uh, I had him, he was 6'3", 196 at one point, but he weighed in 6'2", 219. So that's good for, for J.J. McCarthy to get over 200 pounds. And I think he's just going to continue to grow as well, man. He's a younger guy. And uh, I wouldn't throw him out there right away. I know we spoke about that in the previous live. I wouldn't feel comfortable throwing him out there right away. I, and if he gets picked like in the top five, like like some people are thinking, or six to New York Giants, he might have to start immediately. But 
I think the best decision is to maybe sit him a little bit, uh, just like we talked about uh, guys previous, like Spencer Rattler. Sit him a little bit, uh, let him ac- get acclimated to the offense before putting him out there. But he, he has a lot of uh, a lot of things I like about him, man. It's just I, I think he just got to work on a, a couple things, and uh, I think he'd be good to go. So, so I, I think I think it's it, I think he could start right away in the right situation. Um, now, how many of them situations there are in the league right now? Not many, right? Especially if you're going in the in the top, you know, top ten of picks, right? You're you're probably not going to to an ideal situation where everything is set, ready to go for you, right? Just a quarterback short, right? So, um, what I, what I got for JJ McCarthy and why he's he's sitting at five and not not any higher is y- y'all already know. We talked about this last week, man. It, it, there's there's not a whole lot to go off of, right? Um, offense was very efficient. Um, we we can I, I, some people get upset when you say they kind of everything kind of went through the running game, but I don't know how you deny that when in the big games the ball was handed off numerous times. Uh, when you when you when you go to Ohio State, we handed it off. When you go play Penn State, we're handed it off. Uh, you go play well, not not necessarily Michigan State. Um, but any of the big games, they just kind of turned it around and handed the, the football off instead of turning it over to McCarthy. And and listen, I, I'm not I'm not objecting to the fact that that was the best thing for them and it worked because they won, right? Um, you know, the coach used to say back in the day, you little league football, hey, we're gonna run this play till they can stop it. And if they can't stop it, why would you change it? it doesn't make sense. Let's let's make this very very simple. And and that's essentially what Michigan did. You just wonder when when the big games come and 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 he you have to put it on his arm and he's the guy. Can he do it? And can he do it consistently? A game that I can go back to. I know Headley likes to go back to the Ohio State, State game of I think it was last year, not necessarily, not necessarily this year, but last year the game I, I like to go through is the TCU game, where there was some highs, some high highs, and some low low lows with him. Right there, there was there was some ups and downs in that game, some peaks and some valleys, and that's kind of the game that I use as my barometer of of who he can be. Right. But again, there's just not enough of that um, in terms of his his arm talent. I think he has, I think he's 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 beautiful beautiful over the middle of the field. Um, I want to see more layered throws, but when he does throw, throw that layered uh, throw over the middle, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to see. Outside of those numbers, that down and out, you know, I, I'm just wondering, hey, can we get it out there more consistently? Because that's one thing that that he struggled with. Super efficient on third downs, probably the best, probably the most efficient quarterback in the past. I don't know how many years yeah, in terms of third down. He, he was a third down yeah. winner. Third and eighty. Third and three, he got you, bro. Yeah. He going to get it, bro. It don't matter, bro. He just understands that third down is the down where we – it's money, money down, down, right? Money That's the down. money down, and he gets mm-hmm. it, right? And that may be part of the reason why he's so high on boards is because oh, yeah. he understands this is the important. Now, I can't throw this ball away. Like Kelly was talking about in terms of him extending plays, I'm not looking to run. Can I run? Yep, I got the athleticism, athleticism to do it. I can make you miss. I can run through you a little bit, although – and, you know, that's something you don't want to see. But – um, getting the football down the field. And he had the receivers and the tight ends to keep running and finding those holes to get it to them accurately. So I understand the love for him. It's just, there's not a, it's, it's, this is not an Anthony Richardson thing where you look at this uber talented guy and you're like, I don't care that he didn't play enough football. I see what I see and I want that. JJ McCarthy isn't quite that for me. So I think that's kind of where I just kind of put a stop on it and say, okay, I, I, I gotta, I gotta be a little reserved here and, and be a little bit more cautious. You're being measured in, in your projection of what he could be yep. at the next level. Like, 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 and I get it. I get it. it, it it's, it's a fair, a fair hedge. You know what I'm saying? And, and you gotta, to Headley's point, and I, and I agree with this. This is what I maintained for a long time. I, I think in a quarterback-driven league, quarterback needy teams, you see JJ McCarthy, you see the flashes, you see what he does on third down. You'll roll the dice, especially as a younger player. Right. He's coming in very young as well. Uh, he operated a, a pro operation as it relates to Jim Harbaugh and his offense. You know what I'm saying? And while while, you know, we, we'd like to see him put the ball up in the air. You, you understand what I'm saying? You know, but what what they did, their their formula worked for them. So you extrapolate, you know, you know, uh, you know, that's that's the, the word, Drew, the word of the day is extrapolate. And, and you see what what types of traits you're looking for at the next level. I just don't want to see him thrust into immediate playing time. And, and it's probably going to happen that way. I, I think he, being a younger quarterback, despite having a good head on his shoulders, being steeped in a, a bit of a prototypical offense, I would still like to see him, because of 
And it's a catch-22, right? You're saying that, well, he needs more experience. He needs more more attempts, right, to get a real, a true book on him. Whereas I, I, I just don't want to thrust him into that level of responsibility because it sounded like he's a top-five pick. You, you understand what I'm saying? I, I do not want to have to thrust a guy in as a top-five pick where we did not have to lean on your arm on a consistent basis. You know what I'm saying? And, and it, again, that's what it comes down to in terms of the projection, in terms of, you know, are, are we? it's a calculated risk. Is he the guy? Can we ensure that we have it built around him? Because, again, you think about this Michigan team, you know, their entire offensive line will be playing in the NFL, the entirety of it. You, you know what I'm saying? And at the next level, when, when things level off, you don't have the decided advantages in terms of the skill position and the offensive line and your running game. It is what we saw in terms of those flashes going to be enough in order to consistently raise the level. And of course, when you're talking about drafting a guy that high, you expect him at least in spurts to be able to raise the level of play of, of guys around him. So we shall see with, with JJ McCarthy. He's, he's obviously a very intriguing prospect here in the 2024 NFL draft among the quarterbacks. Mr. Zebraski was asking about Spencer Rattler's ceiling, uh, wondering if, if it's similar to Geno Smith. Now, as I recall, Geno was an early second round pick when he was brought in. I think I think there's certainly some parallels there, Mr. Seprasky. Uh, Gino, I mean, there, there's few few throw a, a prettier spiral than than Geno Smith. The arm talent was always there. Um, I, what I would say is, I think Rattler could have a better outcome if he's if he's drafted into a better situation. I did not particularly care for Geno going to New York with a Rex Ryan led team. You understand what I'm saying? I, I want I want Gino to to get in a spot where he has a quality offensive mind, you know, taking him through his paces. And under those circumstances, I think he could actually end up being a better pro overall than Gino. But as far as talent is concerned, I think it's similar. And Gino, in terms of throwing the football, just purely spinning it, Gino had a first round talent as far as his arm is concerned. So, and and I agree, I, be, I believe it's the same there with Rattler as well. All right. QB4, you guys are split here, a late audible from Headley. Um, Headley, you actually have Drake May as your fourth-ranked quarterback. Andrew, you have Jaden Daniels. Let's talk about Drake May, Headley. Yeah, I had a, like you said, it, it was a late audible. And the thing with Drake May, I keep going back and forth with him, man. To me, he, he's the hardest evaluation in this class at the quarterback position for me because um, you, you don't want to miss out. On the next, you're on mute, Juice. You said something, Juice. You talking to me? Yeah, my bad. I, I pulled a Drew. Um, e even harder, harder evaluation than JJ McCarthy for you. Yes, yes, okay. because right. you, you know what it is. You don't want to miss the next Patrick Mahomes, the next Josh Allen, the next Justin Herbert, because he got all the traits in the world. Uh, great arm talent, but it, the tape, man, the tape is so inconsistent, and with the accuracy, uh, it's inconsistent. Uh, the lower uh, body mechanics, the footwork is very inconsistent. So you see all that inconsistencies with, with uh, Drake Main, but but you see what teams were like. You know the arm talent, the size, uh, the the big throws that he can make. So it, it's it's such a hard evaluation for me, man. But right now I I, I moved him down the board to, to quarterback four. I I just can't ignore the tape. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Um, but I think he's a he's a projection. I think uh, a lot of people. Is not saying that, but I think he's a big projection. And the people that have him, like, quarterback one or two, like Drew, I think it's more of a projection. I think they're looking at the body. They're looking at the size. My bad, Drew. I threw a shot at you. But I'm, I think he's just looking at the body and the size and saying, hey. And you could be right because look at Justin Herbert. Herbert has some inconsistencies in college with accuracy. I remember Herbert missing uh, passes, like easy passes, a lot and with, with his accuracy. And he's turning to a good quarterback. Josh Allen, his completion percentage was really low. He turned into a good quarterback, and and, and Patrick Mahomes had so much turnover-worthy plays at Texas Tech, and he's the best quarterback in the league right now. So I understand the projection with, with Drake May, but I'm just going going off the tape right now uh, with him. Um, but you know the, the positives are uh, he's a, he's able to throw in those tight windows. He throws across the middle of the field, but I think it's a lot of first read stuff. It's a lot of first read stuff for him. Uh, he, he takes his eyes off. It's kind of like uh was it uh Spencer Rattler? No, no, it was Michael Pratt we we're speaking about where. You know, if that first three is not there, he kind of takes his eyes to the pass rush next. And like Spencer Rattler, the offensive line wasn't good at North Carolina, man. So I know that's where Drew's going to go, where if you have a better offensive line for him and better receivers because he lost Josh Downs last season, you know, what would it look like with that uh, for Drake May in college? Uh, so, you know, 
you know, that, that's 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 the thing with Drake May also. But the arm talent, I think, could improve. Uh, not the arm talent, but the um, lower body mechanics, man. Uh, a lot of back leg throws. A lot of hero ball in his game also with, with those back leg throws. Um, he'll make throws late across uh, the middle of the field. Uh, in, in the big games, too. You know, you see the game against uh, Syracuse. He balled out. I thought that was one of his best games in the season. But when you throw on, like, the Clemson tape, uh, you throw on the, t- the games against those harder defenses, I see him struggling a lot more. Um, but, you know, he has athleticism to get yardage with his legs. So that's where he kind of has uh, – they compare him to Josh Allen. But I think Josh Allen was a more niftier runner. Uh, you know, he can make a guy miss. Uh, he, Josh Allen's a bigger quarterback. Even Herbert, they're both bigger quarterbacks than Drake May. Um, but Drake May is at best when he's in his rhythm. He throws across the middle of the field. He does that really well. I think him and J.J. McCarthy does that really well where they have uh, a clean pocket or a rhythm throwing across the middle of the field. I think he does good there. Um, like I said, he's a size trace guy, um, but the tape was, it wasn't that good. And it, it kind of he kind of took a step back in 2023 also. Mm-hmm. He had a better 2022 season. So And then struggling with pressure. You see it a lot where you know you got to identify pre-snap. Okay, that's my hot read. This is a free rusher coming here. I need to get the balls out my hand quickly. And sometimes he struggles with that, man. You see, he he does good sometimes with it, but it's inconsistent, man. I think the Syracuse game, like I said earlier, was where he saw it and he threw the ball down the field. He had a great game, but you know, against those uh, better echelon teams, man, he struggled with it, got sacked, threw the ball in harm's way, and, and didn't perform well. So, yeah, right now I got him at, at QB four, but I can see the ceiling for him, man. He could be the quarterback one or two. Uh, but as of right now, coming into the league, uh, I don't think he has better tape than the three guys ahead of him. All right. Drew, you'll you get your opportunity to talk more Drake May here. Let's, let's talk about Jaden Daniels. Hey, real quick, I'm just going to put the disclaimer out there. I actually would have flopped. flopped. Um, me and Helly would have been on the same page in terms of Drake May and Jaden Daniels. Um, but I, if that's who you got quarterback three, I don't know if that's who you got quarterback three, but that's that's who I should have had quarterback three. Well, we're on Jaden Daniels. I'll get to the Drake May here in just a second. Jaden Daniels, I talked about earlier in terms of when he first came out there, it was deer in the headlights. The only difference between him and Jordan Travis is that Jaden Daniels was actually dangerous with his legs, super dangerous and scary with his legs. If, if you in the open field, you saw it last year. You saw it this year. Go watch the Florida tape. Uh, big, big arm may have the strongest arm. Uh, maybe maybe oh, it might be between him and him and Penix, would you say? Or maybe Drake. Penix. May, so those three guys in there. Penix, you go Penix. Penix. Yeah, Penix, Penix strongest arm. Yeah. OK. All right. Okay. Who's, who's, All right. who's your three? Penix, me and who? Uh, you talking about my top three? No, it's not oh, arms. 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 Oh, yeah, I, I said May. Oh, I got uh, I'll probably go Penix, Daniels, then May, maybe. Nah, Caleb. Caleb got a Caleb. I know, arm. Caleb got an arm, but I don't know if he got the arm that these these guys got. But either way, okay, either way. Okay. Um, yeah, Daniels Daniels and his progression, man. Um, in terms of, of what he came into and what he is now, what how he came into and what he is now. I know he had those superstar receivers. Um, he works very well out of structure. Um, he can extend plays. Uh, he and and I know they they kind of ran a, a limited route tree in terms of um, what they asked the receivers to do, but he can throw it all over the yard from the short to the intermediate to to the deep part of the field. Um, he's he's very accurate. Um, I, I think he's one of those players that can that can kind of you know footwork ain't, isn't the best, but because of how strong his arm is, he can kind of get away with those things, right? I think Penix a little bit. I, I, you know what? I'm gonna give him the strongest arm. I, I'm, I'm gonna say it there. I'm gonna give Daniels the strongest arm. Oof. Daniels, yeah, yeah. the strongest yeah, yeah. arm. I'm, 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 I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Daniels the strongest arm. Yeah. Nah, I, would, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have him in the top three, man. No. I said, I said, listen, listen. listen. Okay. This is why All I'm right. gonna. This is why I'm gonna say that. I know Penix got that laser. We call him Laser Penix, right? Yeah. But he can miss though, doing too much with with his arm, bro. So I'm just. Well, telling I, you, I, think I think Daniels, Daniels. I think accuracy deep down the field is impressive, but as far as arm strength. No, his accuracy deep down the field is very impressive, uh, Jaden Daniels. Uh, listen, bro, listen. bro, shoot, shoot the wings off the fly, bro. That's not Daniels, bro. That's, That's not Daniels, bro. <sighs> Maybe in terms of the accuracy deep down field, but okay, just okay. in terms All of right. the, the the pure arm strength, no, no, I can't, I can't abide by it. I can't abide by All right, it, man. Bro. Well, well, I'm, a, I'm a fight to the death, man. Yeah, gingerly, G- gingerly, because I know what's now. He's now is gingerly. <laughs> gingerly, I gotta, gotta hedge my bet, man. I gotta hedge my bet. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, man. Uh, Daniels, he's he's he, they're talking about him going number two to um to to the Commanders, commanders. Mm-hmm. and and I can completely understand why. 
Um, you know, the, the, the warts that he does have, he hasn't played a, a lot of football when you compare it to the other, the other quarterbacks. Um, so there's a lot to learn in terms of going through his progression. Cause a lot of his throws, you know, were an A, they're not his so, fault. So, you know, so I, clean that one up for me, clean, clean that one up for me because he, he, he has quite a bit of starts under his belt. He's a six, he's a he super senior years. At, at LSU. Years, bro. Oh, Arizona I forgot. State. Arizona, Arizona State. State. Arizona you got a lot State, of experience. That is correct. Yeah, you got a lot of see, experience. See, mm-hmm. see, see, we hold we hold each other accountable here on this podcast. <laughs> you, man. That is correct. I uh, can't just be talking crazy. Um, was it Caligulus? Huge list ready. Caligulous. Said we fighting, right. bro. We fighting. Got to fight, bro. Got to fight. <laughs> <laughs> got to fight. Um, what was I saying? You, you just, you just, you just interrupted. I, I just, what I was I just, saying. You well, you were you were indicating that you'd like to see you know more more experience more from him, but, but he certainly exactly has that. that. He certainly he has. That. That. I'm not sure where you're going after that. Um, I forgot, man. I lost. This, <laughs> uh, I lost this, 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 it'll come back to me. It'll come back to me when Helly's talking. Well, about you know what? You know what? I I, I want to talk about the the arm strength conversation, and of course, we can mm-hmm. we can we can wax about mm-hmm. arm strength, and arm strength is is significant. Don't get me wrong. Right, you know, arm strength is a good thing, but it has to be tempered. I like the way he's developed from that perspective. A season ago, we, we just didn't see those whole shots consistently enough, right? And, you know, trying to get that ball in between the corner and the safety in that cover two. Um, we, we saw that, and of course, his deep ball accuracy was phenomenal this past year. So the ability, the ability to push the football downfield is there, and, and I saw a nice uptick in terms of him making those stick throws from 2022 to 2023. So when we're talking about requisite arm strength, I think he certainly has that. To, 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 I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that he's, you know, among among the strongest arm in this particular class, but good arm I'm strength. I'm going to say it. Enough. I'm going to say Certainly it. Enough. Um, no, I remember now. So so in terms of, because we, we talk about Brian Kelly and we don't necessarily like him as an offensive play caller. We, we feel he, you know, in terms of, of talent, just in, in terms of a general coach, we feel like he leaves a lot of meat on the bone. Sure. College coaches tend to do that. Um, and, and I, in terms of the offense that they ran and what they were asking the receivers to do, I think it's very limited. So this is something that, you know, the, the progressions were, I think, a little, little easier than normal. And I think that that's something that he's going to have to um, – that, that's a hill he's going to have to climb and get over in the league because defenses are going to make things very, very difficult. You're not going to be running around with a Brian Roberts and a Malik Neighbors that can just dominate um, all over the football. Brian field, Roberts, right? the because second baseman? I mean <laughs> – Brian Thomas, dang, bro. <laughs> bro, let me breathe, bro. Let me add it, bro. Let me add it. The Orioles right there. That is the Orioles. Um, yeah, so um, he, he, there is a hill he's going to have to get over when it, when mm-hmm. it comes to – he may have some stars, but there's stars on the other side as well. So you're not playing um, UF every week where you can just run past everybody and, and throw it to your superstars because they're wide open, right? So strike two, damn! I got to. Oh, you keep calm. You down oh two right that's, now, bro. Nah, that's <laughs> Angel, that's Angel Hernandez is back there. You gotta protect you, right you now, bro. Know what I'm saying? You gotta file. You gotta file off some pitches, bro. Yeah, you gotta call you <laughs> back. I work it out. I work it out. I, I think one of the, one of the main things, and, and Dana made mention of it, is is his ability oh, yeah. to actually protect himself. That that's gonna be a big question mark at the next at the next level. Like you can't be getting you know the fade. You, you can't be. You know, we talked about the running backs not too long ago about guys making themselves small and avoiding, you know, direct hits. Daniels doesn't. He, he he's takes like Bambi, full, bro. He's like a dare out bro. There, bro. <laughs> full brunt of Nothing the car coming. crash, bro. The full brunt of the car crash, bro. So definitely going to need to tighten up from bro, that perspective. I, I remember, bro, in high school, there used to be this, this safety, bro. And you know, you're supposed to lower your shoulder, head up. You know what I'm saying? Nah. This man will come in chest high and be rapid. Bro, just be. I'm like, bro, you, you <laughs> chest, what are you doing, bro? chest first, bro. Just, oh, chest first, bro. I've never, he never got hurt. Never got hurt, but I know he was going. Oh, home, that's just, a beast, bro. That's a beast. Did he, he make a tackle, though? Daniels, Did he make a tackle? Bro. He made a tackle. Yeah, he made a tackle. yeah you know, he dragged uh, down, down get ran over or whatever. Just you know, I hit him on the ground, down. bro. That's all that matters, bro. That's all that matters. <laughs> Let's move on to QB three here. And Hella, you have Michael Penix, and Drew, you have Drake May. So, uh, Drew, I'll give you an opportunity to speak about your guy here. I, I think for the most part, you've had him as QB two. Um, he settles mm-hmm. in at QB three for you. 
Yes, 6'4", 223, nice, uh, strong, thick frame. Uh, what's that, no Diddy? Um, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he works well when the, when the play breaks down uh, to find his open guy. I think he's decisive once the play breaks down what he's going to do. You have some quarterbacks who will kind of run back there and not sure what they're, what they're going to do um, looking for the open guy. I think he's a little bit more decisive when it comes uh, to that. Uh, he's another guy who doesn't protect himself. Now, he's he's I think he's thicker than um, – than Jaden Daniels, so maybe there's a little less worry, but he's a guy who doesn't protect himself. Need to see more sliding from him. And I got here, while the offensive line was better than last year, the receivers got worse. So so the offensive line wasn't, it wasn't, you know, world beaters, but the receivers got worse. And I think, you know, Hadley kind of talked about it earlier, and we talked about it with Spencer Rattler in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you evaluate a guy where – things aren't the the, the the positions that help that position aren't where they need to be now there were times where things th those guys did their job and he didn't do his job in terms of right. going through his progressions in terms of seeing what he was supposed to see it, you know it it, it 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 was inconsistent right so so he y'all hear yeah. that he had yeah, to come he, he had to come down off my rankings because i listen brother always says I want to see consistency, and at this particular position, you got to have it. There's no excuse. There's no you, and and he didn't have it. Part of it was on him. Part of it was on his supporting cast. But um, he had to come down off my rankings just a tad bit, man. I probably put him at four. Put Daniels at at three. You know, I, I my biggest concern, my biggest concern, ultimately going in, and I and I chalked it up to inexperience, right? Was a pre snap recognition. You talked about it, Headley. Like there, there were just a couple of times where. It's not like the defense is hiding it. They're not disguising it well. You have to recognize it and understand where to go with the football. And he didn't have the answers to the test. I thought with more experience, you know, another year under his belt, another off season to prepare, study film, we would start to see a little bit more um, development from that perspective. There was incremental development, not necessarily to the degree that I wanted to see. The the the, the sporadic nature of some of his play is is what really concerns me the most, though. Right. I think good quality coaching will, will be able to help him recognize things better, and, you know, at least pre-snap. Now, post-snap things change. That That's up to the quarterback at that point. Right. But in terms of his preparation, we can we can flesh out, iron out our issues pre-snap. The, the inconsistency in, in terms of the ball placement, you know, that 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 is something with improved, albeit, you know, the, the 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 talent that the receiver position wasn't quite as good as it was a season ago, with improved offensive line play, I expected more out of him. So I can understand why people are are maybe push him down a little bit. But as you mentioned, the, the traits are excellent. He, he And there's some wow throws in there, right? You know, th throwing it through a couple of different windows in one, in one pass. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's some really impressive stuff there from a, a still a relatively young quarterback so yeah you, you at this point you're betting you're betting on those traits and and that's that's a lot of what the draft has become is betting on the traits we, we talked about josh allen and of course he had his warts coming out but you know buffalo bet on the traits they they coached him up they, they made sure that he had you know at least equality enough supporting cast and then of course when that confidence started to take over you see the player that he's developed into now of course his arm his confidence overconfidence gets him into trouble to sometimes and I, and I think you might get that with a drake may but you know you you kind of weigh out those pros and cons and generally you know most most coaches most teams are going to take that so um interesting to see if he does go as high as number two again as you mentioned it, it seems like the, the momentum has shifted to jane daniels going second overall but that that third maybe even fourth quarterback off the board. I, I don't expect him to, to fall any further than that. All right. Michael Penix, Headley. Laser Penix. Laser Penix. Three. Now, you got some explaining now, to do, bro. You got some explaining to do, bro. Let's, let's hear it. Let's hear, <laughs> it. hear it. Hear it, man. Uh, Laser Penix, uh, he, he's been my QB3 uh, from last season. Uh, if he was in that draft class, he's about, he was going to be my QB3. And he's been my QB3 all year. And, and then I moved into QB2. For like a week mm. and then i was like you know what <laughs> i like him at qb3 man so let me let me put him down there uh the qb2 we're gonna talk about him later i rewatched uh his tape all his throws and i i see a lot of things i like man but we're gonna talk about laser panics here uh perseverance that's that should be the number one word for, for laser panics uh michael panics jr 
uh, the injuries, dealing with all those injuries he dealt with in college, uh, the transfer uh, from Indiana to, to Washington, the leadership ability, man. That, that's the second thing we want to talk about. So he has those intangibles, the perseverance, the leadership abilities. So he has that in spades. On top of that, he's the best pocket quarterback in the entire class. Uh, you know, what he does in, in the pocket is it's amazing. He has the strongest arm in this class as well. And you know what he's like? You know when you talk about the running back position and, and you got to hold your breath every time, like a Dalvin Cook, you hold your breath every time he touches the football? Well, Mark Pettis, you got to hold. FSU Dalvin. FSU Dalvin. Come on. F Minnesota Dalvin too? Mm -hmm. Come on. Nah, Vikings nah, Dalvin? Nah, nah. we, we weren't, people weren't holding their breath now. Come on now. It was different at FSU. No, it they was were. different. They it were, was different at FSU. In Minnesota bro. too, bro. But, um, but, but Michael Pettis does that from the quarterback position where every time he drops back, you got to hold your breath because – it might be six, man. That, that that strong arm, he does it deep down the field, uh, just across the middle of the field. Um, like Michael Vick. Remember Michael Vick? They're not the same prospect. They're not even close to the same prospect. But Vick had that same thing where every drop back, you don't know uh, right. if it's going to be it a touchdown or not. It could go it could six, go six. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and yep. he makes those throws that 95% that of quarterbacks can't make. Those hole shots in between the cornerback and safety. Opposite uh, hash lasers to the other side of the field. It, it, it just... You know, it's, it's it's really nice to watch, man. You watch uh, Michael Penix, you've seen in that Texas game. I know the national championship game was a little rough, and, and that's where his, his struggles come sometimes uh, with pressure, escaping the pocket. Uh, he's not the super athletic guy. I know they said he ran a four or what, five. I, I, I don't really think he's a four or five guy, but, you know, I think escaping the pocket and just getting squared up. Sometimes I think he does all upper body sometimes with his yeah. throws. He doesn't get squared up with that lower body. So I think he could improve from that standpoint. Um, to me, he's a, he's a time and a rhythm guy. You just got to protect him. If you protect Michael Penix at the next level and he gets oh, yeah. his time and a rhythm, uh, to me, he's a plus two. two. I, I call him the strong arm Tua because uh, Tua was the same way too. He needed an offensive system that you got the weapons and you can protect him. He can get the ball in his hands quickly. And uh, a pocket quarterback, just like Tua. So I, I think there's a lot of similarities in their game. It's just Penix just has that that. That, that rocket arm that that Tua doesn't. Um, and then when he hits that last step in his back pedal and throws on a rhythm, I think he's unstoppable. That five step, that seven step at the top of his drops and he gets it out quickly. I think he's unstoppable there. I think a rhythm time and uh, tempo offense will do him justice. Um, and he's more of a pocket passer, like I said. Off script, I think that's where he needs to work on a little bit. That's why he's my quarterback three. I think it's the top two guys in this class. He's just a lot better outside of structure. Uh, off script, they just perform really well there, and and that's something Michael Pettis doesn't have in his bag at this point. So, you know, that's where I knock him a little bit. But you know, he looks comfortable on the center. I see him turn his back to the defense, play action, uh, nice touch on the deep balls. Like I said, the opposite hash lasers. Uh, I like that he'll check down because he's a she's a strong arm quarterback, and he'll take his chances sometimes and, and throw into traffic. But he also checks it down a lot in that Washington offense. So I, I did like that he did that a lot in that offense. And and uh, limiting those turnover worthy plays, and he can look off defenders, snaps his head, throw darts uh, in the next progression, uh, and he gets gets the ball out quickly on a rope. So in terms of the arm talent, all of that, man, I think Penix is the best in the class in the pocket, and you just got to protect him at the next level. Like I said, man, so he's my QB three right now. I, I think in terms of functional mobility, he he absolutely has it. I, I think he absolutely has it. But to your point, it, it's still being a accurate passer when he's moved off of his spot right i think the requisite athleticism is there in order to step up slide if if he so chooses to to run and get you five six yards you know extend the drive um but he's keeping his eyes down the field but i i just want him to be a more consistent passer outside of the pocket now within the pocket as you mentioned within rhythm when he's protected uh it's hard to argue with with his ability and and i've, I've seen a number of throws you mentioned the opposite hash laser where it's opposite hash, it's about 35, 40 yards downfield, and the safety, the safety is already outside of the hash, and he still can't get there. That's that's Jay Daniels don't have that arm strength, Drew. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. He he don't he don't have that kind of arm strength. So th that is special. That is special. I I, Mark I think that he needs to work in. <laughs> I what I, what I really do think he needs to work on is his flexibility, right? You mentioned it, Headley, in terms of him getting in a position to be able to deliver the football when he's moved off his spot. And I think, you know, he th there's some tightness there. I don't know if it's a residual effect. I don't know if it has to do with the, the, the lefty delivery. I'm not sure. But if, if he can get a little bit more 
flexible and and, and work on that arm elasticity, I, I think he could be better outside of structure, even though remaining a quarterback, right? And, and, uh, remaining a passer under those circumstances. So th- I, I think it, I think there's a I think there's a non playmaking aspect to his game that he needs to improve outside of structure. If that makes any sense, it's a, it's a lot to to kind of digest there. But I, I don't think it's for lack of of creativity necessarily, but just his body. You know, it, it, there's a, there's a certain level of rigidity associated with his body as a passer. It looks it looks mechanical to a degree. It, it doesn't always look free and flowing. If if he can work on some of that that flexibility i think it'll actually help him outside of structure at least from my perspective so yeah i think i think Penix is going to come at a value uh, at least you know that's what i'm anticipating of course things may have changed i'm hearing he won't get past the raiders i, I think if the raiders get him at 13 or wherever they're drafting they, they'd be over the moon you know what i mean so the whole notion that that Penix shouldn't be selected in the first round i i've never bought into it i've never i don't think anybody on this panel has bought into that notion but um when you talk about Guys, you can drop into an offense that that can keep him upright and let him go to work. Uh, it'd be impressive, and I'm and I'm not I'm not one of those people who are who are you know trying to to perhaps slot him down a little bit lower because he's playing with receivers that are going to play at the next level, right? He had a very good supporting cast. There's no mistake about it. But we heard nothing from the Huskies prior to Michael Penix landing in Washington, right? We heard nothing. Oregon has been consistently. Part of, you know, in the conversation out there representing the Pac-12 for as long as we can remember, right? Especially going through the BCS moving into the uh, college football playoff era. The Huskies outside of, you know, uh, you know they had a little run with Jake Browning. They, they really hadn't done a whole lot, right? And Michael Penix ushered in a, a new level of, of performance and, and winning there in Washington that we haven't seen in quite some time. So big fan of Michael Penix, but certainly in areas he can improve upon. That takes us to the second ranked quarterback. And we're going to stay right there, Drew, with the Michael Penix conversation. Yeah, I mean, to, to the point when you talk about, you know, the Huskies kind of not saying put on the map, but uh, not hearing uh, about them too much outside of maybe their defense, their corners, a mm-hmm. couple of pass rushers, mm-hmm. right? But to the point where their coach is now the head coach of At Bama. Right. So, um, you know, and that, that's him doing his job in terms of recruiting and all that. So kudos to him. But uh, you guys kind of talked about it, you know, to death in terms of what he is and who he is. You know, we talked about the strong arm. We talked about him making going through his progressions, the full full field reads. Uh, we talked about his ability to well, lack of ability to maybe um, be able to handle pressure that's coming his way and making doing the J.J. McCarthy kind of sidestepping, doing the, I call it the Drew Brees kind of sidestepping um, and and being able to still get the football out. I think, and I think Jushi said it was, you know, it's, it's elasticity. I think it might be just something, I, I just don't have to do this. Like I haven't had to do this because my offensive line has been so good because the running game has been so good because I have receivers where I can just throw it down the field. So I haven't been able to do this. Imagine doing something you haven't done in forever. I need you to come and do this for me at the job. Something, something you should know, but you necessarily don't remember how to do it because you haven't done it or you haven't been in that system to do that, whatever it is that they're asking you to do, right? It's not it's necessarily like riding a bike. And, and now I have to do it in the biggest moments uh, of, of my career currently, right? When, when we're playing, um, who is it? Who are they playing? Um, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, who are they playing championship game? Damn, I forgot. Michigan. Michigan. I don't know why I want to say Georgia. I know it wasn't Georgia. Uh, but sorry, Michigan, my, my bad. Uh, but I think it's just a lack of, of not doing it. Cause if you go back and you watch him play at Indiana, mm. that's a little bit of a different player, right? It I know, is. you know, obviously that's, that's, you know, he didn't have the injury, whatever, whatever, but yeah. that's a little bit of a different player. So, you know, he's kind of turned himself into, you know, a, a more traditional style quarterback, always had the strong arm, right. And maybe not relying on his legs. And, and maybe he just said, I don't, I don't have to use any of this. I've never had to, to tap into this, 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 these next few attributes, but in the league, they're going to be asking you to, to do that, brother. And so you, you're going to have to tap into that. So I think that's kind of where maybe it's just something he hasn't had to do. And, and I think he might've gotten hurt too in that, that championship game, which pretty he much did. closed the he door did. on that. The, the, the um, so he didn't were, even get an opportunity to, to, to use that. Right. Yeah. So, you know, not to give him an excuse, but the brother was hurt, man. Right. So, the ribs were stinging. Uh, but yeah. So, 
Yeah, Mr. Sebraski, I I don't know the raw numbers, so so you know you'll you'll have to forgive me here as, as it relates to Oregon. I I just in, in my mind, in my mind's eye, Oregon has um been more consistent. Perhaps not necessarily the same number of appearances in the college football playoff, but just in terms of pushing up against those double digit wins over the expanse of the last ten to fifteen years, they've been more consistent from that perspective. I think just in terms of Getting to like that next level, Washington probably has done a better job um, behind a, a Browning and and, and Penix led effort there. So I, I'm with you. I, I I respect it. I just think year yeah, to year. Count. Yeah, he is. He is. <laughs> I, I can't. He's a husky. He a husky. Come on. But, I don't know what. But but yeah. check the numbers. Fact check me. I, I think just in terms of total wins in that expanse of time, I think Oregon probably has a little bit of an edge there. So, um, Mrs. Sebraski, keeping me honest there. Uh, Headley, you, you got Jane Daniels at QB two now. What, what's what's this about? Hmm? Yeah, I'm moving him up, man. I moved him up. I watched all his throws, all his runs, and you know, I said it last season, man. This guy reminds me of Bryce Young, and and when I say that is is that nervous system. He's he's, he's not, nothing too fast. He's not he's not getting sped up. He's not getting slowed down. He just plays with a, that that requisite like that innate ability to feel things. If there's no pressure on Jaden Daniels, he's going to take all the time in the world. He's going to find the guy, locate the guy, hit the open wide receiver. So, you know, just very patient. He's never in a rush. But the, the, the main difference between him and Bryce Young is he's just a lot more athletic. And, and, and that's kind of why I moved him up to QB2 over Michael Penix is because, you know, when you think about the worst case scenario, you go to like a Bryce Young situation, you go to the no receivers, no offensive line, who's going to fare better? Michael Penix or Jaden Daniels? And and the answer to me was Jaden Daniels. Uh, so when things aren't the best around him, he has those legs that he could use. Um, and I love the way he processes. Uh, he processes very quickly, uh, post-snap to get to those secondary reads, those third reads also in the offense. Um, you know, you guys said it in the chat, though, that, that you got to protect yourself. You got to learn how to slide, man. You got to take some, some classes, man, some baseball lessons or something, man, because He's like a dare in the headlights, man. I call him Bambi because he just he just runs into big hits. And at the next level, those are eight-week, 12-week, season-long injuries. So we don't want you getting hurt. You're the quarterback of the football team. So you need to slide a little bit better. Um, I have here not the biggest arm, Drew. I have not the biggest arm in my notes. Um, but that was a beautiful deep ball. Beautiful deep ball with touch. I think that uh that slot fade, I think that's his specialty. You know, once he has that, that timing and that perfect deep ball down the field to either Malik Neighbors or, or Brian Thomas Jr., I don't think anybody throws a better slot fade than, than Jaden Daniels. Um, but catching those fast receivers in stride, you see it with Brian Thomas. Sometimes he doesn't catch him in stride deep down the field. So, uh, you know, I think that's uh, talking about his arm talent, his arm strength. I think it could improve a little bit. Um, but the slot fade, I said, it was especially his, uh, his specialty. I think zip outside the numbers can improve a little bit better. Um, but like I said, man, he has that innate ability to feel pressure off the edge. You know, it's, it's you, we see it with quarterbacks where and I thought Spencer Rattler had a case of this also where the edge rusher comes and he's kind of running into the sack. You know, Jaden Daniels kind of feels it without even seeing it. He feels it. He knows when to take it to the edge. He knows when to step up and make a throw. So, you know, I, I really like that about Jaden Daniels. Um, and, you know, pressure up the middle. He's a, he's a shorter quarterback. Well, he's 6'2". He's not short, but... I think pressure up the middle is the best way to get to him, but um, kind of like Bryce Young, but that interior offensive line, I think it would be very important uh, for Jaden Daniels at the next level. Uh, a lot of experience. Uh, I have here a five-year starter, and I think he's improved drastically since transfer from Arizona State. Even that first year at LSU, like Drew said, that first game against Florida State, you were like, I thought, I was like, you know, this guy isn't any good, man. And then you saw he got better and better and better through the season. I thought he had the best second half of the 2022 season. And it's so good that, you know, we were talking here at CPG. I'm like, this guy's a, a Heisman candidate, man, before yeah. anybody was saying that. Dark you know, horse, we, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. were saying that before uh, anybody was saying that. And he eventually won the Heisman. He took that strong second half of his 2022 season. Had an incredible 2023 season uh, with the LSU Tigers. And I think he reads the entire field, man. I think not a lot of quarterbacks can, can say that, how he can read the field and process quickly and not be uh, sped up. Like I said, that nervous system is big for Jaden Daniels. That legs are big for him. So I think going to Washington, if he goes to number two to Washington with those receivers, with Dotson, Terry McLaurin on that roster, uh, I think they can have a – they've got to protect them. That's going to be the thing about the, the Washington commander's offensive line. But if they can protect him, especially up the middle, 
I, I think we could see him catch, uh, get there quickly and have a, a good season. Now, I wouldn't say CJ Stroud rookie season, but I think he have a big year, year one uh, with the commanders. Dana was asking about uh, Daniel's mechanics and, and you know, her, her challenge in terms of evaluating. I thought McCann's fine. Daniels, yeah. D, 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 Compared is, to all of these other quarterbacks, yeah. you yeah, talk yeah. about Drake May mechanics, um, yeah. especially uh, Michael Penix's uh, mechanics outside the pocket. Mm -hmm. I think Daniel's mechanics in the pocket and outside the pockets is really well. And, and the processing ability, man, that kind of jumped out at me because you, you think of Jaden Daniels, especially at the beginning of 22 season, you thought he had a, a long way to go. And, and watching the 23 tape, I was like, wow, this guy processes quickly. He has great legs to escape the pocket. He's a, he has very a lot of experience. So he has a lot of uh, pluses for me. And, and that's why he's QB too. Yeah, I, I think the, the leap from 2022, late 2022 to 2023 um, was really impressive, right? The mechanics I mentioned, I, I use a very specific example of him being more effective in terms of the whole shot, getting the ball between the corner and the safety, getting it up and down, right? Pushing that football, getting it up and down. It, it seemed to to kind of be lofty, a little bit of a loopy type of, of throw when he needed to really drive it. And then you saw that. You saw that 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 additional arm strength, this past season and i think it's a byproduct of his mechanics i think better mechanics has allowed him as well as getting stronger obviously to to really push the football down the field with more consistency and again what we saw in terms of him on deep throws was was out of this world like nonsensical how effective he was pushing the football down the field this past season so um i, I can understand why people might have some hesitation in terms of some some of the the, the concepts that that were ran and, and the offense and whether or not you're a kelly fan Th that aspect of it, uh, the biggest question mark for me with Jane Daniels is is really him protecting himself, right? And and you know I, I think we oversimplify that because these guys are they're they're, they're wired a certain way. You, you you gotta you gotta be cognizant of that. Part of what makes Jane Daniels special is what he does by extending plays using his legs, and he's got to figure out how to slide, how to get out of bounds, how to do something to preserve himself. Otherwise, he's not gonna make it. He, he he's he's not gonna make it even if he were you know 15 pounds heavy i don't i don't think he's gonna make it and having those types of car crashes out there so i i understand i can understand why you know he, he's moved up your board here because of not only what he has done in terms of his development within the pocket but that that, that, that special nature that additional element he offers outside of structure as well that takes us to the top ranked quarterback and uh, really no surprise here. We, we've been consistent throughout the, the whole process, even when during the pre-draft process, you know, we were trying – actually, we – I shouldn't use the term we. The 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 media at large was trying to pull Caleb Williams back to the pack or, or move him down the board. Um, he's remained the top quarterback for us in this class, all right? He's not without fault by any, any stretch of the imagination, but the, the, the total package here – is most impressive in class for us. Headley, what are your thoughts on, on Caleb Williams? Your final thoughts on Caleb Williams? Yeah, like you said, what you said at the end, that, that total package, you know, the wow ability, you know, the arm talent, uh, the legs. I think he's a, a dominant runner of the football. I don't think we've seen a guy, you know, I said Michael Vick earlier, man, but just so dominant with his legs. You know, he can make a, a bad play uh, turn into a good play. You know, he has that ability. I think him and uh, Jaden Daniels are probably the two best dual threat quarterbacks in the class, but – he runs with a different buck, man. While, while Jaden uh, Daniels is more of a daring the headlight, this guy is just uh, runs aggressive. He's a hard runner. He runs past defenders. Uh, you know, he came from Oklahoma. He followed Lincoln Riley over there to USC. And I don't know, can I say it? He, he, probably the closest thing to Mahomes that we've seen, man, since since Mahomes came out, man, because of what he does outside the structure of a of a uh, offense, man. He's kind of like he kind of like toys with, with defenders, man. You know, he just kind of plays with him a little bit, sits in the pocket, then he'll just take off or he'll buy enough time to get his wide receivers open. So as a wide receiver playing with Caleb Williams, you always got to be running to the sideline, always trying to get open because he's going to find you. If you keep working, he, Caleb Williams is going to find you. He's going to buy enough time to find you deep down the field. Uh, I love his ball skills uh, to fake out defenders, to keep plays alive. Um, creative playmaker. Uh, I think he what he has to approve upon. So, you know, we see all the strengths. How, how the ball comes out of his hands is it, it, a zip. I think he has one of the strongest arms in this class. It, it comes out with a zip for every effortlessly. But I think what he could improve upon is uh, this consistency within the pocket.
You know, we've seen it at times where, where teams send the pressure on him and he has to get the ball out quickly. And sometimes he doesn't take the ball, uh, get the ball out quickly and just taking those layups. He's always looking for those home runs. And sometimes, you know, especially at the next level, you got to take those layups. You got to check it down. Uh, so I think that's something he needs to improve upon at the next level. Um, and but, you know, he has those multiple arm angles. He'll throw in tight coverage. Uh, sometimes you throw too much in tight coverage. He'll take some risk because of that strong arm. Um, but, you know, you just got to work on just taking a layup. I, that's the biggest knock to me with Caleb Williams, playing within the structure, taking a layup, hitting the check down, not always hitting the home run. And then I think his lower body mechanics also can improve as well, man. Sometimes he's a little flat-footed when he throws the football. He got a really good fastball. I uh, want to see more change up with him. So, you know, although he's the QB1 uh, prospect, and I think he might be one of those can't-miss guys, I think he's uh, number two in the entire draft class for me. I think I have it on um, Marvin Harrison Jr., Kayla Williams, and Brock Bowers. Although he, he has all that going for him, there's still things on tape, man, that he has to improve upon to be that quarterback at the next level if you want to be Patrick Mahomes. Now, you're saying you're not Andrew Luck, bro? He's not. not no, nah, he's not. He's not Andrew Luck uh, coming out. He's not Joe Burrow uh, coming out. I think those two are probably the highest quarterbacks I've graded. Um, you know, I also really like Jameis Winston, but, you know, we, we don't want to talk about it. It might have, it might have been my fan, though. Might have been my fandom. That was fandom, man. That was a little fandom, man. For sure. Yeah. Listen, Mr. C. Prasky, I think I think there's a misnomer here when 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 people mention um Caleb Williams and Patrick Mahomes. But we're not we're not talking about what Patrick Mahomes, you know, developed in after sitting for a season. And and Mahomes will say it as far as learning how to prepare. It wasn't for lack of talent, right? He, He clearly was a very talented player coming out of uh Texas Tech. There was no question about his ability to spin it, right? And and create. But landing in Kansas City with Andy Reid, who's never had a quarterback who hasn't been successful, um, I, I think just the evaluation of Mahomes at Texas Tech, when you're looking at it and you're juxtaposing that against Caleb Williams, that's where you, you're drawing the parallels. Not the player Mahomes has developed into at Kansas City. Now, that, that's that's, a, that's nah. a different animal. That, that's yeah. a completely different animal. But what we saw in terms of a, a lot of a lot of parallels, actually, in terms of Mahomes doing too much because he was in a track meet, right? The, the Texas Tech defense was poor. He's in the Big 12. They, they're putting up a lot of points. You know, there, there was there was a lot of turn, turnover-worthy throws. And that's actually the area that I think I give Caleb Williams the advantage in is that I think he's done a better job of protecting the football compared to Mahomes at Texas Tech. And again, some of that was just a byproduct of, you know what, I got to make a play. I have to absolutely make a play because if we punt, we lose. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? We, we don't. We don't have the ability to get stopped. So, um, and and we saw a little bit of that creep in here. I, I shouldn't say a little bit. There was enough of that. It was it was pretty significant here with USC as well. Uh, one of the areas that I don't think people talk about enough as it relates to Caleb Williams, um, and, and of course he's developed some bad habits because of what was going on around him, uh, and he's going to need to correct that. Is the, the the offensive line play at USC wasn't good, bro. We, we we talk about the defense and and not getting stops and it being a track meet, but I, I thought the offensive line was giving up pressure way too quickly on the regular. It, it was a swinging gate of, of an offensive line. So so now, you know, you're talking about him not necessarily playing within structure. It's because he's been sped up. He's been sped up. Now, the, what the challenge is and what, you, what, what we need to see from Caleb Williams is that it does not translate moving forward because we've seen that play out as well where you've picked up some bad habits because things weren't great around you and you never – break out of that you get hit one too many times and you start looking at the rush as opposed to keeping your eyes down feel that type of thing so um that that's the concern there that that's the concern there what about you drew what are your thoughts on caleb williams yeah man he's he's been number one uh he's gonna stay number one in terms of the in terms of the the i think Hadley Hadley called it in terms of how we have him stacked in terms of marvin harrison being one him being two but in terms of the quarterback position um never wavered you know i might have i might have um I might have uh, steeped in a Michael Penix a time or two or or a Jaden Daniels a time or two at quarterback one just to, you know, just to be different. But in terms of of what he can bring to the table, um, I think he's he's the entire package. Uh, you know, he's, he's a guy who can extend plays. Uh, he's a guy he's not necessarily looking to run. Um, he's looking to get the ball down the football field um, and if he needs to run, he can run. I think sometimes he can, to me, sometimes I he, you know, I said this earlier in the in in um in summer scouting in terms of the, the different quarterbacks in terms of their ability to get outside the pocket and make plays 
um, with their feet. And he does it differently than everyone else. Um, he can make you miss, but he can also break a tackle if you're not coming to, coming at him, you know, with, with some heat, right? Because I think he's strong enough, nice compact frame to break through whatever tackle's coming unless, you know, it's, it's Ray Lewis out there. But um, his ability to want to throw the football down the field, to throw it down the field accurately, um, you know, I, I heavily talked about in terms of his, you know, wanting to work within the structure of the offense. But again, this is one of these quarterbacks. It was kind of hard to to evaluate um, at times because it was a swinging gate, right? Or you had receivers dropping pass. Well, I guess you could still read that out. You had receivers dropping passes. So what does that do do for him now? Now he has to press, right? Now he's got to play hero football, right? It's all on me. It's all on on Caleb. It's all on thirteen, right? I'm I'm, I'm in California where I got you know it's always exciting and 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 the sun is out and and and. You know, it's like camera action out there, right? So I always have to perform, and and that that can wear on anybody, bro. Especially when you know your defense is terrible, bro. Like we thought, okay, last year, you know what? You know what? It, you know, it's his first year there. Got to got to kind of work them some things out. Got to get the defensive players in there. And you think in this year, I didn't think it was gonna be, you know, uh, you know, we're going from like a one to a to a to a ten. I'm thinking, okay, they they might be sitting like at a five. That, that's serviceable, right? Because USC is going to put up points. And, and they probably in, in, improve to a two in terms of defensively. So what does that do to your quarterback, man? It just puts more pressure on him. And, and you know, they were losing the teams they had no business losing to, right? So it, it was just tough for him to, to, you know, drop back consistently and throw the football out and get it out in time to, to be that quarterback. I know I'm making excuses for a couple of these guys, but I, I just got to put it out there because I don't want people, you know, running around here talking about, you know, he played outside of structure. Um, on purpose, right? That that wasn't that wasn't necessarily the, the case for him, um, but he's he's got the, the the strong arm, can get it anywhere on the football field. Uh, I, I love his ball placement, um, and he's QB one, bro, all day long. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, man. This this shouldn't be a discussion in terms. Of, well, I guess he was going to to um to the Bears. So I, I, I and and to me, I always say this about quarterbacks: is this and and Juicy said it earlier? Is this a guy? who can raise the level of play of the players around him. That's exactly what he is. And yep. that's why he's going to go number one. End yep. of story. That, that's that's what it comes down to when, when it's all said and done for for the the, the handful of warts that he has. Um, and, and like I said, I, I think he has some things he needs to work on. And, and some of it was, you know, you know, it, it, it really kind of mushroom clouded because of some of the circumstances around him. But that's that's what you see from Caleb Williams. He 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 gives you a fighting chance because he has the ability to raise the level of play of guys around him. The, the I, I want to see him coached hard, right? I, I think you know again we were talking about Mahomes. I, Mahomes got an opportunity to be coached hard. You know he had the good cop bad cop situation with Andy Reid and, and Eric Bieniemy. You, you understand what I'm saying? I, I think I think there's so much on top of Mahomes' prodigious ability and his competitiveness which i think is really truly the the what, what separates mahomes is his competitive streak right that innate you know I, we're never out of this thing um th that's going to be the biggest question mark with caleb williams I, I he certainly strikes me as a competitor but he, he he wants to win but but does he have that that terminator type of mentality you understand what i'm saying when the chips are down right with with a little bit of defense you know what i'm saying or can we can we stay in this thing? But if we're struggling, you know, we can't get out of first gear. Um, are, are we going to be able to dig deep and, and, and put that drive together to put us over the top? That that's that to me is what it comes down to from a coaching perspective. And and again, you know, when when the chips are against the wall, can you get the team over the top? That that's what I I'm I'm waiting to see here from Caleb Williams. But yeah, I'm definitely invested in the first overall pick in him. We, we talked about it with the Chicago Bears. If there was a lot of conversation as to whether or not they would move off of Justin Fields. This was a guy that unequivocally I would have moved off of Justin Fields for. Everybody else, you know, it's a conversation at that point. But if I had an opportunity to select Caleb Williams, that's the direction I'm going to go in. So Caleb Williams is the first overall quarterback in your rankings here. I wanted to uh, address Dana's question here before we move on to our next position group. Um, and it's with respect to Jaden Daniels. It's actually with respect to Jaden Daniels in terms of him struggling on a few of the shorter routes that he threw. And, and I, I just happened to look, I was curious, just looking at the raw data. Um, PFF, you take that with a grain of salt, obviously. Um, his the, the, the number of drops LSU had 
when the throws were, you know, at the line of scrimmage or, you know, nine yards in depth was almost twice as many as anywhere else on the field. Right. So um, I, I think it's maybe a combination of, of, you know, some, some bad luck to a certain degree, but I, I wonder Dana, in, in, in terms of your evaluation, are, are you seeing a, a lack of accuracy there, a lack of timeliness, ball placement being an issue? What about you guys? Any, anything did you notice when, when the ball wasn't traveling, you know, past the, the, the first down sticks? I might say it might be, um, I call it um, the temperature of the throw, right? If, if mm. you know, I, everything don't got to be Brett Favre, right? Everything sure. don't got to be a Brett Favre throw. Like, if I'm, if I'm two feet from you, I don't need you, you know, breaking my fingers, right? So I think that may be, may be part of it, right? Just okay. understanding where, where your player is on the football field and what kind of throw needs to be made to that particular player. What about you, Hadley? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I like I like what Drew said right there. Um, like we always talk about fastballs and changeups. You, you got to have that changeup also. Um, I I didn't put it down in my notes. Um, so I I don't think I've seen it that much. Uh, mm -hmm. but I did see those drops though. I saw those drops. And I think it's a lot of times it's those receivers trying to get running before they catch the football. Mm -hmm. Neighbors mm -hmm. and Brian Thomas Jr. Because those I'm guys are up. explosive after the catch. So right. you did see some concentration drops from those guys. All right. Oh, Mr. C let's had a good question that. right here. With, with oh Shador. yeah, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Before we um yeah, what do you where, where you got him, Drew? If he came out. Speaking Shador speaking Sanders. of bad offensive lines. Speaking speaking oh, of poor and, and, and Shador got a little Dang. terminator in him, bro. Yeah, he does. He, he got some yeah, terminator does. in him, bro. Um I would put Shador. Let me just look. Um he would definitely be one, two. You got him over McCarthy. I know that much. I know you got him. Yeah, yeah it's two team. through four for me. Um, yeah, and I'm he looking at it. Four. He might be four for you. I'm look. I'm looking at it because he has a lot of the same uh, nervous system stuff that Jaden Daniels have. What I like mm -hmm. in Jaden Daniels, Shador has a lot of that also in him. He's never sped up. Uh, you know, so I, I don't know if I'll put him ahead of Jaden Daniels. I probably maybe my Michael Penix had an arm. It'd be three or four for me with Michael Penix Jr. Um, and I probably put Penix Jr. three, Sanders four, but. Sanders has another season, man, so he could he could move up uh, even further than that uh, for next year's draft class. All right. Let's switch gears here. Uh, let, let's go to the tight end position. All right. I, I think we can motor through that one pr pretty quickly. The, the, the tight end position, obviously, is it's not as fabulous as the quarterback position, obviously. Not sexy, bro? No, no, it, it, it isn't. Yeah. But you, you talk about the right. utility of the position. you got a lot of teams carrying four, maybe even five tight ends. You can play in line. You can split them out wide. You can do the H back, lead blocker, special teams. There's just so much utility associated with the tight end position. Now, not every player in the position group does all of those things, but it, it's one of those positions where you know you, you see guys get drafted early, early day two that don't even have a role. <laughs> you know, the first couple of years that that they're in the league because, of course, they're trying to learn a, a number of positions. That's just the nature of it. So. The NFL obviously puts a lot of stock into this particular position group, and, and I'm interested to get to your uh, rankings here right at number 12. And we're doing a top 12 here for the tight end position. Hadley, you have Tip Raymond, and Drew, you have Jaheim Bell. Let's start with you, Hadley. Yeah, you know, now you're talking about the tight end position and not being as strong. Uh, and it's just like any other position, but when you have a strong class from last season with Michael Mayer, Kincaid, uh, Sam Laporta, the next season might not be as strong. I think the running back class is kind of similar to that. Uh, it was really top heavy last year. And although there's some good running backs, I don't think it's as good as last year's class. So I think the tight end class suffers from that same thing where it, it was so good last year. Everyone came out last year. And, and this year's class, um, I, I'm just going, you know, very lead, man. It's Brock Bowers and everybody else. Everyone should know Brock <laughs> Bowers is number one. And wow, I don't, I don't foresee much day two <laughs> tight ends in, in this class. I think I have maybe uh, five. Five tight ends with a, a day two grade. So, you know, but Tip Raymond, man, I think Tip Raymond is a, he's a former walk-on turned team captain. I always like the, the, the former walk-ons turned team captains. This tells me their work ethic. Uh, they're getting better every year. So, you know, I think that's a positive. Um, and, and the run blocking. He's probably the best or one of the best run blockers in this entire class. He can move defenders, uh, open up gaping holes. So if you're an offense and you like the 12 personnel or – if you want to get it to the 13 personnel and get physical and run the football down on a defender's throat, 
I think Tate Raymond is the guy for you. Um, in the passing game, he's not going to do much. He can help in a short passing game. Um, once he catches the football, he does have power to break through tackles for additional yardage. Um, but he's not going to get much separation. He's one of those tight ends you kind of have to scheme open uh, on your offense. He's like that prototypical Y inline tight end that can make an uh, NFL roster as a block in tight end too. Um, he has good length and good strength. So, you know, that's Tip Raymond in the hole, man. He, he's going to be run blocking, man. And that's how he's going to um, make his mark on the NFL team. Drew, before you get to Jaheim Bell, I, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about the the comparing the, the draft classes, right? And and the point I made res, with respect to NFL teams, they, they just prioritize having the, these true. types of players, right? And, you know, you, you mentioned Kincaid, Laporta, Mayer. Those are the first three tight ends off the board. Um, just just on day two. Let me tell you the names of the remaining tight ends connected on day Strange. two. Strange. All right. <laughs> I already like, know the names. Like we, we talking, we got Luke Musgrave, who obviously is talented, but dealt yeah, with injuries, talented. right? Um, you got Shoemaker, yeah. you got Brenton Strange. Them two should get to day, there. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the second round. Then you get to day yeah. three. Okay, Tucker Craft, obviously, talented player. Yeah. Uh, and then and then we got Darnell Washington, of course. That's an offensive tackle, so we, mm -hmm. we understand. Uh, and then Cameron Latu on, on, in the third round. Like, like teams draft tight ends, bro. And and I'm just curious, where do you have the likes of a Shoemaker and a Brenton Strange compared to this year? Maybe the top isn't as heavy, right? Yeah. But, but the full breadth of this draft class, I, I like it top to bottom. I really do. Jaheim Bell, Drew. Yeah, man. Um, I need y'all to look up the word vertical, okay? Because <laughs> that's Jaheim Bell, bro. Just vertical, bro. I, I don't know if the man can run a horizontal route. Uh, I'm not sure that's... You can run a drag? You can set him on a drag? Okay. <laughs> uh, a little drag. No, nah, I mean, I, I know you know you you, you talked about you, your boy here. What, what's a tip, tip Raymond? I, I know you talked about him in terms of being a blocker, and I think it's the complete opposite when you talk about Jaheim Bell and being being a a a catching tight end, if you will. I'm, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get real simple here. A catching tight end in terms of <laughs> his ability to go out, uh, run routes. Uh, I think he I think he's very limited in terms of the route tree that you're going to ask him to run. But what you will ask him to uh, run is vertical and he's going to do that very well. Um, I think he's got some juice to him. Uh, I think that um, he'll go up and get the football. I think he has good hands. Um, nice, big, uh, was it, lean frame that he's got going on there. Um, I know that, you know, he's at he's over there at FSU and the boys had had weapons all over the place. So, you know, he didn't necessarily get the the requisite. Um, touches that I think he probably thought he was going to get going there. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think he probably made the best move for himself, you know, uh, going away from, although I don't know if he would have stayed at South Carolina, nah, he probably would have got some, nah, he probably I, got I some think it would have been nah. better. I think it would have been would, better for him if he stayed at South Carolina. South honestly. Carolina. Yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it with, with everything they had going on there. Spencer, mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there was a lot of mouths to feed at FSU. There were just more yeah. mouths. Yeah, you know what it was though? He, he wanted more prime time games. Big football yeah, yeah. games. Yeah. 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 The exposure. No, no, I, yeah. I understand. You want to be exposed. I guess it worked out for him to be here, right? <laughs> did. We, we're talking about him, right? And 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 I think he had a, a decent week at the Senior Bowl again. I think he's one of the the guys that started off slow and then kind of kind of took off um, a little bit. But um, I, yeah, I got him at tight end twelve because he to me he's very limited, right? I, I don't think he's that inline guy that you want. Um, so that, that's kind of why I got him at tight end twelve. Yeah, and impressive he, athlete. You, you got to have yeah. a plan for him. You know, we talked about certain receivers that that may not necessarily be the most polished from a route running perspective. You can you can say that about Jaheim Bell as far as him not necessarily being a guy that you want playing in line on a consistent basis. But it, it's how you deploy these players because he's talented, right? Mm -hmm. he, he has an, an innate ability with the football in his hands. And as you mentioned, Drew, very effective down the seam. So, um. I, I I put it on coaching to figure it out. When when you have these tweeners, I put it on coaching. You know, how, how are you going to get him involved? How are you going to utilize that skill set? That to me is where the coaches make their money. We move on to the eleventh ranked tight end here in your rankings. And Hadley, you have Jaheim Bell, Andrew, you have Eric All out of Iowa. Let's start with Bell. Let's finish the conversation there, Hadley. Yeah, Jaheim Bell, uh, the transfer from South Carolina, uh, came to FSU. I thought y'all was going to give me a hard time when I said big more primetime games, man, because of my fandom, but y'all let me slide on that. Um, but he's a, he's a good athlete uh, for the tight end position. Um, like Drew said, he's a very linear tight end. 
He can attack the seams very well or those those wheel routes. Um, anything vertical, he does really well. Uh, like I said, wanted to get him going vertically. Uh, I think he's one of those uh, Janu Smith type tight ends that could potentially get carries out of the backfield as well. Um, and uh, he's a physical John, runner. Janu Janu gets after it in line though. Yeah, he, in he line gets he after does. it more. But, yeah, you, you know, you know what about uh, Jaheim? I like to say he might mm. not be the best in line tight end, but as an H back and a fullback. There you go. There he he does really well blocking there. there. He go. does better there yep. than actually in line at tight end. Yep. Uh, we saw it in the LSU game. It kind of changed mm -hmm. uh, the landscape of that game. Went in the second half, they put him more as a fullback. Mm -hmm. uh, so he did well there. He's a physical runner with speed as a ball carrier. Hard to bring down in the open field. Uh, he's like a versatile chess piece. They can line him up all over the formation. You see him line up out wide, like I say, in the backfield, uh, in the slot. So you can move him around. He's like a versatile chess piece. He's not a natural catcher. He dealt with some drops in his college career and like you said it's going to take a, a offensive uh, coordinator to get him in a, in a good scheme because he's not one of those every down tight ends i don't see him as that at the next level i see him as, as a scheme guy that can come in and, and, and do a lot of different things on, on your on your football team so yeah i, I like jaheem bell so we'll see where he plays at the next level i think he can play all over the football field uh very athletic so you know he has a lot of upside and and i want to say in the senior bowl he did separate uh, from Cam Kitchens uh, out there running rocks. <laughs> in that, in that ridiculous on. drill, bro. In that ridiculous drill, right? Yeah. Across oh, the middle of the field, Jay. All the safety in the middle of the field. Bro. Oh, oh my field. goodness. <laughs> um, Jaheim go. Bell is, is a poor man's Jatavian Sanders. I'm going to say it, bro. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. All right. um, Eric, Eric All. Uh, I, I think he has the potential to be top three tight end in this class mm. because I don't think there's anything he can't do at the position. We talk about the tight end in terms of, you know, when you say tight end, what kind of tight end is he, right? Is he, is he the Y? Is he, is he the in line? Is he a Y? Is he the, the in line? Is he the, 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 the big slot? Is he the halfback? Is he the fullback? Is he, is he, what, what kind of tight end is he? Cause there's probably six, seven versions of, of a tight end position in terms of how, how you deploy them. Right. I think he can do any of it, bro. The, the problem is, that man can't stay healthy to save his life. And tight end is not a position that you can afford to be injured, bro. Cause the, the, the nature of that position is, is you're playing two positions in one. Yeah. This is right? the learning so you got to be on the football field, bro. Yeah. 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 And, 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 it, and it's the injuries aren't like, Oh, my ankle, I'm out for a game. Like these are season ending injuries that have just plagued his career consistently, man. And it's, it's, it, it just kind of hurts him. But, but, you know, what I saw in tapes in, in terms of him blocking, um, I think he's 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 strong at the point of attack. I think he he has nice good uh, grip strength, and, and you know you don't get that a lot from a, from tight ends um, for the most part. Um, I think he he can create enough separation going against linebackers, safeties. Got in a big enough body to kind of shield off defenders from the pass, um, and and I think you can line him up kind of anywhere that you want to try to free him up to to get open for a pass. Um, but again, it's, it's, it comes down to the injuries, man. So I, I, I wanted to put him at 12, but you know, I had an opportunity to put state at 12. So I did that. Um, so I got Eric all here at 11 right here, man. You know. I like it. All right. Let's go to the top 10. I, as you guys get into the top 10 here, Brevin Spanford, Kate Stover, uh, respectively, uh, let's, let's address fearfully confidence questions here. Blocking tight end. And that's Tip Raymond, right? That's Tip Raymond all day. To me, I think uh, if you want to talk about a tight end that uh, could do a little more blocking but could also block, I like Theo Johnson's blocking ability as well. But I think Tip Raymond is the best uh, blocking tight end in the class. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. And should Johnny Wilson become a tight end due to his size? Depends. Uh, I think it it depends on how teams see him, really. I think there's teams that do see him as a tight end. I think there's teams that see him as a receiver. And maybe I think he's a big slot. I think he's a big slot at the end of the day. Oh, so if you want to call him right? a time, yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, like, yeah. You can block against DBs, block. but I, not inside yeah. in, in that trash, in the trenches, I, I don't think. The, the linebackers that. and the D linemen, yeah, that ain't it. I don't think it. you want that. Okay. But, right. so, but he's going to be a big slot. So that's like a tight end anyway. So he's one of those. You, you talk about positionless football where, you know, you, you're lined up there. You could be a big tight end, I mean, a big slide or a tight end. It's the same thing. I think that's the way he's going to live at the next level. Uh, I agree with right. DK. I think Devin Culp is being slept on. I think uh, 
I wanted to put him in. He's probably in my top uh, 12, man. I'll probably update that. But I think he just didn't get as much opportunities in Washington to, to catch the football. So um, but I do like over, him. Bro. It was giving that, giving them looks to Westover over there. Um, although he was kind of working from the fullback position. So, um, yeah. What um, tight ends got mentioned so far? Um, who we talked about? We talked about Tip talked Raymond about, and uh, Jaheim Bell. Jaheim Bell, yeah, and um, and Eric All. Miles. Eric All. He's, Miles. I, think he, I think he started at Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, and then went over there to um. He's got the kit, bro. You on the FSU Kool Aid right there, bro? Yeah, Bell he is. On that, he's on that, come on, bro. DK, you gotta explain yourself, bro. That's crazy talk, man. That's crazy talk. Um, all right, man. Tight end, tight end 10, bro. You got uh you got the blocker. That's that's another good blocker right there. And Devin yeah. Ford span the law firm. And then I got Cade Stover uh, from Ohio State. And I've been watching Cade Stover for a little bit. Um, you know, for the past what three? I think he's been there three years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Kate Stover was used in a myriad of ways. Again, we talk about the versatility of the tight end, played a little halfback, played a little inline, played a little slot. Um, he's a physical guy um, who will mix it up with the DBs and the safeties and the linebackers when it comes to it in terms of, of getting into his route, um, bodying those guys. Um, I think he's he's uh, damn good over over the middle of the field that the, the seam routes. Um, he works those very well, gets his head around real quick. Um, I think he has strong hands. Uh, and I think he has a little little ability after the catch, man. So he's not an easy guy to bring down to the ground. Although most tight ends aren't, um, I think he has has some run um, some run after catch ability. Um, and he's he's you know, let's call him an average blocker, man. You're not asking this dude to 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 maul guys over or, or or open up holes. You just want him to more more or less seal guys off. And I think he does that that pretty well. Yeah, we got uh, Brevin Spanford uh, from Minnesota. I think it was a six-year senior uh, last season, so a lot of experience. I think he has a good blend of blocking and receiving threat. I think he's a, a really good balanced tight end because the tight end position, sometimes you got those uh, pass-catching tight ends that don't yeah. want to block, and then you got the blocking yeah. tight ends that can't really uh, catch one stream, passes. Extreme or the other. Yeah, yeah but I think Spanford has a, a nice balanced blend of both. Um, I do think his blocking technique can improve because he's so tall. He's uh, 6'6", yeah. uh, 260, so he's a little bit high. Need a, uh bend his knees a little better, uh, but he's very willing and able to block. Like you say, he's a good blocker, um, even though he's a little bit high. Um, he's, he will punish smaller defenders in the run game. Uh, he came from Minnesota, too, so Minnesota likes to get downhill and, and run the football, so he helps yeah. uh, that Minnesota run game as well. Uh, I think he could, they line him up all over the football field, but he's more mm -hmm. comfortable in line as, as that wide tight end. Uh, got that wingspan. You know, you see it when he tracks the football, he goes up high, snacks it out of the air. Uh, he can stretch the field vertically, and uh, I think he has plus ball tracking ability. And he can gain yak uh, using his speed, but he's not really one of those make-you-miss guys. Uh, there might only be one tight end in this class that, that, that can make you miss in the open field, and, and that's tight end one, Brock Bowers. Um, but he's an athletic big man, 6'6", 260. Uh, can get up off the ground with run blocking chops, can do a better job sitting down in zone and reading that, that soft spot in zone in his route running. Mm -hmm. uh, I think once that route running improves for span forward, um, he could be a better separator, man. Cause I think he struggles at separating, so you got to improve that route running. But uh, really good balance right here in the run game and the pass game. All right, man. Uh, next up, we got tight end nine. We got you got Kate Stover, and then yeah, I yeah. got you good. And Not seeing we finish got... that Kate Stover. That's uh Tanner McLaughlin. That's who that is. McLaughlin. I think that's how you say it. I know y'all y'all hit us with the phonetics because I was I'm gonna kill the name. Uh, but uh, if you if you wanna if you wanna wrap yeah, I'll finish about the case over because you spoke about yeah. him recently. Um, I think he's a willing blocker who can move. Uh, he gets in a, a great optimal position. Uh, in the run game, he's one of those move blockers. He's not really a, a mauler. Uh, but he gives that effort through the whistle, man. And and Drew talked about it. How all those tight ends that went in, in day two of the draft. I think K. Stover might be a sleeper. Uh, to go in day two because he does a lot of things well. Uh, I don't think he has like one great trait, but uh, he's just play, uh, all over the board. He does a lot of things well, uh, not getting much separation in the pass game, uh, but he has that run after catch ability. You know, he was a former running back in high school, uh, so he could break tackles. He finishes runs. So once the ball is in his hands, um, you know, he's excellent uh, after the catch. I think he even played some linebacker for uh, Kate, uh, Ohio State in, in the championship yeah, game, in the Rose Bowl game against yeah. – uh, what team was that against, man? It was against – 
Well, I know it's the Rose Bowl game, but he, he so he's very versatile, man. You play in linebacker, you play running back in high school. Uh, so he has that ability to catch and, and run after the catch. Uh, the Penn State game, I saw a great catch when he went up vertically up the seam, caught a ball in traffic, top of the defender's head. Uh, he showcased very good concentration ability to make those tough contested catches. I think he has really natural hands. So kind of what I was speaking about with Stover, where he has a lot of things that an NFL team would like at the next level, good hands, good run after the catch ability. Hands and traffic is really good. Uh, he does whatever it takes. So I think he's a he's going to be a, a coach favorite, man. I think that's uh, how I describe uh, Kate Stover. But he's going to be older, though. He's going to be an older prospect. I think he's 24 years old, and he lacks the big-time athleticism. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, that I spoke about it, that, that 24 age, he might not be day two because he's an older prospect. But, you know, he does a lot of things well for a football team. Yeah, tenor, tenor. I'm gonna call him a McClack, McClack, McClatchin. That's what I'm gonna say. McClacklin. McClacklin. All right, tenor McClacklin. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when given the opportunity, gets down the field quick, fast, and in a hurry. Gets uh, gets head around quickly. Uh, clears defenders in coverage, man or zone. Uh, I think he's really good at finding the holes in the zone, sitting down. Uh, I think he has strong hand, str strong hands, and he catches with his hands. You know, a lot of guys like the body catch, but he catches with his hands. Um, I got here. Uh, let me see. Yeah. A anything with power in terms of the blocking game. Um, thought he could handle, but any, let me see here. Let me write. Let's see. Blah, 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 blah. All right. I got it here. All right. So anything with power in the blocking game, I thought he struggled um, with, I was watching him go, go, uh, go against Washington and it didn't really matter who the defender was. If, if they had any type of power to their game, uh, Braylon Trice, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, t both of the linebackers for Washington were kind of coming off of the edge and, and it was, it, it's, I don't know, man, it didn't, it, it didn't matter if it was, it was the power came later in, in the, in the, in the play, or if it came early in the play, he, he struggled with that. Um, you know, or if the guy had heavy hands, right. If, if it was a finesse guy trying to get cute, trying to turn the corner on him, something like that, he was able to kind of shut that down, get his hands up. Um, and use his power versus, versus that guy. But if, a, if, another, if the opposite guy he was going against had power, um, I think he struggled um, there. So I think he, to me, he's more of, of a uh, pass catching tight end than he more of a blocker. Um, I think he's, he's high effort guy though. Um, so I, I give him a, I give him a, uh, I give him a shot in, in the running game. Um, got to, you know, if, if he's struggling with power, that's, you know, two things, one, either got to get stronger or two, um, you know, there might be some, some hand position in, um, getting his hands in there first before they can get their hands on him. So, um, yeah. Right. Oh, McLaughlin. Yeah. You, yeah, let me you talk about him, man. There, and then I got Jared Wiley. Go ahead. Jared Wiley. Oh, close him out. He got Wiley a little too low, but yeah, McLaughlin. Okay. Um, yeah, you know that power. You you see it when you see him face Braylon Trice. He just uh would put that power game on clock and he couldn't really handle it, but. I do think he gets after it in the run game, um, especially on the move. You know, like I said, uh, for mm -hmm. previous guys, you got tight ends like a lot of inline, mano a mano, line up across them and, and get after it. I think McLaughlin's more of a guy that kind of wants to get in space uh, to do his blocking. So I think he locate really well, especially on those backside cutoffs. I think he does that really well. Uh, you know, I seen, I did see some good reps against Brennan Triso uh, when he held his own in a couple uh, uh, pass blocking reps, but you know, Trice got, uh, Trice got under him with that power, man. So power, I think he might need to get a little stronger. Um, but as a pass catcher, he works well up the seams. Uh, I think he has very strong hands. I think he has athleticism after the catch. Uh, he kind of shows his numbers to, to the quarterback, man. That's a quarterback best friend is a, a tight end that can show him his numbers early, uh, get open quickly. I think McLaughlin could do that. I think he's a very good outlet option in the passing game. And then after the catch, man, I think he has some juice and fluidity. Um, you know, he can't be thrown off his routes against strong, aggressive defenders. So that's more to that, that strength and that power that I think he needs to develop at the next level. Uh, I got here. He remind me of a uh, Luke Musgrave type tight end. Uh, I think mm. he's very competitive as a blocker, even with his strength deficiencies. I think he's very competitive. So he got the heart to do it. Uh, so something he can do is just get stronger. Uh, you know, that weight program at the next level. So he can hold up there. And also, I think he can improve as a route runner. You know, he's okay. But if he wants to take his game to the next level, rod running and strength uh, will be two things he needs to work on. 
All right. For uh, Jared Wiley out of TCU, I got a uh, got here a big wide receiver playing tight end, moves well in and out of his breaks, tracks uh, the ball well uh, down the football field. Uh, he, he's the type of guy who can turn poorly thrown balls into catches, uh, shields off defenders um, uh, when making uh, make, making himself an easier target uh, for, for the, the quarterback to kind of squeeze it in, the, in that window if it, if it is a, a tight window. Um, uses his size well, um, and he will get physical um, with the defender. Defender wants to get physical. He'll use his body. Um, you saw it at the Senior Bowl in terms of guys wanted to get physical with him. He got physical back um, and used that that physicality against the defender to, to create the separation. Um, you saw that routinely from him, especially in the one-on-ones. Um, where, where he, you know, kind of lacks, and I talked about him, you know, being a receiver playing tight end, is, is that he lacks it in the um, – in the, in the, the blocking game in the run game in terms of blocking that's not his cup of tea um so if you're asking if, if you're drafting him you're not drafting him to, to block right is it something that he can improve on sure but i don't know that he'll ever have the chops to do it consistently um you might want to set him up to seal guys off um or if he's on the move um that may be better for him but if you're telling him to straight up just block the guy in front of him i, I think you're you're asking too much of him depending on who that um defender is i think you might be asking too much from him so all right, moving to tight end seven. And we got this uh, Holker. Uh, Dallin US seven. Holker. You said, you said what? You said Dylan? Dallin Holker. Dallin, Dallin Holker. Okay, yeah. I was about to say. Um, and then I got AJ uh, Barner uh, from Michigan. I, I think you, you high on uh, Barner or you moved him out? Uh, I, I like him. I think he has a okay. lot of uh, upside at the next level. Um, you know, Michigan, they had that beast tight end or uh, Loveland over there. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. guy. But I think uh, A.J. Barner got a pretty good skill set to be one of those day two tight end that, that sneaks in there. Yeah, I got him here. Um, thought he was uh, a good mover for his size. Uh, caught a few, few of those seam layered passes that came from J.J. McCarthy that we saw a lot. Um, you know, and and obviously he was he was asked to block a ton because that's you know just 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 the nature of that offense. And I don't know that he's necessarily a guy that you want to he can line up and straight just move people out the way. A lot of the blocks that I saw that came from him were you know kind of crash down side blocks, trying to trying to give him the advantage. So I wonder if that speaks to his ability to just straight up just block people in front of him, moving a guy out from directly over him and moving him out versus moving him into the line of scrimmage. Um, you know, and moving from from player to player, I, I just I'm not sure in terms of his strength or his ability to, to do that on a consistent basis. Um, and then in terms of his route running, um, I think he creates a, a little bit of separation. I think, he, I think he's got some subtle moves um, to do that. You just didn't see it a whole lot. All right. I got Dallin Holker from Colorado State. Uh, he burst on the scene in, the, in that Colorado game, man. Uh, you know, I guess I'll go prime that prime time game. Everybody watching. I was like, who, who is this number five guy, man? Because I think he's a sleeper in his class, especially as a, a pass catching tight end. I think that's his uh, superpower is catching the football. Uh, you know, he moves well. He's a loose route runner. Um, as far as blocking, I think that can improve. Uh, I think he just lets too many guys beat him as a blocker, especially in space. You know, breaking down, uh, locating, I think he struggles a little bit as a blocker. Um, but, you know, I did have more consistent hands. But when he went up and got it and tracked the football, he made some wild catches. Uh, they light him up outside. They throw him a screen pass. So that shows uh, his ability after the catch. He can break tackles. He kind of weaves through defenders. And uh, vision, you know, open field vision as a tight end, man, that, that creativity. Uh, not a lot of tight ends have that. A lot of tight ends are more straight line. But, you know, Dallin Hoker has the ability to, to be creative uh, running after the catch. Uh, big, uh, big time receiver skill set, like I said, uh, uh, with underrated feet to get open. Because when he runs, he doesn't look like he's, he's moving too fast. He looks a little bigger, even though he's 6'3", 241. But that feet to get open, man, I, I liked it a lot. Uh, like I said, the tracking ability deep down the field. He looks like a wide receiver at times tracking the football. Um, and he has that concentration to make those over-the-shoulder catches in traffic. Um, I got here, make tough catches. You see the time after time in film, uh, catches that you, you wouldn't expect him to make, he'll go up and get it. So really like that. Uh, I think he can really move and uh, can really move once he opens up and gets into space. He kind of has that build-up speed, you know, not 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 plus acceleration, but once that speed gets going, he can really get to the end zone. Uh, he's a he's a sleeper, man. He's a BYU transfer. He's coming over from BYU, and uh, I, I was uh, curious to see the athletic testing 
for this guy because he doesn't look like he has big time athleticism. Um, but he tests pretty well. 478 speed, 166 in a 10 yard split, uh, the 6.83 cone drill. So he tested uh, really well, man. I think he's going to be a pass catching sleeper at the next level. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I like I like him a lot, man. Um, all right, next up, there you go, there you go, your boy AJ Barner, six. tight end six for you. And you got tip at, at six. Yeah, I got tip at six, bro. You like tip? Yeah, yeah bro. <laughs> tip, 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 tip. Listen, um, I think tip, tip serious, bro. Uh, and I know, I know you you talked about him in terms of his blocking ability, and you know, I got I got really good at uh, using defender speed against them when blocking. Uh, consistently wash folks out of the play. Really good at positioning himself. Uh, let me see. I can't see. Uh, really good at positioning himself on the block um, and setting folks up. Can block at any manner defender. Big, small, fast, strong. Uh, even works well uh, in space, in the slot, while moving at the snap. You know, um, I, I think he's <laughs> – this is a Madden term. Uh, he's the blue route king, bro, because he blocks so well, Right that he can go out on that delayed route, you know, whatever it is, and, and you know, sort of leak it out safety valve or, or whatever it is and, and be wide open. Um, uh, he's not necessarily an, an attacker in terms of a blocker. He's more calculated, right? So he's kind of sizing guys up before he goes out and he, he gets his guy, right? Uh, he can play a little high at times at the point of attack. Um, it didn't it didn't phase him a lot, but I think in the league that's going to catch up to him. So, you know, I know he's what – I know he's 6'5". I'm not mistaken, six five and some change, but you know he's he's got to be able to. Actually, I think he's taller than that. I think he might be six six. Um, let me see. No, I got six five two seventy. Um, and you he's know his boy. athletic profile is actually pretty high, bro. And 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 um, you know six five two seventy, and, and he moves well. Um, I, I think I, I really really think he is. He has the potential to be something. Special, bro. The problem is that Illinois is, wasn't throwing the football, bro. You know, he was used for what what he's good at, and I think I, I think he has good hands, bro. And I think he can he create separation uh, pretty well. It's just that he just didn't really get the opportunity there. You know, sometimes you get stuck at a role, and it is what it is. Is he is he your this year's uh, Davis Allen from Clemson? I know, I know you liked Allen a lot. Oh Last yeah, season yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, that's my Davis Allen. Yeah, you got it, yeah. you got it. Except yeah. he gonna get more PT, man. He gonna get more run. I think when he hit when he gets in the league, though. Yeah, man. I I got AJ Barner, uh, tight end six. Uh, you know, I really like what I saw on film from Barner. You know, even though he didn't get much opportunities in that Michigan passing game, uh, like I said earlier, I think he has pass catching upside because he's very springy. Uh, from the snap, he could get open really quickly for his quarterback. And um, you know, when he transferred to Michigan, he, he wasn't really known as a run blocker. But you know, played in that Michigan offense, you got to be able to block. And you know, he, I thought he improved his run blocking every year uh, in college. Uh, he gets after it. Uh, has really good leg drive. Um, you see him line them up outside, and he just manhandled cornerbacks in the run game. They split them out and say, "Hey, block this uh, corner." So. You know, if you're on one of those run-heavy teams, uh, you can split them out. You can handle corners really well. Um, he was an extension of the outstanding Michigan offensive line. Uh, he positions himself really well on those seal-off blocks to open up holes. He could get to the second level and locate, get attached to defenders. And, and that's what kind of makes those those five-yard runs 20-plus yards, man. It, it's a blocking down the field for your tight ends and your wide receivers. Uh, so I think A.J. Barnum does that well. Uh, he can make tough catches in traffic. Uh, we see we seen that from JJ McCarthy throwing him those balls in traffic, um, and like I said, he wasn't a big time pass catcher, but uh, I think he has pass uh, catching upside if given the opportunity and that work ethic. Man, he, he's trying to get better every day, which he's done through his college career. And I think once he gets to the next level, um, you know, he's just going to get better and better. Man, and I think he could be one of those tight ends that can help a football team out. Theo Johnson, Dynasty. Yeah, I, I like Theo, man. What he did at the senior, but we're going to talk about Theo in a little bit, man. We're going to talk about him. Oh, you're on mute, Drew. CPG on mute. My bad. I'm just talking to myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, for, for Theo Johnson, I got a name. I got a name, and I, and I pulled up some some sparky numbers. and It matches. And, um, Theo, Theo was actually better at mm. most of the numbers. The Penn State, guy. bro, they, they always got them athletes, yeah. bro, recently. They do. Every they position. Do. You're right. All right, man, tight end five, you got Jared Wiley, and I got Hooker. 
Uh, is it Dalen? Dalen Holker, as you as you call it. Um, for the notes I got quickly, gets hit, gets into his route. No nonsense. Strong hands who tracks the ball. As good as any wide receiver. Uh, not as easy a guy to bring to the ground, especially if he gets going. Um, runs to the open field, the green grass. Uh, I think he has some open field prowess. It's not anything crazy like a running back or some of these, um, some of these receivers, but he just seems to be able to avoid um, defenders and be able to to get more green grass than maybe he he should. Um, I think he can run through defenders at times and or run by defenders. Uh, he catches all hands. Um, Heli spoke in terms of his ability to to block. Um, that's kind of where his warts are. But I think he's so good as a pass catcher um, that I think that you you can just say, "Hey, I, I'm good with it." I, I think I think Jared Wiley's kind of the same thing. They're so good as pass catchers that you're just like, I, "I'll I'll you know I'm not using him in that role and I'm okay with it." Juice talked about in terms of um, how tight ends are used um, this day and age. You need all different kinds, all different versions, all different kinds. And I think these two. Um, are you know that that pass catching variety? Yeah, man. You get in there, Juice man. You back? Oh, you're on mute. Hey, you come back on mute, bro. Hey, man. Strike one. Good, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back, man. Um, so uh, Drew, you just detailed uh, Dylan Hooker out of Colorado State. You know, move tight end, right? That that's his. That's his calling card um excellent hands very impressive in the passing game passing league right so there's a role for him it might slow belay his ability to get on the field because he doesn't do it all but again you want to see that guy land somewhere where he's going to be leveraged you know his skills are going to be utilized in in a meaningful way right i I think he could be a difference maker because of that that size and his ability in the passing game uh heather your thoughts on the jared wiley out of tcu yeah, Jerry Wiley. Uh, I think he has very soft hands, uh, very natural catching the football. Uh, you know, they'll line him up at TCU all over the formation. Uh, I think he's more of a, a move tight end. He plays some H back as well. Um, but blocking, I think what's got to improve with him is uh, blocking. He gets uh, he gets his hands on defenders and try to kind of push them out of the way. He's a little finesse with his blocking. I kind of want to see more dog out of him, uh, you know, play through the whistle. Uh, but at the next level, I don't think he's going to be asked to block very much. Uh, you know, even though I think his route running can improve as well. But once he catches the football, uh, I like the way he navigates after the catch uh, to make defenders miss. Um, and I think he has a really good understanding in zone, like how to sit in the zone, uh, make himself available for his quarterback. Um, so I think his best attributes will be his hands and after the catch and then the blocking intensity. I think that's where he needs to work on at the next level. Oh, mute again. Strike I'm two. All, I'm all I'm all out of sorts here. <laughs> all O2. out of sorts here. Man. O2 count. All right, we got to clean it up. Uh, not unlike Holker, right? As far as there, there needing to be some significant strides made in terms of run blocking. Um, I, I, it may not necessarily be as pronounced with Wiley as compared to Holker, but that that again could be one of the reasons why they don't get that run out of the gate. You understand what I'm saying? They may not necessarily get as much playing time out of the gate, but two very intriguing prospects here. We move on to your fourth ranked tight end, um, and you guys are synced up here. I think you're actually synced up throughout the remaining of these rankings. Ben Sennett out of Kansas State. We'll start with you, Headley. Ben Sennett, uh, Kansas State. I uh, saw him over there at the Senior Bowl. Uh, I was expecting to see a lot more from him, to be honest, at the Senior Bowl. I, think, I thought Theo Johnson outshined him. Um, but when you go back to the tape, man, he's a, a very good prospect. Uh, I think he's more of a receiving tight end. He'll get after in, in, a, in a blocking game as well, um, especially locating blocks, move like a move tight end, moving in space and blocking. Uh, but I think uh, as an inline tight end, I thought he ended up on the ground a little bit too much. Uh, so I think it's more leverage with Benson. I think that's an easy fix at the next level. But uh, he can get open quickly. He has really good bursts off the line of scrimmage. Uh, change of direction ability uh, after the catch or even before the catch uh, as a route runner to separate. Uh, and then once he catches the ball, he's very hard to bring down. He runs with a lot of power through tackles. Um, you know, his speed kind of sneaks up on you. you. You don't think he's that fast, but, you know, he runs by guys, uh, you know, on tape pretty much. And he has the ability to extend his arms above his head and snatch the, snatch the football in traffic. You know, that shows his concentration ability, his strong hands. Um you know, I, I I did see a DB come up and kind of press him, throw him off the spot a little bit, and I think it's I think it's more leverage with Benson, not man. Um, but 
You know, he'll put his body on the line on those wham blocks. You know, if you want to run power, you get those wham blocks inside. Um, and like I said, I think he's better as a move blocker, uh, as, but he tends to dip his head a little bit, which limits him. Um, even at, at the route running, man, I think it limits him as a, a, a route runner because of uh, how he kind of a high running style. You know, we we're going to talk about another tight end that has that that high uh, route running also. But um, just, just having better leverage, I think that will, like, once you fix that with best and not, he, he could be a problem at the next level. Get that pad level under control. Drew, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, problem uh, problem is is correct, bro. He's going to be a problem at the next level because Coach is looking at that and saying, we're going to fix that uh, immediately and quickly so he can be effective, man. I said it last week because I think um, DP was talking about it um, in terms of um, his ability after he made the catch, how he spoke about it. Uh, but my man play hockey, bro. So you're on them skates. So, you know, if you, if you think you're going to take them down with an arm tackle or, you know, some, some guys like to throw their body at a, at a guy, um, he's going to walk right through all that um, guy who can run past you as well. Um, I, th- I thought he was actually a, a, a good blocker. Um, I know he was using in a, a very uh, using in a couple of different ways in terms of, of blocking, whether it be halfback, fullback, in line from the slot position, all the positions uh, of the tight end. Um, and I thought he fared um, pretty well. He is a guy who gets his head around very quickly. That's something I look for immediately from. Um, tight ends is is when they're running that route. Do they get the head around? Because usually they, they're you know it could be the safety valve for the quarterback, right, or the hot route, depending on what what the defense is trying to do. So um, I thought he gets his head around, does attack the football in the air. Um, but I, th- I think he's definitely going to be a problem um, once he fixes the leverage issues. Um, that that's going to turn him around. I think he's going to surprise a lot of folks. Um, you know, they're going to have to go back to draft uh, draft coverage on him and be like, damn, I miss I missed on this guy. I didn't I didn't know he was this good and Obviously, because he's playing for for um, for Kansas State, you know, and getting too much love out there. He, he's getting he's got a bit of a hive, though. I, I will say that in, in the draft, he, he certainly has has a hive there. What's going on? I love weed. Shout out. Get home safely. Uh, tight end number three in your rankings here, Drew Theo Johnson. You, you and Heather are synced up here as well. Yeah, this, this uh, is what the, I was the, talking the, about. The guy out of Penn State here that that really turned heads. Um, not, not, I mean, obviously he tested very well, but, but you, you, you like what you saw at the senior bowl, didn't necessarily get a ton of opportunity at Penn state in terms of being a difference mm-hmm. maker in the passing game, but, but really demonstrated what he was capable of in mobile. Yeah. I got here in my notes, man. He reminds me of what a tight end was and what a tight end is now moves very well, super athletic, strong hands, big target after the catch will lower the pads and run your ass over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moves a lot like Kellen Winslow. I pulled up oh, the numbers, wow. bro. Wow. And, and listen, I hate to say that name because, you know, he just did some egregious, heinous sure. stuff. Sure. But sure. in terms of the we'll keep player, it on the field. We'll keep it on the yes, field. Yeah. He reminds yeah. me the movement, the, just just his, his mentality. It reminds me of him a lot. No fear in his game, willing to go over the middle, make the tough catches. Um, oh, what I got here? Is it I got here because oh because of his ability to be physical um can line up anywhere including and not limited to fullback halfback um he's an athletic smooth operator three four cups of phys- physicality I got here man I believe he gives you the best both best of both worlds I'm um, at the tight end position just to clarify Winslow Jr. we, we don't want to yeah we I'm don't want to yeah, disrespect senior senior's yeah, a hall of famer we don't want to we don't want to disrespect yes. senior my bad Hallie what do you have on Theo Johnson. The you it, it's, it's the senior bowl. It was a senior bowl standout. You know, I, I didn't know much about him because, like you said, he wasn't used that often at Penn State in, in the passing game. And he went to the senior bowl and showed that, you know, he was the best tight end out there. And I like the ability at the senior bowl to be physical at the top of his routes. And next level, you might want to watch out for offensive passing affairs because he's kind of throwing uh, defenders off of him uh, at the stems and, and separating that way. Um, but he went to the combine and ran a four or five. You know, these Penn State guys, these athletic numbers, just incredible year after year. And he's another one of those guys that, uh, you know, Kellen Winslow, I, I, I don't know if I'll go that far, Drew, uh, um, because when you watch the tape, you know, I didn't see that 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 uh, pass catching upside that I saw at the senior bowl. So it's kind of a hard evaluation for me a little bit because the senior bowl showed me one thing and then the tape showed me a different thing. Um, you know, he didn't look as fluid on tape. Uh, he wasn't used that often, but when he was used, I thought, you know, he the fluidity wasn't consistent as a route runner. 
I thought he was just very physical as a route runner. Um, but he gets out there as a blocker. And, and that's something, you know, that I saw on tape, man, as a, as a run blocker, pass blocker, uh, whether it's in a move or in the backfield or lined up uh, in that prototypical wide position. I thought he did really good. He blocked through the whistle, and he, he relishes that, man. He relishes that that big hit. He got that nasty at that, that tight end position. Um, and he runs hard after the catch and has good hands. So really good hands, runs great after the catch. I think route running can improve a little bit, even though he's physical at the top of his routes, and he could get out there as a run blocker. So I think his starting caliber tight end at the next level. I, I, I just wouldn't put him as an upper echelon uh, starting caliber tight end. Yeah, a lot to like, but as you mentioned, needs some polish there in his in his route running. Uh, we move on. Let's keep it moving here. Uh, our final two tight ends, Hadley mentioned it at the very beginning of our tight end rankings, who we have at number one. At number two is Jatavian Sanders out of Texas. D-Kit said, you know, he, he'll take Jaheim Bell over Jatavian Sanders. Explain to D-Kit why he's wrong here. Go ahead, Hadley. Well, man, what he does as a pass catcher, uh, he's a, a lot better pass catcher than a Jaheim Bell. Um, you know, the blocking, yeah, he, he needs to work on that. He's a little high in his movements. Uh, so just having that 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 pad level, uh, we t- we spoke about it with, with other tight ends in this class, man. That that pad level needs to, you know, got to play with a little bit better leverage, especially as a, a route runner, being able to separate because the leverage issues could affect you as a blocker and could f- affect you as a route runner. So I, I need him to fix that a little bit. Um, but he's one of those big body inline tight ends. He has a size. Uh, he run up the seams. He's probably one of the best uh, seam route tight ends in the class. Uh, you just throw it to him. He's a big body. Once he catches the football, he's physical after the catch. Uh, has some speed after the catch as well. Um, I say it here. He has athleticism to get out in the route and make tough catches through contact. Uh, his ability to go up and get the ball at the highest point. Um, you know, just just getting the ball at the highest point. We spoke about that with uh, Brevin Span Ford as well. Are earlier, so he does that really well. And he's not a big time separator or route runner, but he can move vertically for his size. Uh, great hands in traffic, got the juice after the catch. And I think he's a, I think he's decent as a, as a move blocker. I think he can decipher and locate at the second level. It's just that that pad level has to come down if he wants to be a better in line tight end. All right. Yeah, you, 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 you ask yourself, why, why did Texas not, you know, because like like Haley said, it's, it's it's a leverage thing in terms of his his blocking, but uh, he, he's willing to do it and he's willing to do it consistently. And he did it from all manner of the field, bro. It was the wing back, it was full back, it was half back, it was tight end, it was slot. Like he did it all over the place. Um, he's asked to block a lot on screens. Um, and, and he is a big body. Um, you know, and 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 he gets down the field. That this the seam is. Is where he kills. He made he made his living a lot to go up and get the football. He is a big target, so it made it easier for Irvers to get the ball out to him. Um, he makes himself available. Um, gets his head around. You know, like I said, that's a big thing for me. He gets his head around um, quickly and often. Um, and and he he can do the blue route thing. I don't know if you heard me earlier talking about blue route, but he can do the blue route thing in terms of of acting like he's blocking or, or do a little delayed block and get him the football. And he's got juice, bro. Juice is loose. Um, and, and he just gives you more. If you want to compare him to Jaheim Bell, because both of those guys got juice, he just gives you more, man. He, it's not just doing the vertical thing. He can do some horizontal things too now um, and separate from from defenders that's that's um, maybe trailing him, right? Uh, so, yeah, he just gives you more from the position, man. Uh, he, he's he's closer to to a whole tight end versus Jaheim Bell, who's just, you know, that, 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 um, that slot or that outside, that tight end that can match up against, you know, safeties if you want to do something stupid or linebackers. <laughs> I, I'm a little surprised. I'm, I'm a little surprised that Sanders remained at number two after after everything that's transpired here um, with additional film study in the pre-draft process. You know, uh, you know, Sinat and and uh, Theo Johnson, what, what they can do uh, in, in terms of being a little bit more physical in the running game, you know, and, and in the case of Theo Johnson, a lot more physical, right? I, I thought maybe they might be able to leapfrog Sanders. So so what was really the determining factor that kept Sanders at tight end two for you? For, for me, it's the juice, bro, that he has in the passing game. And the, and then it's, it's also, because I kept going back, I was like, maybe I should slide Theo Johnson at two. I was really close. But but it's also like Texas, they, they just say, we we want you to continue to block. We're, we're going to keep putting you in position to continue to block, right? And, and and it's not a lack of effort. It's just some technique things that he's got to work on. And they were asking him to block from 
a thousand different ways. Right. And so I, I think he 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 did that more than Theo Johnson. Theo Johnson more his his thing was more from the inline position. But um, the, uh, 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 Jatavin Sanders was from all over the place consistently. Um, every play was just somewhere different. Right. So, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to give him the head nod um, for the effort and, and the ability to to. For the most part, he he did his job, bro. He wasn't, you know, putting people, you know, a liability. Moving people ten he, yards he, back, he, right? No, nah, he, he was a liability. Off. He was doing right. just. Sometimes you just got to do just enough, bro. Sure, sure. And and you know, I I think your point regarding the the way he was deployed, they put a lot on his plate. They put a lot on his plate. You know what I'm saying? And and you know, generally you don't see that at the position here at the collegiate level. What about you, Heather? What was the difference? Yeah, it, it was the pass catching ability, um, the production, the juice after the catch. Uh, it's a passing league in the NFL, so I think he can come in right away and, and help uh, in the passing game. So that's why I kept him at tight end, too. I think Theo Johnson is a better blocker than him. Uh, Sinnott is a better all-around uh, tight end if you want to tur- throw in blocking and pass catching. But I think Sanders is the better pass catcher out of those three. Okay. All right. CCRR, uh, Sinnott, Alt, and Raymond made the top 12 here. Colt, just outside the top 12. All right. CC is not a fan of Sanders. Yeah, there really does seem to be, you know, a, a pretty wide uh, chasm in terms of whether or not you know, you're, you're in on Sanders or you're out. Right. Yeah, exactly. I got it. Makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Yep. All right. For our final tight end or tight end one. Um, no, no mistake about it. He's he's a top five prospect. Is he a top three prospect? We got to see what those final rankings yeah. look like. He's yeah. Top three, yeah. He's top three. Right. Right. Respect him. Just making sure that he remains. Respect there, him. Man. Y'all making changes. Y'all making changes. So I just nah, not to this guy, bro. There. Okay, okay. Not to this All right. guy. All right. Okay. I'm glad to hear it. Brock Bowers. We'll start with you, Headley. Man, Brock Bowers. Like you said, top three prospect in the class. Uh, only because he's a tight end, he might not be a top ten pick. I think it starts at number 10 with the Jets for him. But, you know, to me, he's just another receiver on the football field. You know, I know that the financial part of it and paying a, a tight end that much money, uh, you know, coming out of the draft. So I, I get the financial part of it. But as a prospect, I think this is a can't miss guy, man. Uh, you know, in zone defense, he just knows how to find the hole uh, in those defenses. Very uh, excellent hands. Uh, and I think you talked about it in the last live, uh, Juice, because – he has that upright, uh, you know, route running style like we have talked about uh, other tight ends in this class. And the separation, he's not as clean. I think he's very subtle, so he can separate in man. Uh, but at the catch point and after the catch, he's elite. You know, he's the type of guy they can line him outside, run a fade. He could go up and get it. And uh, yak, yak. He, he, you know, he's a yak god. You know, uh, we call Malachi Corley the yak king or yak god. I forgot what he called himself. But I think uh, Brock Bowers is that. He catches passes. He turns up field quickly. You got the speed and the power, uh, you know, after the catch. Uh, to me, I think he could be a returner. I know you don't want to put your tight end at returner, but he can, <laughs> I think he can do that re- really well. And that, that just speaks to his open field prowess um, as a blocker. Um, he's not an upper echelon blocker, but he's willing and able. You know, as long as you have the – you're able and you're willing to block, I think he can hold up well there. Um, also, he comes down with tough catches across the middle. Uh, he has very good concentrations. I think his hands are top notch. Hard to bring down uh, in the open field. Um, I say he's one of those rare tight ends that can line up outside. I already said that. Um, and you know, tight ends in college don't really ball out. You know, the production is never really there for tight ends. But Brock Bowers, man, <laughs> talk about production from his freshman season. The first time he stepped on campus, he was the guy. He was so much the guy that wide receivers transferred out of there. Adonai Mitchell. Uh, is one of those receivers. Uh, Jermaine, Burton. Was, Jermaine Burton went to Alabama. So, you know, mm-hmm. that just speaks to how great Brock Bauer was in college at the tight end position, Mackey Award winner. Um, so, you know, the ball tracking ability deep down the field is there also. And uh, to me, man, man you were speaking hyperbole. Man, <laughs> Let's talk he, about he, it. He, he's the best tight end to come out since uh, – who, who, I said Tony Gonzalez last time, and, and that's a long what? time ago. That's, that's a long a time. Ago. That's a minute ago. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I have him hired in Kyle Pitts. Mm-hmm. Uh, had him hired in Hawkinson. Even though I was a big George Kittle guy, um, had I have him hired coming out in George Kittle. Yeah. So which other tight ends is there? Kellen Winslow Jr. I think he's better than him. Aaron Hernandez. Ebron. Gronk. Ebron. Yeah, hired in Ebron. Yeah. I I'm not saying – I mean, it obviously didn't work out with Ebron, but I, I was pretty high on Ebron. Oh, I, I got Bowers over all of them too, bro. 
So yeah, Tony Gonzalez is probably the last guy for me, man. And that's that's crazy, man. If y'all got any other names out there, uh, let us know in the chat, man. But he's a beast. Yeah, I, I think he's special. Um, so so much so that, like you said, receivers transferred out because everything was operated. <laughs> Within Jeremy, come on, bro. Come not even Jeremy Shockey. Not even Jeremy Shockey. Shockey. What, what about Vernon Davis? Vernon Davis. Vernon Davis uh, had the wiggle. Vernon Davis was like a, a yeah. speed guy. Yeah, he, he was a straight yeah, line guy. guy. This he guy had a wiggle. Yeah. 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 I, I'm, I'm gonna look up some names as as Drew Wax is about Brock Lesnar. I'm gonna look up some names. All right. He he's like I said, he's special, elite. Um, and the things that he's elite at, I, there's no one in the country that can do it better than him. Um, so much so that the offense went through him, right? You, you. So, how does one player make other players transfer out at a position he does not play, bro? How does that happen, right? At an elite program that is Georgia, right? Them boys worked inside out, and he was the inside, and everybody was on the outside, bro. All right? This was this isn't a guy who we were just peppering targets. This is a guy who we're handing off the ball to in motion and jet motion and sweeps and getting cute, right? Um, this is a guy they schemed open at times, but if he was open, throw him the football and it was lights, camera, action after he got the football in his hands, man. Like he was leaping folks, running through folks, running by folks, stiff arming folks. He he was a running back with the football in his hands. He was a play, I'm not gonna say running back, he was a playmaker with the football in his hands, and Georgia knew it. From the minute he stepped on the football field, even with Darnell Washington, the 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 the, the offensive tackle slash guard slash tight end that was Darnell Washington, this was still the guy, right? And he and he's extremely dangerous in the open field, man. It, it's it's some scary stuff. Like he's the type of guy you hold your breath. When I first started watching, I was like, man, I hold my breath for this dude, bro. Tight end ain't hey, that good. And, and every single time, it, it was the same thing every single time. I'm like, how can they not get this guy to the ground, bro? Like, why is and, – and and if he was covered, he's not necessarily covered because he'll go up, extend, and get the football, man. So he, he's a special talent, um, an elite talent, um, and he's prospect three for us. I don't, I don't think that's going to change here. I think the top three are actually locked um, in terms of their position. Um, and, and I know, you know, like Kelly said, in terms of his his ability to run the routes and, and create sep- and, and create that separation, that's something he's going to have to improve on. And he's not, you know, I don't I don't begrudge a guy because he can't um, block like you know you want your tight end to block. You know, you want him to be uh, elite at uh, all aspects of it. But if if you're so elite at two or three of the aspects that I need you to do, then you know we'll, we'll worry about the other stuff later. And as long as you're giving the effort, especially in the blocking game. I'm good with it because we'll figure it out. We'll put you in a position to where you don't have to, you know, uh, put somebody in the stands in terms of blocking. We can seal guys off. We can we can we can adjust to make it work for you so that way you're doing the job that we're asking you to do, man. Especially from the tight end position. All right, let me throw a few names out here. Let's let's just talk about it. Let's talk about it. And 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 it, I guess it'll really just put things in perspective in terms of how high we are on Brock Bowers. I, I can go back to 2000. Got Bubba Franks. All right. Bubba, Bubba. Bubba just did not have the athleticism the that, powers, yeah. that, that yeah. Bowers had. Um, Todd Heap, intriguing, certainly, oh, but again, one. not not necessarily the same level of athleticism. It's the guy that we mentioned earlier. Jen, there was Shockey. Mm-hmm. Shockey was a bad That's boy now. Shockey really? was a good one. Um, Dallas Clark. Kellen Winslow and Ben Watson. Hmm. Just in terms of athleticism, right, and then to be able, and the ability to make you know body control, make plays above the rim, I run after the catch. Again, I don't I don't think they're approaching. Well, Winslow's not necessarily approaching Bowers after the catch, but certainly when you talk about route running and being able to create separation, I'd give Kellen Winslow the edge there. I'd give him the edge there. Ben Watson was a blur in terms of that straight line speed. You know, we're talking about Vernon Davis and his linear speed, but. Yeah, man, I'm going through the names. You got Heath Miller. We mentioned Vernon Davis, Greg Olson. It's a lot of it's a lot of hurricanes, bro. I'm just, just saying. I like I like Greg Olson. Greg yeah, Olson, I like too. Yeah. I, you know, but I think Bowers has better hands than Greg Olson. Yeah, I think. I, but but that's a that's an interesting comp, though. I, I think that's a that's a, a a fair comp there. Pettigrew, you know, I was a fan of Jermaine Gresham. He wasn't a good athlete, though. Uh, let's see, Rudolph Fleener, Eifert. Mentioned Ebron, Max Williams, Hunter Henry. 
Yeah, man. OJ yeah. Howard. I got to ask you, OJ Howard, who you higher on? Who were you higher on? Oh, be no, honest, no, no, we, no, no, we, be we honest. Don't take, no, I'm taking, taking Brock Bowers, bro. Okay. Because because right. here's, here's the thing um, about OJ Howard and like OJ Howard did a lot with a little, bro. Mm. And a lot of a lot of his lots was like him just being wide open for whatever reason. Whether he busted did something coverages. or the scheme yeah. or busted coverage, he was just wide open, bro. So, you know, and I, I think that kind of showed out in, in the league. I got a guy. How about – um? I don't remember how he was when he came out, but Mercedes Lewis. Mm -mm. No, you, you know, I can't how he you know who the comp on Bowers that's, is. That's, 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 that's like a tackle right there, bro. That's like an offensive tackle. Okay. Right I, I know he's like a blocker. <laughs> I just don't remember how he was in the pass up. Gotcha. I think we said it in a previous live. I forgot who gave us a name, but uh, Aaron Hernandez, uh, when he was coming out of Florida, was a yeah. guy kind of like Bowers, where you could give him a, a handoff and the movement he was skills. great after the catch, yeah. the yeah. movement ability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hernandez might have been a better route runner. And Bowers mm -hmm. also, so it, it's but. like a cross between Greg Olson and Aaron Hernandez, bro. It's it's, it's like yeah. a a hybrid of those two players. I think is what you're not not necessarily devastational in line. Although I think Olson was was pretty good there, but just their overall ability with the ball in their hands in particular um, is, is pretty impressive. And then of course the the, the straight line speed, um, Kittle. I know that was yeah. your guy, Hadley. That that yeah, was, was your guy. I was big on Kittle. Yeah. Uh, you know. It, it was what Kittle did as, as a, a blocker. You know, yeah. he's a way better blocker than Brock Bowers. Uh, physical through the whistle, and then once he catches the football, uh, just that that speed after he catches the football. I think Bowers has more wiggle than him. He can make guys miss. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I like Kittle a lot. But I give the edge to Bowers. I think he has better hands, uh, tracks the ball better. Uh, I don't think Kittle is a guy that you can line up outside, throw a fade to. I don't think he has that type yeah. of versatility. Throw a back um, but, shoulder fade at that, you know what I'm exactly. saying? Or stop fade, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think Bob Brown is going to be a problem, bro. I, I, the, the the and we talked a little bit about it um, during our last stream with with DP and wanted to get a sense of you know are, are are those are those concerns in terms of what he does in in the stem of the route early on in the route are are they blown out of proportion? I I think there's certainly room for improvement, but. Um, DP, DP mentioned that he was higher on Kyle Pitts in terms of his movement ability within the route. You, you understand what I'm saying? I don't know that he would necessarily debate, uh, the, the player that Bowers becomes once he has the ball in his hands. But, um, I, I, I'm, I, I have to believe, I have to believe that he's going to continue to improve in that, in that regard. And as I mentioned, I'm going to put it on the coaches. That's a special talent right there, man. Get him open. Short motion, stack releases, get him open. You understand what I'm saying? And then once you get him open and get the ball to him, now he's going to reward you. He's going to reward your creative play calling, your ability to scheme things open as he becomes a better route runner, more polished route runner. So uh, Brock Bowers is our top tight end in these rankings. Uh, shout out A1. Appreciate you checking in. As well as you, CCRR, we appreciate the kind words. We will keep it going here. Let's transition to our final position group of the evening, and that is the down line. That, that is the down line, the defensive line here. So we're not necessarily talking about edge rushers. We're, we're, we're talking about, you know, your your interior defensive linemen, your, your edges in a, in a not edges, but your ends, your defensive ends in an even or odd man front um, here. So we start with number 15. You guys are synced up right here at, at the very beginning of it uh, with Tyler Davis out of Clemson. Drew, that's your guy. Let's yeah. start there. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you would have him higher. No, 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 no. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta temper my my um my expectations because because in terms of the season it wasn't what it sh should have been, right? But in terms of the Senior Bowl, I thought he did a lot of damage. Um, was extremely active. Um, he's he's a a he's a disruptor. Um, at the line of scrimmage. Um, and. I don't know, watching that Clemson tape, bro. I just I just felt like something was missing from them boys, bro. Just just that that I think they were missing that one guy that could scream off the edge and make a play on a consistent basis. Xavier Thomas, yeah. Was Xavier Thomas? I, I mean, I mean, yep. was he healthy? I mean, was he there? Like, you know what I'm saying? So, but in terms of Tyler Davis, um, quick first step. Uh he's uh, hands. He's usually the first guy to make contact between him and the offensive lineman, whether it be center, guard, tackle, whoever it is that's in front of him. Um, creates penetration. It's usually through power, not through his quickness. So he has that 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 quick to power, as I like to call it. 
Um, and he, he, he hems guys up and he'll hold guys up um, to defend the run, man. You saw consistently um, at, uh, at the senior bowl, um, you know, if you go back and watch the tape, I don't know if everybody got access to it, but um, he consistently just blew up plays or, or, or uh, made guys turn it a different way and kind of ruined plays. Um, you know, at times was able to push the, the guard of center back into the, to the quarterback's lap, um, you know, consistently. Uh, you know, at, at Clemson, watching the Clemson tape, um, I thought he did a good job in terms of the games that they play up front with the twists and the, and the, and the stunts and different things. Um, you know, has some timing and variation in terms of, of, of trying to set guys up or uh, setting his guys up or setting the office alignment up um, to get that one-on-one um, so he can get that penetration or, or um, become the free man or be able to make that one move um, that frees him up with his hands um, from the offensive lineman, man. But I think this is a guy who's probably not going to do a bunch of damage in terms of stats. He's just going to be a guy that consistently frees other guys up um, and, and is consistently a problem for offensive linemen, man. Yeah, Tyler Davis is going to clear the runway. I, I can't tell you how many times I saw him make a play, you know, get, get two gaps over, create a, a lane for Rook, for him to go and actually get the tackle, get the tackle for loss, get the sack, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, as you mentioned, his value isn't necessarily going to show up in the box score, but but on film, you, you can obviously see him be a difference maker, particularly on those early obvious rundowns. Yeah, Tyler Davis, um, I was a lot higher than him uh, in the 2022 season. Uh, I thought the 2023 tape was a little down for him. Um, but the 22 season, you saw that that physical from the snap from start to finish. Uh, you saw that quick first step uh, to shoot the gap. I thought he played with good hands, like like Drew says, plays through contact on the way to the quarterback. Um, you know, that Wake Forest game in 2022, I thought that was one of his best games in his college career. He just flashed time after time. I think his strength is very strong to hold up. Um, and I just think he just got to get more consistent from snap to snap. And, uh, you know, the senior bowl surprised me because, you know, when I first thought about him, I'm thinking, OK, he could get uh, a penetrator, one gap, get after the quarterback. But he showed that he's a, he's a run defender. He's a physical run defender. You know, he's 300 pounds. Um, I do think he's a little high in the run game sometimes. But, you know, he showed it the senior bowl. So I had to kind of take the tape. Uh, from the 22 season, which I liked, the 23 season, and then the senior bowl and kind of put it into one. And I, that's why he's probably not higher on my list. Um, but I got him here as uh, interior defensive line 15. All right. Let's move on to your 14th ranked interior defensive lineman here. Heather, you have Christian Boyd. Andrew, you have Mason Smith out of LSU. We'll start with Christian Boyd. Christian Boyd. Pull it up right here, man. Uh, yeah, the Shrine game. The Shrine game standout. I uh, wasn't invited to the combine. Uh, that was a travesty there. I don't. I'm not sure why. Uh, I thought he did well in his pro day. He showed that he should have been invited to the combine. But after the Shrine game practices, you know, the talk was Christian Boyd. I checked out the tape, and I love this jump. I love his jump off the snap. I thought. I think he has a good power profile. Six two, three twenty guy. I think he's versatile along the D line to play maybe a three tech or a one technique at the next level. Um, you know, he leads with his hands. I like how he uses his hands. I just big man with hands, you know, that, that's always going to get me. And, you know, Christian Boyd showcases that to stack and shed defenders. Uh, he could disengage. Um, it's kind of like uh, the uh, peekaboo. He plays that peekaboo with offensive linemen <laughs> where he's holding them up. And, and whichever way the running back goes, he go left or right, could disengage and, and uh, bring ball carriers to the ground. Um, I think he's really tough to block. He has a rip move. Uh, you see the push and pull move, uh, the swim move from the interior. That's another thing. When, when a big man can do a swim move, um, I, I really like that as well. Um, and he has a, a strong anchor. He can maintain two guys. He can free up guys on the second level, those linebackers, to make him run uh, unblocked. And, and that's big for linebackers nowadays because a lot of linebackers, they don't really want to stack and shed nowadays. They want those big guys to do the work up front for them so they could just flow to the running back or to the ball carry and get them down. So, you know, the level of competition was a thing uh, at uh, Northern Iowa. But what he did in the Shrine game, you know, showed me a lot, man. I think he's a sleeper on the interior defensive line class. All right, Drew, and, and Mason Smith. Yeah, Mason Smith, I was actually high coming into this season. Uh, we talked about it in summer scouting. I know he got hurt last year early in that um, FSU game last year. He played like seven or seven or, seven or 12 plays, something like that. And then um, he actually, you know, a couple plays that he did play last, uh, that, that year he got hurt. Um, I thought he was, you know, I was like, oh, this, this was a rising star, man. Um, he's 
I, I know we can talk about Makai Window, you know, with, with his speed and that first step. Yo, Mason Smith was usually the first guy at the snap off the ball. Um, the issue <laughs> that I had with him um, is that he didn't necessarily use his hands. It, it was it was kind of strange, man. So, um, but usually the first guy off the snap. Um, I think he, I think he could probably play um, nose um, as well as you know the three tech. Um, or just, you know, the, the, the D tackle position, if you will. Um, I, th- I think when he uses his hands, um, I think he's, he's, uh, a, a disruptor at the line. Um, I think he can be a penetrator, but th- one of the issues I got with, with Mason Smith and why I don't see a lot of people talking about him. Um, and I hate to say this about players, man, but I don't know. He's playing every play, bro. I, I don't know that he was playing every play. All right. So, and, and, and that defense for LSU was not good. Right. And I think we had talked about this in terms of, you know, us messaging. I, I know the defensive coordinator or, or the defense in general, in terms of what they were trying to do on defense um, was terrible um, in terms of what they thought they could do with Harold Perkins and not do with Harold Perkins instead of just letting him do his thing. Um, so I think there might be some coaching issues there. Right. And, and eventually you hit a wall when you realize things aren't working out for you um at at the defense level especially when your offense can put up points right so um I think there might be a coaching issue there at LSU but I I think Mason Smith um big body wide body he's physical um when he uses his hands um he just he causes disruption all along the the um the defensive line he does he can free up your your second level players or or safety coming down downhill to, to to blitz or come right behind him um but it's just it's not consistent enough for me um, and again, that just could be a coaching thing. That could be a quick fix. To answer your question, Mr. C. Prasky, I, I think I think there's there's obviously some legitimacy to to your, your thought process, and I think it coincides with Brett Venables leaving. Right, he he was the architect of that defense. You know, D- Dabo's recruiting it. You know what I mean? But the architect of that defense was Brett Venables, and and him moving on to the to Oklahoma. Um, that you could see you could see you know some of that bite. Uh, leave Clemson from a defensive perspective along that defensive line. So that 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 that's an actual. I, I think you're an astute observation there. But I would suggest, I would posit that Venables has a lot to do with that. We move on to the 13th ranked defensive lineman here. We're gonna flip flop it. Let's flip flop it right here. Give Hadley opportunity to speak about Mason Smith and Drew. You Christian Boyd. Let's start with Christian Boyd. Yeah, um, I, I think this is a guy who can play anywhere on the defensive line um, because of his ability to move, uh, his ability to use his hands, his ability to be uh, uh, strong at the point of attack, as Headley talked about earlier, his ability to to, to play the peekaboo or, or I don't know. Can, can you say a stack and shed? Can you can you call it stack and shed at the mm-hmm. at the line Why of not? scrimmages? You know? Why not? Okay, All we're, right. gonna, we're gonna do it. Um, we're gonna, I'll allow we're gonna, it. We're gonna do it. All right, he, he can play the stack and shed game and engulf the the running back that's coming through the hole, thinking he got a. He got a, a hole that's wide open. Um, he keeps the the offensive lineman off his chest, um, which is you know that, that's that's big as a defensive lineman, especially if if you're asked to to kind of hem things up. Get those arms extended. Get them yes. extended. Yeah, it's like a bench press, bro. You got a bench mm-hmm. press, bro. That's why we do the two twenty five and, and figure out what, what that strength looks like. Um, but yeah, I, I think he, he again playing at the at the lower level. You know what does that look like in terms of you know if we were to if we were to bump him up to to. To, to the D1 ball, what does that look like, right? Um, maybe in a power five somewhere. What is he, what does that look like? Does he does he drop a couple levels? I don't think so. I think he I think he dominated at his his level of play. Um, you know, and, and who was the guy? You know, he, he reminds me a little bit of um from bowling green. Is it last year, the year before? Oh no, Carl Brooks. Oh, Carl, Carl Brooks. Brooks. That, that's yeah. that's who who he, he kind of runs. He's not as um bull in a china shop as Carl Brooks, but but it's it's something similar, right? So um, but yeah, his versatility is going, going, going to have him going higher, and it's a damn shame that he wasn't able to go to the combine. Just unacceptable. Yeah, bro, three twenty playing three technique, bro. That's crazy. That's insane. But he he has that ability. He he does. What are your thoughts on Mason Smith, Hadley? Um, you know, I, I don't want to disrespect Mason Smith, man. But the phrase that I heard was 
Looks like Tarzan plays like James. Was that um, D Kit? Was was some, that D Kit? Somebody I think that said was it. That was I'm D-Kit? pretty sure it was D Kit, bro. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you, it I'm on D Kit. I'm gonna put it on him. Got it for D Kit. You hear so many things, you forget where it comes from. But I, I heard someone say that, and <laughs> that pretty much sums up Mason Smith because he was a former five star recruit, had a lot of uh, potential. He's looked at it as a guy, but on tape, man, it's, it's so inconsistent. Um, but you know, when it looks good, it looks really good. When he uses his hands, I think that's the biggest thing with him. Uh, because I look at him as a one of those three, four defensive ends, the five technique, four eye. Uh, because when he uses his hands, he can extend them and, and work his way to the backfield. He can control a lot of scrimmage in the run game and disengage. Um, but you don't see it on film a lot, man. Uh, it's very inconsistent. It's spotty with his play. So he just got to be uh be more consistent. Um, they also would play him on the edge at LSU, but I think his home would be more inside at the next level. Uh, 300 pound guy, he's a big guy. Um, I do think he does well in uh his assignment in that zone read game. I think zone read, he kind of uh you know he has that composure to stay and do his assignment and make the play out there. But uh, as a pass rusher, I think he developed more of those secondary moves. Uh, you no know, strength through contact. You know if that strength through contact doesn't really get him there, he kind of gets stuck on blocks. So. It's developing more handles, like like Christian Boyd. Christian Boyd is a guy with a uh, exceptional uh, hand usage. I think Mason Smith could improve there. Um, but when he has those twitchy, violent hands, uh, he wins. Uh, like I said, he holds it well at the line of scrimmage, uh, and he could be a good edge setter at the next level with more consistency. And he's, he's very athletic. Like I said, he looks like Tarzan. He's one of those big, bulky, long guys that has all the traits. So he's a trait-based prospect. Just got to get uh, get it out of him at the next level. All right, let's keep it rolling here. Your 12th ranked defensive lineman, respectively. You you have, and, and Helen, I'm going to allow you to, to pronounce his name. It's not that hard, man. I thought yeah, it was hard, too. Boygby. Boygby. That Boygby. Justin the Boygby out of Alabama. And, yeah. and Drew, uh, you have Leonard Taylor from Miami. Let's start with you, Headley. Let's talk about a Boygby. I don't know. Find my notes here, man. But... I don't have my notes, man. But off the top, man, I remember when I, I was watching um, Dallas Turner and I kept on seeing 92. I'm like, who's this 92? 92. He keeps showing up. And, you know, that's what he does. He shows up for 60 minutes out of the football game. I think he has a, a good initial uh, burst off the line of scrimmage. He uses his hands really well. Uh, he offers a, a versatility along the defensive line. Uh, you know, I think he could be a three tech at the next level. Um, but you know, I, I, I just like how he plays, man. I like his intensity and I like his motor. And uh, I think he could be one of those rotational interior defense alignment at the next level. Get in there, Drew. Yeah, Leonard Taylor, Taylor was another guy. Leonard Taylor the third, my bad. Uh okay. was another guy who uh summer scouting who you know thought, you know, we talked about you know the good things that we liked and the things that we want to see going into the season, right? And we didn't necessarily see those things, um, whether it be because of injury, whether it be because of of the, the, the drive. And then obviously he was playing out of position. They kind of kept him there uh, playing the nose. But this is a three technique through and through. Um, quick first step, good hands, um, has some power to his game if necessary, can can do the speed to power thing to create that, that penetration or just beat you across your face um, quickly. Just that you didn't see it enough with him playing nose. Um, and, and I'd say he, he's got some some strength if that's what they were asking him to do to play some nose, right? But that's not where his home is. Um, and I hope I hope he gets the opportunity to actually show what his true potential is. And I think someone's going to end up getting a steal because he was misused at Miami, right? Um, and plus, you know, there's that thought of you know, is he, you know, is you know, are we putting in full effort on, on yeah. every play? You know, that that's that's a big thing. I don't like to say cats is loafing, but sometimes you know you're just not in a, in in an advantage state for yourself and, and you don't like it. So you don't necessarily play up to your, your full ability. Not that you can, because you're, you're playing, you're playing out of position, but um, I think that's going to hurt him, um, you know, coming out, but yeah, man, he's a, he's a true uh, three technique uh, 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 through and through. I, I think before we move on, as it relates to Leonard Taylor, you know, you, you mentioned him being played out of position. He was, he's, he's not a nose. Miami had some depth concerns in terms of the interior of the defensive line and playing that odd man front at three, three, five, he was the best fit for it. You understand what I'm saying? Now, of course, when you're playing the nose, you're not going to get a full complement of snaps. You're going to be rotating quite a bit. You're going to get worn down, especially when you're undersized 
playing that role. My my biggest concern with him was the the apparent lack of preparedness and, and effort throughout the pre-draft process. This is your interview. This is yeah, your interview, right? The NFL teams recognize that you're being played out of position. NFL teams recognize that, right? You know, the, the vast majority of them aren't going to necessarily hold that against you because they, they view you as a four, uh, a, a three technique, maybe perhaps even a five, but certainly not a nose, a one or zero. You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, put your best foot forward. Show them that twitch because you want them to, to understand that you have the pass rush upside. That's going to move you up the board. And we just didn't see it. We, we didn't see I, I heard reports of him just kind of giving up on some of the drills. You, you know what I'm saying? You know, just not not taking it seriously enough and understanding that, no, this is going to play a factor in terms of my my long term prospects as far as my NFL career, at, at least in terms of where it gets started. So that that was disappointing. That that was disappointing. I, I can I can certainly excuse certain things in terms of what was happening between the lines over the course of the last couple of seasons. Uh, I wanted to see more. You you, you mentioned, you know, what, what we were discussing during uh, summer scouting and, and the things that we wanted to see. We didn't necessarily get that opportunity. So, okay, all right. Take advantage of the fact that, you know, it, the, the, the senior bowl was opened up to the juniors. Take advantage of that, right? Go out there and perform. Combine, pro day, do your thing. Best foot forward, and, and it just didn't happen. So, it, you're right. There's a chance that someone's going to get a steal here, but we don't want to have to question, you know, work ethic, drive. You know what I'm saying? Dedication to your craft. We, we, we certainly don't want to question that. And and that's a lingering question mark right now for, for Leonard Taylor. All right. We'll keep it going here. Your 11th ranked defensive lineman. You're, you're both in agreement that Makai Wingo is the 11th best interior defensive lineman in this class. Drew, what are your thoughts on Wingo? Going back to LSU here. Yeah, um, when it wasn't Mason Smith, this was the guy that um, kept flashing for, for that uh, for that defensive line. Um, I think they played a. I'm not playing. They played a three four, um, and uh, I, I want to say, man, he he probably should be playing um, a three technique because of his speed and his ability to to get off the football, and not only when he gets off the snap. His ability to okay, you're gonna put your hands on me. I'm gonna hit you with a with a chop suey. I'm gonna hit you with a swim. That there's there's move in succession, so everything looks so smooth, and and um, it's it's. I'm trying to think. It, it, it's every, everything is so smooth and just just moves. Just like, like there's no stop. It flows, it, right? Yeah. It, everything yeah. just flows, and and. It looks like he's going faster than he, than he is because everything is flowing mm -hmm. and he's able to do that consistently. A lot of the times they had to kind of like like down block him just to get him away or the quarterback had to step to the left or the right just to avoid him. If they didn't, it was going to be a sack or the play was ruined or maybe he ended up um, ruining the play anyways because of his ability to penetrate. But he's also another guy who didn't use his hands. Like his first contact was his shoulder pad, his helmet. Like, what the hell is going on at this school, bro, that we don't use hands when we make contact with the offensive lineman? And when he didn't do that, there was no success. When he did do that, there was success or penetration or some type of you, – you you at least – Disruption of some sort. Yeah. Something, bro. You yep. increase the difficulty level for the offensive lineman. And it was just weird. I just – and then, you know, you reminded me they 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 were they weren't rushing Perkins. And then I remembered, you know, <laughs> defense, you know, we do stupid things. So, you know, um, but he, he's he's an extremely effective player. You just have to put him in a position to exceed and you got to coach him up again. This might be a coaching thing for this this football team on the defensive side. Yeah, the, the defense, LSU defense was a big disappointment this season. Uh, you got the names out there. They just couldn't get done. Uh, coaching might have a lot to do with that. Um, but if you want to see the best of Makai Wingo, you throw in the first game of the year against Florida State. Uh, he's one of those smaller, stockier interior defensive linemen. Uh, quick twitch ability. He could cause havoc on the interior. He gets a good jump off the snap. I think it could be more consistent. Um, but when he gets that good jump off the snap, he's hard to deal with. He's a load. A problem. Uh, he works well through contact, penetrating to the backfield. Uh, you know, he doesn't really come off the field as much also. You know, speaks to his stamina, his endurance. Uh, it, it's rare for a defensive tackle to play as much snaps as Makai Wingo did, although he did get hurt at the end of the season. But um, once he's healthy, man, he never really comes off the field. Um, and in that FSU game, FSU kind of tried to move the pocket because he was so effective. 
and they try to get creative up front, but it didn't really work against Mingo um, due to that quick acceleration in, in his game. Um, strength and hand usage to hold up against the run. I think against the run is, is where uh, the issue is with Wingo. Um, you know, the guys, offensive linemen with uh, longer arms could really uh, wash him out of a play, kind of like Braden Fisk uh, for Florida State. Um, but, you know, I think he just needs to develop more pass rushing moves because uh, that speed to power, I think Drew spoke about it, once that speed of power doesn't work or that acceleration or that, that one gapping doesn't work Slimy. for him, mm-hmm. it, it, he, he gets uh, stalled out, man. So just working on those, those hand uses and, and to get a chop in there, get a rip, you know, do something with your hands so you could uh, free yourself up and get into the backfield. So if that doesn't work, uh, you know, he's really must stall. So he needs to work at that at the next level. All right. I like it. Makai Wingo checking in at 11th in your rankings here uh, at 10. Hella, you have Leonard Taylor the third, and Drew, you have Justin the Boyk B. Let, let's start with the Boyk B first, Drew. Yeah, a, a Boyk B. You know that, and, and they said it earlier in terms of he's going to be a really good rotational piece. He's going to take the pressure off of guys. Um, I think he is is um of a, a, a five technique. Um, I think that he has really good power. I think he has heavy hands. Um, I think that. I want him to develop a couple more pass rush moves in terms of being effective as a pass rusher. Because I think as a run defender, I think he's he's very stout, strong at the point of attack. Um, I think he can hold up against um, guards, tackles, um, whatever comes his way. I even think he can handle some double teams. Um, I just think he lacks the 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 the, the pass rush moves to become a, an effective, um, more consistent pass rusher. And 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 again. At Alabama, I don't necessarily think that's what he was asked to do. I think he was asked to be stout and strong and let the linebackers do their thing behind him or the safeties to do their thing behind him. So that may be that that may not be his fault. Um, but but I think he he as a run defender, I think he's outstanding. And I think, you know, I guess if he plays that 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 five technique, um, I guess, you know, hey, let the linebackers do their thing, let the edge work, the edge guys do their thing, and, and he can he can hold up and take up space, take on double teams. Um, he does that well. So and I guess you, you got to kind of have a role for him, but I but I like mm-hmm. him. I like him a lot, though. Go ahead, Heather. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, Junior. Uh, I think it's similar to Mason Smith. You come in as this highly touted five uh, star prospect, and the tape was very inconsistent with him. Um, you know, when it looks good, you got a, a really nice burst from the snap uh, to penetrate and get to the backfield. Uh, elusive uh, lateral moves to shoot gaps. Um, but you got to improve. It's the hands for him. It's, it's kind of like Mason Smith, man. You got to improve your hand activity to take his game to the next level. Uh, I've seen him a lot run with chest into blocks, uh, which you, you're never going to win at the, at the next level. Because um, <laughs> if he doesn't win with uh, his agility, um, he, he's going to get stymied, man, because the hand technique's not there. It needs improvement. Um, you know, but you see times on film where he took games over. You know, I've seen it on film. So, He's a trait-based prospect, man. He got he got the traits, uh, the athleticism that a team will like. But once they look at the tape, they're gonna see inconsistency with his hands, uh, you know, inconsistency with his technique. Period. Yeah. So you know, he's one of those guys that a lot of people thought was maybe a first-round guy, but he's slipping out of the first. Well, he's not gonna be the first round, and he might not even be a day two prospect yeah. if, if, if a team doesn't like what he showed on tape uh, his last year at Miami. Yeah, and, and again, it, it might not even be the tape. It might not even be the tape that that really forces him down the board. It, it could be the interview process. It could be it could be just just the performance, right? I'm not I'm not I have no insight in terms of how he's performed throughout his interviews and his visits, but it could be that workout, right? That that that's kind of the lasting impression that some of these teams have, which could be enough to force you out of rounds two and three. So we'll keep an eye on it here. Now inside your top 10, we have Dwayne Carter and Rook Ohorohoro. Let's go with Dwayne Carter here, Headley. Oh, this guy's physical, power player. Uh, I love the film there at Duke. Um, I think he has versatility to play, uh, you know, five technique. I think he played some defensive end at times in the even man front. Uh, but the interior, I think he's going to live on the interior. I think he'll be a three tech at the next level. Uh, even though he's, he's a bigger guy, I think he's over 300 pounds, but you know, he just had that versatility to play along the line because um, they, they'll line him up all over at Duke from edge to the interior to the three technique. Um, you know, he has good motor. He's always fighting, man. you got a guy that plays with 110% motor. You know, just sign me up on, 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 for him on my football team because 
you can't teach that. You can't teach the heart. He has active and violent hands, uh, closes quickly to the ball carrier. Um, and I think he's effective in the pass game and the run game because he works well through contact and he's active, always moving forward, man. He's a dog, man. You know, you want dogs at the next level and Dwayne Carter is a dog. Rook, yeah. Uh, Rook, I got, uh, when he uses his hands, um, he's, he's much like uh, Wingo was talking about in terms of, of using his hands, linking those moves together um, with that first step uh, to keep offensive linemen off of him, keep him clean and clear on his way to to the penetration, whether it be, you know, in the run game or in the pass game. Um, he's usually the first one to make contact with the offensive lineman. Um, he's not in guy. He's not a guy that's easy to move. Um, he's strong at the point of attack. Um, and, and we talked about that, that bench press, keeping those offensive linemen off of um, off his chest um, so he can operate in terms of playing the peek-a-boo peek peek game that Headley talked about. Um, and he was used uh, games up front, twists, stunts. Um, and he's usually, he usually was the guy that um, was the kamikaze guy, right? I like to call it, where his role is not to, get the, 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 not to um, necessarily get the pressure. He was the guy that was supposed to, to take on two or three guys to kind of um, confuse guys and, 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 um, and to free up guys, whether it be a linebacker coming behind or be the other guy swapping over, coming up under him. He was the guy that's supposed to be the disruptor for the, um, for the office, of, uh, office of line. He did it effectively, consistently. It's just that when the guys got the one-on-one, they didn't win a lot, man. So that's why I was talking about, you know, they, they were missing that, that one guy coming off the edge that, that could cause problems consistently. Um, and then he also at times um, wouldn't use his hands, use the head, use the shoulder, use the helmet to make contact. Um, but he, most of the time he did that when it was the kamikaze thing. Um, but this is a guy, and again, talk about these Clemson guys, man. They, they, you know, these are guys that that were actually, I think both of them were invited to the Senior Bowl last year. They just decided not to go, um, thought they could play out one more year, see if they can get, you know, kind of push their, their draft stock up. And I kind of think they kind of leveled off. Would you would you think would you say they leveled off? Yeah, they didn't really improve, didn't really fall off. They're kind of right where they were, where they kind of left off, right? To be continued, they left off right where they were. Um, you know, so uh, but yeah, he, he's gonna be a very he's gonna be a very intriguing and effective player. Um, I think he I think you probably want to play him in a four three uh D tackle position, but um, you know, I'm not sure how teams will see him and how they want to play him, but uh, super active and high effort guy too. I think your point regarding um, Tyler Davis, Root going back to school and, and how that ultimately impacted their respective drafts. I think Root probably helped himself a little bit while yeah. Tyler Davis yeah. may have leveled off. Okay. You know, yeah. uh, Tyler Davis' numbers, his counting numbers, particularly in terms of the pass rush, were, were much higher a season ago. So I think they kind of flip flop as far as their mm -hmm. stock was concerned. And, and Dwayne Carter is just fun to watch, bro. Like I, I did not watch Dwayne Carter in in even even through summer, summer scouting. I, I didn't place a big emphasis on studying him. Um, you know, our focus was on Graham Barton, right? As it related to Duke, that that's really where our our, our focus went at that juncture. But after the Senior Bowl, going back and revisiting Dwayne Carter's tape, it's like wow, wow, he he really shouldn't be doing that at his size, right? There, there's certain things that you see that's like okay, I mean, he's on the edge. What, what's he doing on the edge? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and he's still making plays. You know what I mean? So I think Dwayne Carter is – I think he could certainly go higher than I think we, we've kind of mocked him. Generally, it's it's been late third round. Um, I, I think he could go a little bit earlier than that. He's he's a lot of fun to watch for sure. Uh, we'll keep it going here. The eighth-ranked defensive lineman, interior defensive lineman here. For you, Heather, you have Rook, the aforementioned Rook, and we'll start there. And, Andrew, you have Chris Jenkins out of Michigan. Start with, with, with Rook. Rook -a -roo -roo. A -roo -roo -roo. Yeah, man, you kind of you kind of stole my thunder there with Root because I think he's an ascending prospect. And you know, when I watched the 2022 tape, I was a big fan of Tyler Davis, and I was like, okay, and they got Rook. But the 2023 tape, I think Root surpassed Tyler Davis. Um, I think he's like I said, an ascending prospect. And what he did at the combine, I didn't know he had that athleticism that he showcased at the combine. Also, and even going through those drills, I thought he was a winner out there. Uh, at the combine, he's a power interior. I think he can hold his uh, hold up against the run really well. Not really moving him. Uh, he's physical, strong. He throw bodies up off of him. He got that that Reggie White man that tossed you out the club. Uh, Reggie White power. The man. hump move, bro. He yeah, got the hump the, move. He got the hump <laughs> move, man. He's he gonna throw you out the club. Um, he's very compact. Plays very low to the ground. Uh, he got that rip through power. 
I think he uses his hands really well with violence, um, power through contact to push blockers back into the quarterback space. And he's another guy where they'll line him up at DN sometimes. I'm like, yo, what, what's Root doing out there? But, yo, he, he held up pretty well. And he showed at the combine he has athleticism to be versatile along the defensive line. You want to put him on the outside in run plays and put him on the inside in passing plays. I think he can handle that. And I think he's a guy that's going to go higher than we think, man. I think he's a, a big riser uh, through his, his last year at Clemson and through the uh, post uh, post draft process, well, the post uh, season process. Got you, uh, Drew. Before you get into Chris Jenkins, I, I wanted to actually circle back to a point you made regarding Rook, as far as him not necessarily leveraging his hands when it's not his play to make, right? When he's when he's creating an opportunity for somebody else, and it's important. This goes for all defensive linemen. It's important to use your hands regardless of what your role is. Whether whether you're trying to get up field, one gap, disrupt, get in the backfield, make a play, or or you're holding up at the point of attack, or you're you're slanting and, and trying to create an opportunity for another player. Yeah, at times, you know, you just kind of throw your body at it. You know, you, you woke up, you, you you focus on low man winning. But generally speaking, you still want to use your hands in order to control the offensive lineman, to, to influence the offensive lineman so that you can free up your teammates or make that play as an individual. So um, th that that seems to be kind of a, a, a reoccurring theme with respect to the, some of the prospects we've discussed to this point is the inconsistent use of the hands, you know, sometimes more than others. Also, not not just when you're getting upfield to make a play as an individual player, but when you're you're trying to create an opportunity for a teammate, it's important to use your hands as well. Go ahead, Drew. Mute. See, see, see. Um, so I, I've seen Chris Jenkins play the five. I've seen him play the nose. Um, I think he's strong and powerful. Uh, usually the first one to make contact with the offensive lineman. Um, a guy here, you see his quickness when he's able to crash down, you know, whether he's going left or right. Uh, I think, you know, some guys can do it going straight ahead um, when he's able to, to go to that left or the right, uh, fill that gap. I think you see his quickness there. Uh, he gives no ground um, when making contact with the offensive of lineman. And, and even at times when I watched him in double teams, he still wasn't giving up any ground. I'm um, just kind of standing his ground and, and waiting to make his move in terms of whatever's coming down the hole or the gap that he's he's responsible for. Um, he keeps offensive of lineman off his chest. So I said this is my third time saying that in terms of that bench press. Um, now, what I would like for him to do. More often than not, and again, he's playing in that 3-4 system, so you're not necessarily asked to do this, or maybe essentially they're not asking him to do this, but it's just to clear the offensive lineman quicker in terms of pass rush situations. Um, so I think that's that's where um, – that's probably the separator for me from the next guys that 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 we have coming up is just his pass rush. And again, he may not have been asked to do that um, at Michigan. It was more of keep, keep guys clean, uh, make sure to, to have your, your gap integrity, and then, um, you know, uh, pass rush second. Let the other guys eat behind him, right, or beside him. That, that's kind of what I'm defaulting to, too, as, as why we didn't see more from that perspective. I, I wanted to see him cut loose. I, I was looking forward right. to him being cut loose and just, listen, go out there and, and be the manimal, be a, be a beast out there, get up, feel, make plays. You know, I, I thought they actually gave Mozzie a little bit more freedom as it relates to yeah. to getting upfield, but of course you had Chris Jenkins playing alongside of him. Yeah. From, from a technical perspective and and just doing your job, I think he's excellent. I think there's some pass rush upside though that that has yet to be fully realized. And yeah. and I'm I'm pretty high on, on Chris Jenkins certainly. And Mr. C. Prasky pointing out that his dad obviously was a difference yeah. maker as a three technique when he played. So um, yeah, I, I think there's more more to get to in terms of Chris Jenkins. But to your point, Drew, it, it may have been a little bit more tempered because, you know, I'm, I'm doing my – everybody's doing my job. We're making this national championship run. Um, no no one player's, you know, individual performance is greater than, than you know, the whole in the, in, under those – that's that's what I'm leaning towards anyway. All right, hopefully that's the case. So uh, let's move on to your seventh-ranked defensive lineman here. Uh, Headley, you have the aforementioned Chris Jenkins, and Drew, you have Braden Fist. So, Headley, let's finalize our conversation around Jenkins. What did you see from him in 2023? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you, Juice. I think, uh, you know, he has a lot of pass rush upside at the next level. Um, you know, 
I think over Mozzie Smith. You know, Mozzie Smith showed it uh, in spurts when he played at Michigan. But I think Chris Jenkins could be an even better pass rusher than Mozzie Smith at the next level. Uh, he's a big man with lean and athleticism. Um, uh, you know, I put in my 22 tape, you know, he fill out that frame even more and get stronger. And uh, he, he knew exactly what to do. He put on weight. Uh, he's up to around 300 pounds now. He's gained weight every single year over there at Michigan. So, you know, once looked as a kind of a tweener type of prospect, I think he's filled out his frame really well now. And he has that motor and tenacity. Uh, you see him chase down plays 20 yards down the field. You know, that's something you really can't teach. Uh, I like his initial burst from the snap. I think he plays well through contact. I think he has versatility also where you can line up over the tackle as a four-eye, five technique. Uh, but I think his home at the next level would be three tech. Like you said earlier, you just kind of want to let him loose, let him get after the quarterback. Uh, you know, I would love to see it at the next level. So hopefully a, a coaching staff sees that and puts him in there. Um, but I think for more pass rushing moves, you know, to really unlock his potential, I think he could improve upon some of those pass rushing moves. But uh, he got upside in this game. He could shoot the grab. He could uh, penetrate quickly. Um, you know, and I love how he uses his hands. You know, yep. he uses his hands really well to stack and shed. Uh, I think he has a really good blend of power uh, and extremely athletic for his size. And uh, in a stunt game, when you want to play uh, gangs up front, the tie, uh, TE stunts, he could come from uh, the defense end position inside to tackle, tackle defensive uh, tackle position. Oh, let me say that again. From tackle to defensive end and defense end to tackle, you know, <laughs> TE stunts, he does that really well. So you can let him loose, man, and let's let his athletic abilities uh, show. So I, I like him at the next level. I think he's going to be a better pro than college player. I, you, my favorite – aspect of his game is how he as you mentioned Headley uses his hands always gets those levers extended right that, that's what allows him to control the offensive lineman and, and of course you, you mentioned Drew he, he maybe not necessarily getting up field making a play but because he's able to get those arms extended he plays with great leverage you can't move him you, you can't move him he, he's always holding up even against the double team because he, he gets those again hands on and arms extended and locked right so that, that's part of the reason why he's so effective at the at the point of attack there. Brayden Fisk, uh, he represents a lot of pass rush ability here. Quickness off the ball, getting upfield, quintessential three technique. He's a bigger player, but he 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 looks he, he looks and plays like you know the small feet type of situation here. But from a defensive lineman, what are your thoughts on him, Drew? Yeah, I mean, you said it in terms of what his ability is. He's quick, uh, first step. Um, usually he, he's beaten the offensive lineman across their face, um, you know, and he's, he's effective consistently, man. Um, at the senior ball, man, he's, he was kind of a, a, a I'm not going to say a, a, a blur, I'll call him a flay. He was, he was at times a flash. Um, but at times he, he if you, if, if offensive lineman get their hands on him, you know, you, you can, you can control him Cause we, you know, I had, had talked about it. Um, I think it was a couple of pods ago. We talked about his arm length that 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 is an issue right so you know it would be nice if he had longer arms you know he, he i'd rate him probably higher but because of those arms um and sometimes he'll get washed out of plays if he's not able to to kind of to to, to have early. the leverage that he needs to win mm -hmm. right um often and he got to be early if he's not early it, it's over for him right but he is that that prototypical three technique uh penetrator uh he is consistent he is um high effort high energy um never quit uh, and he's he's made himself some money in the, this off season um, because before okay. before this off season started, you know it was kind of okay. Well, let's let's see what he does at the senior bowl. And he kind of took the senior bowl and ran with it, man. So um, you know he can't can't change his his um, his length or anything. But but I think he has some other things in spade in terms of that that speed and that that first step quickness, man. So he he definitely was a welcome addition to Florida State's defensive line. I, I, I thought. Yeah. The, the way he finished the season was very strong. So he he was already on a bit of an upswing towards the end of the season, and he just rode that wave into the, the postseason and a pre-draft process. So I, I think in terms of just taking care of business, uh, unlike a, a Leonard Taylor, for example, uh, Braden Fisk has, has done a, a yeah, remarkable said, yeah. job. You've actually seen him when you look back at Washington, when he was at Western Michigan, you can see him playing, making plays at edge. You know what I'm saying? He, he has that kind of athleticism and, of course, that bared out in terms of his testing. The question is, can he hold up in the run game on a consistent basis? 
hold up at the point of attack. You know what I mean? He he needs to be in an even man front. I, I think people are like, oh wow, he's six five, he's two ninety plus, um, and, and he's this great athlete. Uh, you know, we could drop him into a. I, I even heard the Rams fans saying, "Hey, we can bring him in to help replace Aaron." Aaron Donald was different, bro. He was different. You, you don't you don't see guys who are two eighty play literally every position outside of a wide nine in a, on the odd man front and still force you know two three guys to have to block him uh, on every given snap, right? On, on, if you want to be able to control him, so um, he, he's not that player. You want him in an even man front as a three technique, one gap, and getting upfield. For sure. See what we got here in the comments. Yeah, Fisk is fun to watch, though. Yeah, he he is a lot of fun to watch. When when he's when he's able to get up feeling attack, he he is a lot of fun to watch. Dana, was Jonah Ellis was his hand in the ground or was he just lined up in the a gap? I wonder. You guys noticed that with Jonah Ellis? I know we're not we're not talking about edges, but did you notice that at any point where he was lined up over center? Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I. I don't think I saw it. Maybe I don't remember. I, I, he, he could have he could have been in the a gap he could have been standing up in the a gap i, I can imagine that they were trying to move it around that makes more to find a find a um mm-hmm. a matchup but yeah i would be surprised what <laughs> wow that's coaching that's coaching malpractice right there <laughs> yeah i don't i don't know what we're trying to the, the, yeah. the, this, I don't, i'm trying to think of what, what what would make sense there like is it is it third and long like, were they but, trying but, to get cute? It no, had to be yeah, that, that's strange, some cute bro. stuff right there. Yeah, that's, that's real cute. cute what? Bro. Yeah, yeah. What? And then, and Mr. C. Prasky, want to get your thoughts on Mike Morris. I don't remember Mike Morris. You remember? Um, kind of the forgotten guy in that Michigan, the defensive end. I, I, I scouted him last season. Uh, I thought he might have came out. But, uh, yeah, I didn't really see him much this year. I didn't really look at him. It was uh, those other guys I was looking at from Michigan. All right, there you have it, Mr. Prasky. We dropped the ball. Yeah, we, we dropped the ball. <laughs> I gotta pull up my In notes short, last we season. The ball. No, it, it, it's all right. It's all right. Um, he 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 certainly. Um, I think he lost some ground this this past season, as far as his draft prospects are concerned. The injury is really what got him. Um, oh, he came out right. last year. That's why I scouted. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, he oh, did. Okay. Okay, I thought he stayed in school, and I just didn't see him out there. But um, mm, yeah, I started no, him did. last year. I think we spoke about him last season. I just don't remember everything. Um, your sixth rank interior defensive lineman here, Michael Hall Jr. for you, Headley, and Dwayne Carter. So Headley had an opportunity to speak about Carter earlier. You have him a few spots higher here, Drew. Your thoughts on him? Yeah, listen, um, D- Dwayne Carter. I don't know how you can watch that Duke defense and miss that guy. You can't, bro. He was all over that line of scrimmage. I like them more on the inside than than playing um, the, the edge. I like them that, as a D-tackle, that three technique. Um, he is speed to power. Um, he does have a nice quick first step, but I think his game is power. Power, 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 power. Um, bowling guys over, walking guys back into the quarterback's lap, uh, walking guys back into the running back as the ball is being handed off. Um, he's a guy who, who can, who can, as we say, stack and shed very quickly. Um, he has some moves, um, especially if, if you want him to rush from the outside that he can perform, um, got a little spin move there, um, swim move there, good hands, um, first to make contact usually with the offensive lineman. Um, and, and he, he's, he's stout at the point of attack, man, stand guys up, hold guys up. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I think he's, he's going to, He's going to be a guy that gets drafted and people are going to be like, okay, all right, we, we got us a Dwayne Carter and not really understand what they have, bro. Uh, until he, until, until, the, until the lights come on and he's out there making plays, people really aren't going to understand um, what, what he is, but they're going to find out real quick, man, because he's a consistent high energy guy who just, that man don't quit, bro. I, when, 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 it, what was it? Duke versus, it was the first game of the season. It was Duke versus somebody. I can't remember who it was. Was it, was it Clemson? Uh, it was Clemson. It was Clemson. Yeah. Clemson. Yeah, yeah, he was all over the place, bro. He, he was he was one of the main guys on defense, man. That showed up playing and play out, man. And that that's kind of what put him on the radar for me. Uh, you know, Mr. Super Asky, as Drew was talking about Carter, you know, I I, I thought it kind of the recollection came back to me a little bit. I I recall us just wanting more from him, Mike Morris. Yeah. Right, right. Like we we, we thought like. Yeah, it's 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 good, and and there's things you like, but he can't finish. He he struggled to finish. You know what I'm saying? So, 
Um, I, I wonder. I wonder with another year of, of development, what what it'll look like there in Seattle. Carter strikes me as the type of guy who could be a star, bro. He, yep. he, he, you know, he he's not going to be drafted, you know, first round. Like, of course, they're talking about Braden Fist maybe sliding into the first round. I, Carter's going to go day two, and he 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 might end up being a star. I, I it's just for whatever reason, I got I get a feeling about him. In particular, Heather, what about Michael Hall here? Yeah, Michael Hall Jr. Um, you know, I have him similar to uh, Braden Fisk. I think I'm gonna talk about him next. I think that could be flip flop as well. Um, you know, Fisk has more athleticism than Michael Hall Jr., but Michael Hall Jr. I think is better in the run game. He plays a lot bigger than his size. I think he's like six three two ninety, if I'm not mistaken. But he plays like a big man, man. Uh, I call him a bowling ball because he kind of bounces off guys. Uh, penetrates, uh, never taking no for an answer. Uh, he'll fight for everything and get to the ball carrier. Uh, very quick twitch interior player uh, with good hand usage to blow up plays. Um, he's a he's a three he's a three tech. He's a three tech. Uh, I, I think that's his primary position. Even though uh, Ohio State uh, used them uh, along the edge sometimes, uh, defensive end, and you know more of a three four front. But um, you know I like him as a three tech at the next level. Uh, he flashes, you know, time after time. You see 51 is flashing uh, time after time. Uh, even if he doesn't make a play, he kind of throws the quarterback off his spots uh, and make other guys make a play on the quarterback. Uh, I think he uses his hands very effectively, uh, slaps blockers hands down on his way to the quarterback. So, you know, he does all of that with his hands. So I think that's why he's a, a better run blocker than Fist, the way he uses his hands. Not the longest of hands, but he uses it very effectively. He plays with a low center of gravity. And, um, you know, the teams are going to question those short arms, but I just think he plays a lot bigger than his size and, and, and his arm length. Yeah, that, that that interior spin move is sick, bro. Lightning Thanks. fast. I, I call him the Tasmanian Devil, bro. I call him a Tasmanian Devil because he, you mentioned him being 6'3". He is 6'3", which, which is not short by any stretch of the imagination, right? He, he's a pretty tall guy, um, but, but his pad level is low. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and 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 as a as an offensive lineman, he's not opening up his chest, right, for you to get that punch out. It doesn't give you a whole lot to work with as an offensive line. That's why I was so impressed by what Jackson Powers Johnson did against him in the one on ones. But Michael Hall, Michael Hall is is a ball of fire for sure in the interior defensive line. Love to see him in an even man front as a as a three technique. Yeah. Uh, Heller, you mentioned perhaps flip flopping him with Braden Fisk. Um, at the fifth spot here, Drew actually has him as his fifth ranked interior defensive lineman. You have Fist, uh, Drew. Why don't you tell us about uh, Michael Hall? Why you have him at five, and then Headley, uh, you could jump back in there with Braden Fisk. You know, leveraging hands, bro. He's leveraging his hands. I mean, he's he's always in position to make the play. He's always got the offensive of lineman kind of on their heels. Um, he's extremely disruptive. Um, if he didn't make a play this play, he's gonna probably make it next play. Um, he, he's the type of player to me that I think can do both, um, you know, not not come up on the stat sheet and be be the guy that that is uh, extremely effective every single play and, and freeing guys up and just causing all kinds of chaos in the backfield or at the line of scrimmage. And then I also can see him being the, the guy that that fills up the stat sheet um, because of his ability, that, that leverage ability, those hands, um, he's he's got some moves that he can use. Um, and, and he's a fiery guy, man, like. You, there's no way you can watch Ohio State football um, at the, when you look at the line of scrimmage. I know we can talk about JT. I know we can talk about Jack uh, uh, Jack Sawyer, but th this was the guy to me that was more consistent than anybody on that line of scrimmage. Just always effective, always clogging up the, the holes, um, always with the penetration. Man, it was just consistently consistent. Can you can I say that consistently yes, consistent? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, man, it, it's it's. I would want him on my football team. I, I thought he would have done a, a, like you said, a better job against Powers, uh, Jackson Powers Johnson. But you know, I mean, you can't can't win them all, man. You know sure. what I mean? So, but um, but he gave him everything he could handle, though. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't it wasn't for a lack of, of of moves, effort, play, none of that. Like he he gonna give you everything, bro, and including the kitchen sink. When the day is done, if you beat if you beat Michael Hall at the end of the day, bro, you gonna you say, earned oh, it. I I don't know if you I'm going to do next week, But bro, you don't want no more. You don't want no money. That's right. problems. No, bro. I don't know if I can do another quarter with this guy, bro, because he don't stop, man. So, yeah. Braden Fisk, Hadley. Yeah, quick twitch penetrator. Um, Like I said, even with uh, lack of size and arm length, 
uh, could get him wiped out at times. He kind of had to win quickly. You know, he had to win quickly initially uh, off the line to, to, to be able to do it in the run game. Um, but he's, he showed some reps also where he held up in the run game to stay anchored and, and make a play. But it's, it's inconsistent. So, you know, at the next level, that's something he would need to improve. Um, the combine, man, the combine winner, he showcased that, that top end athleticism. He has speed to power to get under blocks. And he, can, he has a little bull rush move also. Um, you know, he'll sneak up on guys. He's a, he's a one-gap penetrator, but if you're not on your toes as an interior offensive lineman, he, he could do speed to power and bull rush you to the quarterback. Um, his hands, his very active hands. He got the chop, the swim move. Uh, like I said, he wins quickly. He, he's a blur at times. Sometimes he'll be like 55, and he, he doesn't look like he, he'll be that fast. Or, but when he explodes off the line, sometimes he could be a blur. blur. A uh, high motor, high intensity athlete. Uh, he fights off blocks to the ball carrier. Quick hands. Um, and I just love the way they use him and Verse together in tandem. You know, we talked about those TE stunts earlier. Our uh, reverse will come inside, and and then Fitz has the athleticism and the agility to rush mm-hmm. around the edge and and uh, get to the quarterback there as well. So you know, defensive coordinators they could get a little uh you know tricky with them and and let him run all uh, those TE stunts as well. Yeah, uh, like I mentioned, when, when at Western Michigan, you, you saw him line up at edge quite a bit. You know what I'm saying, and still affect the pass or affect the running game w- with that quickness, with with that initial burst and, and quickness. So I, I certainly understand why he he's built momentum in terms of late first round consideration. I, I just don't think he's a complete enough player to to you know what I'm saying. Put that type of draft capital, invest that type of draft capital into him, but. As far as solidifying a, a round two pick, I think he certainly managed that. Uh, we move on to your fourth ranked interior defensive lineman, and you guys are in agreement. Devondre Sweat is the fourth best interior defensive lineman in the 2024 NFL draft class. Headley, your thoughts on Sweat? I mean, obviously, we've talked about, or rather, we are aware of some of the off the field concerns, maybe some maturity questions. Uh, but on the field, between the lines, what do you think of Devondre Sweat? Heck of a player. Um, a, a guy that big, you know, shouldn't be moving the way he does. Um, he's a load to deal with inside. Uh, he's hard to move. Uh, you know, you want to talk about freeing up the linebackers. You know, you, you need two or three guys on, on Big T Sweat over there. Um, you know, the off-field thing, you know, that's been the, the talk about T Sweat. Um, hopefully, you know, he matures. He learns from his mistakes. Uh, he gets better at that because on the football field, man, that, that strength through contact, and the athleticism from his size. You, you see a big man doing a swim move. Uh, you know, that's that's a, that's amazing, man. Uh, you know, he improved. He got in, uh, in 2022, I thought he had a better tape than 21. Uh, you're getting more pressures because, you know, sometimes you get pigeonholed as, as somebody this big as a, as a two down player. But I mm-hmm. thought he improved as a pass rusher uh, the last couple of seasons there at Texas. Um, you know, he's a nose tackle through and through. He's a nose tackle, uh, disruptive force in the middle. Uh, I think pass, pass game, pass rush quickness can sneak up on you. Like I said, man, like he's not one of those 360 guys that's just not moving on the interior, man. Uh, he can use his hands really well. I think that's one of the best parts of his game is, is how he uses his hand to slip blocks, to make plays in the run game. Um, but I always said about him, he's a little boomer bust due to the weight, due to the, the I'm not going to say work ethic, but if you're coming into camp and you're 380 pounds, 370 pounds, that's going to speak to how hard you're working in the offseason. It could turn mm-hmm. some coaches off. So he has to get a lot of things under control off the field, man, because if he does that, I think he could be a beast, uh, you know, especially with, you know, the NFL wanting to run the ball a little more. And, you know, the two high shells and the safeties are up high. we got to be conservative. We've got to run the football. So, you know, if you have big T sweat in there, man, it's going to be hard for teams to run the football, especially when it comes to December, January, when the weather gets colder, man. You need a, you need a nasty guy like this on the interior. So you just got to clean those things up, man. But I'm, I'm a big fan of T sweat. James wondering how, how far you think he falls. Matt, I, I think he could be a day three guy. You know, yeah. the teams, they, they, they don't want to take that risk with, with a guy like, you know, he has a lot of concerns, not just – the, the the DUI or the DWI, whatever, whatever the, the drunk driving, it's, it's also the weight concerns as well. You know, he, the weight concerns is always there. And now we're talking about immaturity and, and off field things. So I think we're decision yeah, making now. Now, now, yeah. now we're talking about poor decision making mm-hmm. on top of conditioning. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I hear nobody you there. wants 
nobody wants a, a repeat of um is it was it Isaiah Wynn? No. Nah. No. You're talking the about other. um Isaiah uh the right tackle for the Titans, uh, right? Titans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't win? It was uh, a win. Was That's from New England. The, the guy you're talking about, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll put um, it in the Isaiah, chat, Wilson. Isaiah Wilson. Wilson. Isaiah Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, the, nobody wants that situation. And, and uh, Haley kind of spoke about it in terms of, you know, was it last year, the year before last win? Brian Breezy? Was that last year or the year before? I can't remember. Last year, Breezy. Last year? Yeah, Breezy. Yeah, Breezy. Well, I called him the line of scrimmage discriminator. Here's, here's another one right here in terms of the line of scrimmage discriminator, except he's doing it not from the edge. Um, he's doing it from interior, nose tackle. Um, like Kelly said, true and true, a nose tackle. Um, guy can take on the double team, take on the well, – I'm not going to say the triple team, but take on the double team, um, can hold guys up uh, at the point of attack. Um, and it's like at times when watching um, him, it's sometimes because of his his movement um, at times, I would get him confused with Murphy at times, man. So, oh, oh, wait, was that – oh, oh, that was – that was – and just it, because of his movement, his his hands, um, at times you can you can see some quickness in his game. Um, uh, not not obviously not not to the level of Murphy consistently, but at times that that does happen. Um, and he's got some moves on the interior, man. Um, that that he can use. Uh, that I've seen him throw a spin in there. He get get a little cute sometimes. Now you don't to, want to spin him. <laughs> you, you don't want to spin him, but you know he's really he's good hand. At the, at the senior bowl, yeah. he's trying, he's trying to do move. some things, trying to try to make things work <laughs> for himself or for the guys around him. But um, but yeah, man, it, it's the the talent is there. Um, it's it's not anything that that um you would worry about in terms of the talent part. It's just you know everything else that surrounds that. And it's just unfortunate. Um, I think he had said something about his weight. Um, at the at the senior bowl, did. what did he say about we, his we weight? We were interviewing so, him and um. You know, the question came up. The question came up in terms of, um, you know, what, 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 what do you do about your weight? Are you comfortable at your weight? And he says, I, I'm actually comfortable at 365. I'm actually comfortable at 365. But, you know, if a team expects me to be at 340, 335, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I get down. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to cost myself the money. I don't want to cost myself the opportunity. So if, if that's what they're mandating, then, then that's what I will work towards. I'll be sure that I, I get in shape get down to the requisite playing weight. So, but he did mention that I, I feel, I feel comfortable at, at 365. I feel like I can, I can give the requisite number of snaps at this particular weight. I I've likened him on a high end, on a high end, you know, who knows if he ever gets to this um, level. I, I think there's some similarities in terms of Dexter Lawrence, right out of New York, mm -hmm. you know, but, but again, I think that's if, if he checks all the boxes, he, he, he's diligent about his preparation and, and, you know, matures I, I think he could be kind of have a similar impact to a dexter lawrence on the high end uh kim Dishi was your guy here drew yeah uh tigers it, it took me a, it took me a second to realize who that was <laughs> and then i remember the white tiger bro remember the white tiger bro yep yeah, yeah my, once i heard that though i was out bro I, I, i'm out my my yeah. issue with with kim Dichi, now now you know dana is drawing a parallel in terms of some of the off the field concerns which is which is apt that i can i can understand right. that I, I didn't i didn't see it on the field with kim Dichi enough bro i i just you you talk about meat on the bone you, you talk about like falling short of expectations even yeah. out of even in college i just did not see enough to warrant all the hype that he was getting and then of course he clearly was not, you know, of the right mind frame in order to case, actually. When, when Different you start, kind of cat. Yeah, man. When you start giving these cats this kind of this this kind of money, you know, you you you, you know, they couldn't. He couldn't handle it. He he wasn't ready for for that type of responsibility. Was that Ole Miss? Ultimately, yeah, yeah. yeah he was at Ole Miss. He was at okay. Ole Miss? Yeah. Was he a lane guy? He might have been a lane guy. I think he. I'm not yeah, mistaken. He might have been a lane guy. Yeah. All right. Your third ranked defensive tackle is Sweat's teammate here, Byron Murphy. Yeah, uh, an, another blur. This, yeah. this another blur right here, man. First step quickness. Um, I know DJ. That was he. He, he kind of pushed this guy up the board quickly, quick, fast, <laughs> and in a hurry. He he just shot up the board, and he really hasn't come down. Um, I think he's he's close to three hundred pounds, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. At the weight and the and the way he moves, man. I don't know that he should be able to move the way he moves, but. He's able to do it, man. And you know, one, one of the games I watched, I was about to um, I was about to uh, hit y'all up. I'm like, bro, what y'all talking about, bro? What is DJ talking about? I was watching him play against Oklahoma, bro. That first half of that game, 
he was the last person to, to, to come off the line of scrimmage standing straight up like who the what the hell's going on here and then obviously as the game went on it just it, you could just see it bro like they they it, it, he became a problem for them they had to end up double teaming him um instead of sweat um on numerous plays and then i watched him go against i think it was kansas state or was it kansas it was kansas kansas, kansas state and he dominated bro um all over the place whether he was creating whether he was he was doing the tackling or the sacking or he was pushing things to one way or the other making plays go where the offense didn't want it to go getting the quarterback off their spot um you know he he's a guy who you know at the snap hands on the offensive lineman to keep him off hit you with the swim move and keep everything in succession got that nice flow going and work his way right to the quarterback or, or penetration into the backfield he can convert that speed to power man and he does it it's consistent. I mean, almost every play, he is causing problems for anybody, bro. So I understand why um, he might be the, the, the top D tackle for folks. I completely get it, and I understand it at 300 pounds, bro. It's, it's, it's something nice. It's something something special. Yeah, man. A lot, lot of strength and a lot of speed. He, he got the good blend of both. A uh, very compact guy. Uh, like you said, it. Uh, Scotty Joe, he's built like a Mack truck. You know, he's built like that Mack truck, but then moves like a Ferrari, man. It's like mm -hmm. a guy that big shouldn't be able to move that fast, man. And, you know, very good in this jump from the snap. That's the first thing I recognize, like just a jump from, from the snap. I know I know, Drew said he saw he didn't see it much in the Oklahoma game at first, but, uh, you know, watch, the, watch the more tape of this guy, man. That initial jump, it jumps off the screen. Uh, he works well through blocks. Uh, he got the rip move. I, I really like his rip move. Uh, he makes plays in the pass and the run game, and they had they use him on the edge sometimes, man. That shows his versatility. And I saw him beat tackles. You know, a, a defensive tackle, three hundred pounds, lining up at the edge and beating tackles out there uh, with a strong inside move or you know or a bull rush or power through contact. So it just shows the the athleticism he has to go out there at the edge and win out there against tackles. Uh, but at the next level, man, uh, he's gonna be a, a one gap penetrator. Got that juice to finish. Uh, he can blow things up in the run game. Uh, strong lower body, too. So he holds up well in, in, in the run game. So, you know, we talked about guys like Michael Hall Jr. And, and Fisk that, you know, they could penetrate. And, you know, Michael Hall is better than Fisk in the run game. But I think Murphy is a, a combination of both in the run and the pass game. Um, and like you said, DJ kind of pushed him up really high. Uh, I, I didn't see that. But the more and more you watch him and you see how big and how fast he is, you can see the traits. You can see the traits with Brian Murphy, and he should be a first-round guy. Yeah, I, I think I think he obviously will settle into the first round. Um, whether whether he goes as high as top fifteen, or he's more in that twenty to to twenty five, twenty to thirty ish range, I think that's really with the question mark at this point as it relates to Murphy. Uh, let's move on to your second ranked interior defense alignment, and it's the doorless Brandon. Doorless out of Oregon. Um, of course, of course, we, we have been very high on Brandon Doorless for a long period of time here. Headley, your thoughts on him? Why does he come in as your second ranked defensive lineman, interior defensive lineman? Yeah, I, I had to move him up. I, I had to show him the respect. You know, I've been talking mm -hmm. him up for the last two seasons, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I gotta move him up, man. This is my guy. I'm gonna stand on, I'm gonna stand on it, man. And I'm moving up to defensive tackle number two. And I thought that Oregon, you know, some people talk about the production. You know, it wasn't really there. Um, I just think that at the next level, I want to see him at three tech. I want to see him predominantly there. I know he could do it all. He could mm -hmm. play out on the edge at a seven. He could play mm -hmm. the five. He could play. He could play all along that defensive line. But I want to see them unleash him as a three tech, one gap, get after the quarterback. Because for a big guy, you know, he's really shifty. Uh, I think he's very low to the ground. Uh, I got the Grady Jarrett. A little comp right there, mm -hmm. a, a guy that's very low to the ground to get after the quarterback. Um, uh, uh, he's a rear D tackle that has good reps at the edge. You know, even though I want to see him at three tech, he had great right. reps at the edge. Also, right. quickness and burst, uh, bend. You know, a, a guy at 6'3", 290 that can bend like doorless uh, is very uh, rare. Uh, hands are very effective. And then wide arsenal of hand usage. You know, we talked about hand usage, the, the other defensive tackles in this class, where we want to see them use it a little more. Lennon Taylor, Mason Smith. But Dorless uses it, man. Rip, stack, shed, chop, swim, uh, the shoulder dip, man. He just got a lot of uh, pass rushing uh, arsenal in his bag. 
uh, and his movements are really cat-like. Uh, like I said, he's very close to the ground. He shoots the gaps. Uh, he came in at 273 uh, at, at the Senior Bowl, but he, he's added weight after that at the Combine, and I think he's going to add even more weight to 290, 295 at the next level, put him at three tech, make him penetrate all day, and I think he could be one of those guys where it's like, yeah, he's going day two, but and some guys went in front of him, but he's a first-round talent that's going to be very productive at the next level. Throwing guys yeah. out the club, Dana. Yeah, he is throwing guys out the club, and it, it's kind of it's kind of surprising that you haven't heard more. I think he's the, the, you know past two two and a half weeks or so. I think the the start to pick up on him, it's but pick up. It, it's 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 crazy how people weren't talking about him before because. He he was doing some damage on that defensive line, and he was going against some guys um, consistently. When you talk about um, Washington and Rosengarten, you talk about uh, was it Arizona and, and uh, Morgan, uh, uh, Jordan Morgan, and you talk about um, uh, I'm drawing a blank, um, Oregon State's um, uh, Fuaga. Like you, you could see those matchups, and. Uh, he, he was doing his job. He was holding his own. He was beating guys coming off the edge. Uh, and, you know, obviously he has that ability to play inside as well. Um, good hands, as we talked about in terms of his ability to play low to the ground, as big and as strong as he is, um, that leverage. He understands, you know, what it is that he's supposed to be doing. So um, I just – I kind of I kind of debated, to you know, do I want to see him inside at the three technique do I, or do I want to see him outside, you know? And I think – I think it might have been Mr. C. Prasky. It may have been you that had stated that um, you want to see him maybe get that that Michael Bennett treatment, right? Depending on the down and the distance, how you treat him, whether he's playing inside or outside. But you had made reference to it, maybe. Um, but maybe maybe that's how how you would deploy him to get the most out of him. Yeah, and, and I think that was Mr. C. Prasky that brought up that comp. I, I I think that's such a apt comp, and if you can if you can leverage. Doyle's skill set in that fashion, you, you got a hell of a player, right? As Headley mentioned, we have him as a, a first rounder as far as, you know, being within the top 32 prospects in the class. And I think, Drew, the reason why there's been a, a very slow burn as it relates to Doyle's, people haven't necessarily been as bullish on him, is because I think they view him as, they were viewing him as an edge, like purely as an edge. There, there's been a lot of misnomers in terms of how these defensive linemen are going to be deployed. And and as I as you know, in saying that, I was thinking to myself, Darius Robinson's not in your top 15 in terms of, of interior defensive linemen. He he's actually in your edge group, but he he played most of his career at the interior defensive line. So uh, the way people view these players and where they they slot them in now, now we agree that he can do it all up front, but um, the, the way they've slotted, I think that's impacted the way they view Doyless. Doyless is not, you know, as as bendy as he is for his his size, he's not your your prototypical stand up edge rusher. Even though you've seen him at the seven standing up, coming off the edge, you know what I'm saying. So I think that affects people. And of course, in a lot of the simulators, he's he's listed as an edge, whereas we believe he he makes his hay as a three technique. You know, if you really want to see the best of what Brandon Doyles has to offer, let him beat up those guards and centers inside. Let, let him let him get upfield one gap and attack for sure. All right. That's going to take us to your top interior defensive lineman. Number one on the list here in your rankings, big Johnny Newton out of Illinois. Now there's going to be question marks in terms of the motor here, but, but what, what was it that put it over the top for you with respect to Johnny Newton, Drew? Well, we, we talk about versatility, man. And and this guy defines that, right? And and then you talk about uh what they were asking him to do over there at uh Illinois, right? And, and it wasn't what we thought he should be doing, but he was doing it anyways, and he was yeah. extremely effective <laughs> at doing it. And yeah. When he was on, I mean, yep. good luck. Game changer, game wrecker, game wrecker, game changer. Yeah, it, it, it was it was devastating. Now when he was off, you know, uh, that's good luck. The defense was looking shaky. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it wasn't good, right? But when he was on, he was on um, penetrator. Um, I think he can play anywhere on the the, the line of scrimmage, um, whether it be you know a three four, wherever four three, wherever you want to play him. Um, good hands, strong hands. 
uh, powerful. Um, he can be a penetrator, a uh, quick first step. Like we, we can just go down the line and start just checking every box that you want from a defensive lineman. I think he gives you all of that. Um, now, I think his home, um, I'll say his home is, is I don't know, I, I keep going back and forth between the edge and the, and the three technique. I'm not sure where his home would be for me um, because I, I think I think he might get the doorless treatment or the Michael Bennett treatment for me um, just because he's so, he's so good at, you know, anything on that defensive line. I definitely wouldn't have him in a 3-4, though. It would have to be a 4-3 for sure. Okay. Yeah, I think 4-3, uh, 3 tech, you know, I think that's where I like him. I like him coming downhill, shooting the gaps. I don't really like him moving laterally. You know, he, he did it, I guess, at Illinois, but, you know, to maximize his true potential, 4-3, uh, 3 tech, one gapping, uh, getting to the quarterback. I think he's a physical freak. Uh, he has his strength. Uh, to push Lamas back into the backfield. Also, good good hand usage, man. Got that two hand swipe from the snap, and he closes quickly in a in a straight line. And he's vicious. You know, if he gets to the quarterback, man, he he's gonna do some damage to your quarterback. Um, like I said, I love when he won gaps. He has that quick side step. Uh, if you're not squared up with with, with Johnny Newton, you're gonna get beat. Uh, he works well through contact. Uh, he's a downhill penetrator. Uh, when he doesn't win early, though, sometimes it's harder for him to win. So, you know, just working more on, on, on those hand movements, on the hand usage, I think he can improve upon that a little bit better. Um, but, you know, some guys, some teams might not like him because of the length, uh, the, the you know, the hands, uh, the arm length, I mean. But, mm-hmm. man, this guy's a dog, man. Uh, you know, play to play consistency, yes. Sometimes, you know, he can improve upon that. But. Like you said, when it looks good, it's really good, man, because you got a good blend of speed and power. Um, you know, and when he doesn't come off the ball with intensity, that's that's kind of what the 2022 tape was, man, for me with him, man. I was kind of uh, on the fence with him, but, you know, I thought he did better with that in 2023. I think he's going to do better in the NFL because uh, he's violent, he's fast, and uh, he's a beast, man. So he, I got him as defensive tackle one. And I think he's been there for the, the entire season uh, for yeah. me. Yeah, I, he has a move. He, he's really impressive, and, and as you mentioned, you know, um, he 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 dispels some of those concerns with respect to the snap to snap intensity. We we, we saw Illinois kind of get you know railroaded against Minnesota mm-hmm. a couple seasons ago and stuff like that. And where's the fight, right? Where where's the grit? Where's the fight? But I, but I do think even even in a a less than ideal situation. Um, he he helped dispel some of those concerns. Some some may linger, but I, I think he's done a pretty good job from that perspective. Uh, Drew, your guy, Zach Randolph, didn't make your top 15 here, but he gave us some insight. He gave us some insight in terms of how Illinois deployed their defensive linemen uh, d- during the senior bowl, during our interviews. And it, it really was round peg, square hole, right? It, Johnny Newton, clearly capable of many things. They, they literally lined him up everywhere, everywhere from zero all the way to seven effectively right and and he was able to make plays from everywhere but the 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 lateral approach there there, there was very rare occasions where Randolph Johnny Newton were allowed to just get upfield and attack very very rare and and as a result when you're when you're always kind of on your heels when you're always catching when you're always moving laterally it does hamper some of your you know effectiveness now Imagine that. Imagine that being their approach, right? And 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 Zach Randolph made no mistake about it. He he was like, man, I'm so excited about the idea of being able to get upfield. Um, Johnny Newton still was a huge difference maker, right? He still impacted games and at times took over games. That 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 Penn State film is something else. You know what I'm saying? So you know we we, we talked about uh, JT against Penn State. You know the Johnny Newton against Penn State is is really impressive as well. So. All those things considered, I, I understand where you're coming from, Mr. C. Braska. I, I I agree with both of you, Hadley and Drew. Uh, Johnny Newton should be the first interior defensive lineman off the board in the 2024 NFL draft. I, I think you can you can argue about you know the 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 traits um, and and the, and some of the skills between he and Murphy, but it's the flexibility that Newton offers. I, I think he's just a uh, the way he's deployed, the way he's deployed, and has proven his ability to affect the game from literally any alignment is is really impressive really stands out to us here so that's Headley and drew's top 15 interior defensive linemen now we have the quarterbacks the tight ends and 
our defensive linemen underway. Um, long show here, but excellent show, chock full of a lot of information. We appreciate everybody hanging out with us. Uh, we're going to get some rest. We're going to get some rest. We're going to call it an evening. We're going to get some rest, recharge our batteries, and we will see you guys on Friday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, be sure, be sure, uh, maybe maybe right, maybe not right at the moment, but of course, there's a lot of different sports going on currently. Take advantage of our promo code TPGN link in, de in uh, the description. 2x your first deposit up to 100 bucks. Again, I uh, want to thank everybody for tuning in and sticking with us through effectively four hours on this stream. Uh, Friday's our next show. We'll be back the following Tuesday, and then we'll be here for the draft as well. So ride with us, stick with us. We will see you guys this Friday. Have a good one.